Section twenty three of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter three. At this moment, the Baron de Nucingen, who was leaning on his cashier's arm, reached the door of his mansion. I am very much afraid, said he, as he went in, that I have done a bad day's work well we must make it up some other ways the misfortune is that you have been caught mein herr baron said the worthy german whose whole care was for appearances ja my missus on Petra should be in a position worthy of me said this louis the fourteenth of the counting-house feeling sure that sooner or later esther would be his the baron was now himself again a masterly financier he resumed the management of his affairs and with such effect that his cashier finding him in his office room at six o'clock next morning verifying his securities rubbed his hands with satisfaction aha mein herr baron you shall have saved money last night said he with a half cunning half loutish german grin though men who are as rich as the baron de nucingen have more opportunities than others for losing money they also have more chances of making it even when they indulge their follies though the financial policy of the house of nucingen has been explained elsewhere it may be as well to point out that such immense fortunes are not made are not built up are not increased and are not retained in the midst of the commercial political and industrial revolutions of the present day but at the cost of immense losses or if you choose to view it so of heavy taxes on private fortunes very little newly created wealth is thrown into the common treasury of the world every fresh accumulation represents some new inequality in the general distribution of wealth what the state exacts it makes some return for but what a house like that of nucingen takes it keeps such covert robbery escapes the law for the reason which would have made a jacques collin of frederick the great if instead of dealing with provinces by means of battles he had dealt in smuggled goods or transferable securities the high politics of money-making consist in forcing the states of europe to issue loans at twenty or at ten per cent in making that twenty or ten per cent by the use of public funds in squeezing industry on a vast scale by buying up raw material in throwing a rope to the first founder of a business just to keep him above water till his drowned-out enterprise is safely landed in short in all the great battles for money-getting the banker no doubt like the conqueror runs risks but there are so few men in a position to wage this warfare that the sheep have no business to meddle such grand struggles are between the shepherds thus as the defaulters are guilty of having wanted to win too much very little sympathy is felt as a rule for the misfortunes brought about by the coalition of the nucingens if a speculator blows his brains out if a stockbroker bolts if a lawyer makes off with the fortune of a hundred families which is far worse than killing a man if a banker is insolvent all these catastrophes are forgotten in paris in a few months and buried under the oceanic surges of the great city the colossal fortunes of jacques Coeur, of the medici of the angles of dieppe of the Euphrates of la rochelle of the fuggers of the tiepolos of the corners were honestly made long ago by the advantages they had over the ignorance of the people as to the sources of precious products but nowadays geographical information has reached the masses and competition has so effectually limited the profits that every rapidly made fortune is the result of chance or of a discovery or of some legalized robbery the lower grades of mercantile enterprise have retorted on the perfidious dealings of higher commerce especially during the last ten years by base adulteration of the raw material wherever chemistry is practised 
wine is no longer procurable the vine industry is consequently waning manufactured salt is sold to avoid the excise the tribunals are appalled by this universal dishonesty in short french trade is regarded with suspicion by the whole world and england too is fast being demoralized with us the mischief has its origin in the political situation the charter proclaimed the reign of money and success has become the supreme consideration of an atheistic age and indeed the corruption of the higher ranks is infinitely more hideous in spite of the dazzling display and specious arguments of wealth than that ignoble and more personal corruption of the inferior classes of which certain details lend a comic element terrible if you will to this drama the government always alarmed by a new idea has banished these materials of modern comedy from the stage the citizen class less liberal than louis the fourteenth dreads the advent of its mariage de figaro forbids the appearance of a political tartuffe and certainly would not allow tourcaret to be represented for tourcaret is king consequently comedy has to be narrated and a book is now the weapon less swift but no more sure that writers wield in the course of this morning amid the coming and going of callers orders to be given and brief interviews making nucingen's private office a sort of financial lobby one of his stockbrokers announced to him the disappearance of a member of the company one of the richest and cleverest too jacques faillex brother of martin faillex and the successor of jules desmarais jacques faillex was stockbroker in ordinary to the house of nucingen in concert with du tillet and the kellers the baron had plotted the ruin of this man in cold blood as if it had been the killing of a passover lamb he could not have held on replied the baron quietly jacques faillex had done them immense service in stock jobbing during a crisis a few months since he had saved the situation by acting boldly but to look for gratitude from a money-dealer is as vain as to try to touch the heart of the wolves of the ukraine in winter poor fellow said the stockbroker he so little anticipated such a catastrophe that he had furnished a little house for his mistress in the rue saint georges he has spent one hundred and fifty thousand francs in decorations and furniture he was so devoted to madame du val noble the poor woman must give it all up and nothing is paid for good good thought nucingen this is the very chance to make up for what i have lost this night he have paid for nothing he asked his informant why said the stockbroker where would you find a tradesman so ill-informed as to refuse credit to jacques faillex there is a splendid cellar of wine it would seem by the way the house is for sale he meant to buy it the lease is in his name what a piece of folly plate furniture wine carriage horses everything will be valued in a lump and what will the creditors get out of it come again to-morrow said nucingen i shall have seen all that and if it is not a declared bankruptcy if things can be arranged and compromised i shall tell you to offer some reasonable price for that furniture if i shall buy the lease that can be managed said his friend if you go there this morning you will find one of faillex's partners there with the tradespeople who want to establish a first claim but la val noble has their accounts made out to faillex the baron sent off one of his clerks forthwith to his lawyer jacques faillex had spoken to him about this house which was worth sixty thousand francs at most and he wished to be put in possession of it at once so as to avail himself of the privileges of the householder the cashier honest man came to inquire whether his master had lost anything by faillex's bankruptcy on the contraire mein gut wolfgang i stand to win ein hundred thousand francs how was that well i shall have the little house what that poor teufel faillex should furnish for his missus this year 
i shall half all dat for fifty thousand franc to de creditors and my notary maitre cardot shall half my orders to buy de house for de landlord vant de money i knew dat but i had lost mine head ver soon my te fine esther shall live in a little palace i have been there mit Fayex. it is close to here it shall fit me like a glove Fayex's failure required the baron's presence at the bourse but he could not bear to leave his house in the rue saint-lazare without going to the rue Tebou. he was already miserable at having been away from esther for so many hours he would have liked to keep her at his elbow the profits he hoped to make out of his stockbroker's plunder made the former loss of four hundred thousand francs quite easy to endure delighted to announce to his angel that she was to move from the rue Tebou to the rue saint georges where she was to have a little palace where her memories would no longer rise up in antagonism to their happiness the pavement felt elastic under his feet he walked like a young man in a young man's dream as he turned the corner of the rue des trois frères in the middle of his dream and of the road the baron beheld europe coming towards him looking very much upset where shall you go he asked well monsieur i was on my way to you you were quite right yesterday i see now that poor madame had better have gone to prison for a few days but how should women understand money matters when madame's creditors heard that she had come home they all came down upon us like birds of prey last evening at seven o'clock monsieur men came and stuck terrible posters up to announce a sale of furniture on saturday but that is nothing madame who is all heart once upon a time to oblige that wretch of a man you know that wretch well the man she was in love with destourny well he was charming he was only a gambler he gambled with beveled cards well and what do you do at the bourse said europe but let me go on one day to hinder georges as he said from blowing out his brains she pawned all her plate and her jewels which had never been paid for now on hearing that she had given something to one of her creditors they came in a body and made a scene they threatened her with the police court your angel at that bar is it not enough to make a wig stand on end she is bathed in tears she talks of throwing herself into the river and she will do it if i shall go to see her that is good-bye to de bourse and it is impossible but i shall go for i shall make some money for her you shall compose her i shall pay her debts i shall go to see her at four o'clock but tell me eugenie that she shall love me a little a little a great deal i tell you what monsieur nothing but generosity can win a woman's heart you would no doubt have saved a hundred thousand francs or so by letting her go to prison well you would never have won her heart as she said to me eugenie he has been noble grand he has a great soul she have said that eugenie cried the baron yes monsieur to me myself here take this ten louis thank you but she is crying at this moment she has been crying ever since yesterday as much as a weeping magdalen could have cried in six months the woman you love is in despair and for debts that are not even hers oh men they devour women as women devour old fogies there they all is the same she have pledge herself by no one shall ever pledge herself tell her that she shall sign nothing more i shall pay but if she shall sign something more i what will you do said europe with an air mein gott i have no power over her i shall take the management of her little affairs there there go to comfort her and you shall say that in ein month she shall live in a little palace you have invested heavily monsieur le baron and for large interest in a woman's heart i tell you you look to me younger i am but a waiting-maid but i have often seen such a change it is happiness happiness gives a certain glow 
if you have spent a little money do not let that worry you you will see what a good return it will bring and i said to madame i told her she would be the lowest of the low a perfect hussy if she did not love you for you have picked her out of hell when once she has nothing on her mind you will see between you and me i may tell you that night when she cried so much what is to be said we value the esteem of the man who maintains us and she did not dare tell you everything she wanted to fly to fly cried the baron in dismay at the notion but the bourse the bourse gove i will not come in but tell her that i shall see her at her window that shall give me courage esther smiled at monsieur de nucingen as he passed the house and he went ponderously on his way saying she is ein angel this was how europe had succeeded in achieving the impossible at about half-past two esther had finished dressing as she was wont to dress when she expected lucien she was looking charming seeing this prudence looking out of the window said there is monsieur the poor creature flew to the window thinking she would see lucien she saw nucingen oh how cruelly you hurt me she said there is no other way of getting you to seem to be gracious to a poor old man who after all is going to pay your debts said europe for they are all to be paid what debts said the girl who only cared to preserve her love which dreadful hands were scattering to the winds those which monsieur carlos made in your name why here are nearly four hundred and fifty thousand francs cried esther and you owe a hundred and fifty thousand more but the baron took it all very well he is going to remove you from hence and place you in a little palace on my honor you are not so badly off in your place as you have got on the right side of this man as soon as carlos is satisfied i should make him give me a house and a settled income you are certainly the handsomest woman i ever saw madame and the most attractive but we so soon grow ugly i was fresh and good-looking and look at me i am twenty-three about the same age as madame and i look ten years older an illness is enough well but when you have a house in paris and investments you need never be afraid of ending in the streets esther had ceased to listen to europe eugenie prudence servien the will of a man gifted with the genius of corruption had thrown esther back into the mud with as much force as he had used to drag her out of it End of section 23. Section 24 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter 4. Those who know love in its infinitude know that those who do not accept its virtues do not experience its pleasures since the scene in the den in the rue de l'anglade esther had utterly forgotten her former existence she had since lived very virtuously cloistered by her passion hence to avoid any obstacle the skilful fiend had been clever enough to lay such a train that the poor girl prompted by her devotion had merely to utter her consent to swindling actions already done or on the point of accomplishment this subtlety revealing the mastery of the tempter also characterized the methods by which he had subjugated lucien he created a terrible situation dug a mine filled it with powder and at the critical moment said to his accomplice you have only to nod and the whole will explode esther of old knowing only the morality peculiar to courtesans thought all these attentions so natural that she measured her rivals only by what they could get men to spend on them ruined fortunes are the conduct stripes of these creatures carlos in counting on esther's memory had not calculated wrongly 
these tricks of warfare these stratagems employed a thousand times not only by these women but by spendthrifts too did not disturb esther's mind she felt nothing but her personal degradation she loved lucien she was to be the baron de nucingen's mistress by appointment this was all she thought of the supposed spaniard might absorb the earnest money lucien might build up his fortune with the stones of her tomb a single night of pleasure might cost the old banker so many thousand franc notes more or less Europe might extract a few hundred thousand francs by more or less ingenious trickery none of these things troubled the enamoured girl this alone was the canker that ate into her heart for five years she had looked upon herself as being as white as an angel she loved she was happy she had never committed the smallest infidelity this beautiful pure love was now to be defiled there was in her mind no conscious contrasting of her happy isolated past and her foul future life it was neither interest nor sentiment that moved her only an indefinable and all-powerful feeling that she had been white and was now black pure and was now impure noble and was now ignoble desiring to be the ermine moral taint seemed to her unendurable and when the baron's passion had threatened her she had really thought of throwing herself out of the window in short she loved lucien wholly and as women very rarely love a man women who say they love who often think they love best dance waltz and flirt with other men dress for the world and look for a harvest of concupiscent glances but esther without any sacrifice had achieved miracles of true love she had loved lucien for six years as actresses love and courtesans women who having rolled in mire and impurity thirst for something noble for the self-devotion of true love and who practice exclusiveness the only word for an idea so little known in real life vanished nations greece rome and the east have at all times kept women shut up the woman who loves should shut herself up so it may easily be imagined that on quitting the palace of her fancy where this poem had been enacted to go to this old man's little palace esther felt heartsick urged by an iron hand she had found herself waist-deep in disgrace before she had time to reflect but for the past two days she had been reflecting and felt a mortal chill about her heart at the words end in the street she started to her feet and said in the street no in the seine rather in the seine and what about monsieur lucien said Europe this single word brought esther to her seat again she remained in her armchair her eyes fixed on a rosette in the carpet the fire in her brain drying up her tears at four o'clock nucingen found his angel lost in that sea of meditations and resolutions whereon a woman's spirit floats and whence she emerges with utterances that are incomprehensible to those who have not sailed it in her convoy clear your brow meine schöne said the baron sitting down by her you shall have no more debts i shall arrange mit eugenie and in ein month you shall go away from these rooms and go to that little palace was a pretty hand give it me that i shall kiss it esther gave him her hand as a dog gives a paw ach ja yeah. you shall give de hunt but not de heart and it is that heart i love the words were spoken with such sincerity of accent that poor esther looked at the old man with a compassion in her eyes that almost maddened him lovers like martyrs feel a brotherhood in their sufferings nothing in the world gives such a sense of kindred as community of sorrow poor man said she he really loves as he heard the words misunderstanding their meaning 
the baron turned pale the blood tingled in his veins he breathed the airs of heaven at his age a millionaire for such a sensation will pay as much gold as a woman can ask i love you like vat i love my daughter said he and i feel dare and he laid her hand over his heart that i shall not bear to see you anything but happy if you would only be a father to me i would love you very much i would never leave you and you would see that i am not a bad woman not grasping or greedy as i must seem to you now you have done some little follies said the baron like all those pretty women that is all say no more about dat it is our business to make money for you be happy i shall be your father for some days yet for i know i must make you accustomed to my old carcass really she exclaimed springing on to nucingen's knees and clinging to him with her arm round his neck really repeated he trying to force a smile she kissed his forehead she believed in an impossible combination she might remain untouched and see lucien she was so coaxing to the banker that she was la torpille once more she fairly bewitched the old man who promised to be a father to her for forty days those forty days were to be employed in acquiring and arranging the house in the rue saint georges when he was in the street again as he went home the baron said to himself i am an old flat but though in esther's presence he was a mere child away from her he resumed his lynx's skin just as the gambler in le joueur becomes affectionate to angelique when he has not a liard a half a million francs i have paid and i have not yet seen what her leg is like that is too silly but happily nobody shall have known it said he to himself three weeks after and he made great resolutions to come to the point with the woman who had cost him so dear then in esther's presence once more he spent all the time he could spare her in making up for the roughness of his first words after all said he at the end of a month i cannot be de father eternal towards the end of the month of december eighteen twenty nine just before installing esther in the house in the rue saint georges the baron begged du tillet to take florine there that she might see whether everything was suitable to nucingen's fortune and if the description of a little palace were duly realized by the artists commissioned to make the cage worthy of the bird every device known to luxury before the revolution of eighteen thirty made this residence a masterpiece of taste grandot the architect considered it his greatest achievement as a decorator the staircase which had been reconstructed of marble the judicious use of stucco ornament textiles and gilding the smallest details as much as the general effect outdid everything of the kind left in paris from the time of louis the fifteenth this is my dream this and virtue said florine with a smile and for whom are you spending all this money she asked nucingen a virgin sent down from heaven for a woman what is going up there replied the baron a way of playing jupiter replied the actress and when is she on show on the day of the housewarming cried du tillet not before dat said the baron my word how we must lace and brush and fig ourselves out florine went on what a dance the women will lead their dressmakers and hairdressers for that evening's fun and when is it to be that is not for me to say what a woman she must be cried florine how much i should like to see her and so should i answered the baron artlessly what is everything new together the house the furniture and the woman even the banker said du tillet for my old friend seems to me quite young again well he must go back to his twentieth year said florine at any rate for once 
in the early days of eighteen thirty everybody in paris was talking of nucingen's passion and the outrageous splendor of his house the poor baron pointed at laughed at and fuming with rage as may easily be imagined took it into his head that on the occasion of giving the house warming he would at the same time get rid of his paternal disguise and get the price of so much generosity always circumvented by la torpille he determined to treat of their union by correspondence so as to win from her an autograph promise bankers have no faith in anything less than a promissory note so one morning early in the year he rose early locked himself into his room and composed the following letter in very good french for though he spoke the language very badly he could write it very well dear esther the flower of my thoughts and the only joy of my life when i told you that i loved you as i love my daughter i deceived you i deceived myself i only wished to express the holiness of my sentiments which are unlike those felt by other men in the first place because i am an old man and also because i have never loved till now i love you so much that if you cost me my fortune i should not love you the less be just most men would not like me have seen the angel in you i have never even glanced at your past i love you both as i love my daughter augusta and as i might love my wife if my wife could have loved me since the only excuse for an old man's love is that he should be happy ask yourself if i am not playing a too ridiculous part i have taken you to be the consolation and joy of my declining days you know that till i die you will be as happy as a woman can be and you know too that after my death you will be rich enough to be the envy of many women in every stroke of business i have effected since i have had the happiness of your acquaintance your share is set apart and you have a standing account with nucingen's bank in a few days you will move into a house which sooner or later will be your own if you like it now plainly will you still receive me then as a father or will you make me happy forgive me for writing so frankly but when i am with you i lose all courage i feel too keenly that you are indeed my mistress i have no wish to hurt you i only want to tell you how much i suffer and how hard it is to wait at my age when every day takes with it some hopes and some pleasures besides the delicacy of my conduct is a guarantee of the sincerity of my intentions have i ever behaved as your creditor you are like a citadel and i am not a young man in answer to my appeals you say your life is at stake and when i hear you you make me believe it but here i sink into dark melancholy and doubts dishonorable to us both you seemed to me as sweet and innocent as you are lovely but you insist on destroying my convictions ask yourself you tell me you bear a passion in your heart an indomitable passion but you refuse to tell me the name of the man you love is this natural you have turned a fairly strong man into an incredibly weak one you see what i have come to i am induced to ask you at the end of five months what future hope there is for my passion again i must know what part i am to play at the opening of your house money is nothing to me when it is spent for you i will not be so absurd as to make a merit to you of this contempt but though my love knows no limits my fortune is limited and i care for it only for your sake well if by giving you everything i possess i might as a poor man win your affection i would rather be poor and loved than rich and scorned by you you have altered me so completely my dear esther that no one knows me i paid ten thousand francs for a picture by joseph bridau because you told me that he was clever and unappreciated i give every beggar i meet five francs in your name well and what does the poor man ask 
who regards himself as your debtor when you do him the honor of accepting anything he can give you he asks only for a hope and what a hope good god is it not rather the certainty of never having anything from you but what my passion may seize the fire in my heart will abet your cruel deceptions you find me ready to submit to every condition you can impose on my happiness on my few pleasures but promise me at least that on the day when you take possession of your house you will accept the heart and service of him who for the rest of his days must sign himself your slave frederick de nucingen Fah, how he bores me this money-bag cried esther a courtesan once more she took a small sheet of note-paper and wrote all over it as close as it could go scribe's famous phrase which has become a proverb prenez mon ours a quarter of an hour later esther overcome by remorse wrote the following letter monsieur le baron pay no heed to the note you have just received from me i had relapsed into the folly of my youth forgive monsieur a poor girl who ought to be your slave i never more keenly felt the degradation of my position than on the day when i was handed over to you you have paid i owe myself to you there is nothing more sacred than a debt of dishonor i have no right to compound it by throwing myself into the seine a debt can always be discharged in that dreadful coin which is good only to the debtor you will find me yours to command i will pay off in one night all the sums for which that fatal hour has been mortgaged and i am sure that such an hour with me is worth millions all the more because it will be the only one the last i shall then have paid the debt and may get away from life a good woman has a chance of restoration after a fall but we the like of us fall too low my determination is so fixed that i beg you will keep this letter in evidence of the cause of death of her who remains for one day your servant esther having sent this letter esther felt a pang of regret ten minutes after she wrote a third note as follows forgive me dear baron it is i once more i did not mean either to make game of you or to wound you i only want you to reflect on this simple argument if we were to continue in the position towards each other of father and daughter your pleasure would be small but it would be enduring if you insist on the terms of the bargain you will live to mourn for me i will trouble you no more the day when you shall choose pleasure rather than happiness will have no morrow for me your daughter esther on receiving the first letter the baron fell into a cold fury such as a millionaire may die of he looked at himself in the glass and rang the bell and hot bat for mine feet said he to his new valet while he was sitting with his feet in the bath the second letter came he read it and fainted away he was carried to bed when the banker recovered consciousness madame de nucingen was sitting at the foot of the bed the hussy is right said she why do you try to buy love is it to be bought in the market let me see your letter to her the baron gave her sundry rough drafts he had made madame de nucingen read them and smiled then came esther's third letter she is a wonderful girl cried the baroness when she had read it what shall i do madame asked the baron of his wife wait wait but nature is pitiless he cried look here my dear you have been admirably kind to me said delphine i will give you some good advice you are a very good woman said he when you have any debts i shall pay your state on receiving these letters 
touches a woman far more than the spending of millions or than all the letters you could write however fine they may be try to let her know it indirectly perhaps she will be yours and have no scruples she will not die of that added she looking keenly at her husband but madame de nucingen knew nothing whatever of the nature of such women what a clever woman is montame de nucingen said the baron to himself when his wife had left him still the more the baron admired the subtlety of his wife's counsel the less he could see how he might act upon it and he not only felt that he was stupid but he told himself so end of section twenty four section twenty five of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter five the stupidity of wealthy men though it is almost proverbial is only comparative the faculties of the mind like the dexterity of the limbs need exercise the dancer's strength is in his feet the blacksmith's in his arms the market porter is trained to carry loads the singer works his larynx and the pianist hardens his wrist a banker is practised in business matters he studies and plans them and pulls the wires of various interests just as a playwright trains his intelligence in combining situations studying his actors giving life to his dramatic figures we should no more look for powers of conversation in the baron de nucingen than for the imagery of a poet in the brain of a mathematician how many poets occur in an age who are either good prose writers or as witty in the intercourse of daily life as madame cornoel buffon was dull company newton was never in love lord byron loved nobody but himself rousseau was gloomy and half crazy la fontaine absent-minded human energy equally distributed produces dolts mediocrity in all unequally bestowed it gives rise to those incongruities to whom the name of genius is given and which if we could only see them would look like deformities the same law governs the body perfect beauty is generally allied with coldness or silliness though pascal was both a great mathematician and a great writer though beaumarchais was a good man of business and zamet a profound courtier these rare exceptions prove the general principle of the specialization of brain faculties within the sphere of speculative calculations the banker put forth as much intelligence and skill finesse and mental power as a practised diplomatist expends on national affairs if he were equally remarkable outside his office the banker would be a great man nucingen made one with the prince de ligne with mazarin or with diderot is a human formula that is almost inconceivable but which has nevertheless been known as pericles aristotle voltaire and napoleon the splendor of the imperial crown must not blind us to the merits of the individual the emperor was charming well informed and witty monsieur de nucingen a banker and nothing more having no inventiveness outside his business like most bankers had no faith in anything but sound security in matters of art he had the good sense to go cash in hand to experts in every branch and had recourse to the best architect the best surgeon the greatest connoisseur in pictures or statues the cleverest lawyer when he wished to build a house to attend to his health to purchase a work of art or an estate but as there are no recognized experts in intrigue no connoisseurs in love affairs a banker finds himself in difficulties when he is in love and much puzzled as to the management of a woman 
so Nussingen could think of no better method than that he had hitherto pursued, to give a sum of money to some frontin, male or female, to act and think for him. Madame de Saint-Esteve alone could carry out the plan imagined by the Baroness. Nussingen bitterly regretted having quarrelled with the odious old clothes seller. However, feeling confident of the attractions of his cash-box and the soothing documents signed Gara, he rang for his man and told him to inquire for the repulsive widow in the Rue Saint-Marc and desire her to come to see him. In Paris, extremes are made to meet by passion. Vice is constantly binding the rich to the poor, the great to the mean. The empress consults Mademoiselle Le Normand. The fine gentleman in every age can always find a ramponneau. The man returned within two hours. Monsieur le baron, said he, Madame de Saint-Esteve is ruined. Ah, so much de better cried the baron in glee i shall have her safe then the good woman is given to gambling it would seem the valet went on and moreover she is under the thumb of a third-rate actor in a suburban theatre whom for decency's sake she calls her godson she is a first-rate cook it would seem and wants a place those teufel of geniuses of the common people have always ten ways of making money and a dozen ways of spending it said the baron to himself quite unconscious that panurge had thought the same thing he sent his servant off in quest of madame de saint esteve who did not come till the next day being questioned by asie the servant revealed to this female spy the terrible effects of the notes written to monsieur le baron by his mistress monsieur must be desperately in love with the woman said he in conclusion for he was very near dying for my part i advised him never to go back to her for he will be wheedled over at once a woman who has already cost monsieur le baron five hundred thousand francs they say without counting what he has spent on the house in the rue saint georges but the woman cares for money and for money only as madame came out of monsieur's room she said with a laugh if this goes on that slut will make a widow of me the devil cried asie it will never do to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs monsieur le baron has no hope now but in you said the valet Aye, the fact is i do know how to make a woman go well walk in said the man bowing to such occult powers well said the false saint esteve going into the sufferer's room with an abject air monsieur le baron has met with some difficulties what can you expect everybody is open to attack on his weak side dear me i have had my troubles too within two months the wheel of fortune has turned upside down for me here i am looking out for a place we have neither of us been very wise if monsieur le baron would take me as cook to madame esther i would be the most devoted of slaves i should be useful to you monsieur to keep an eye on eugenie and madame there is no hope of that said the baron i cannot succeed in being the master i am let such a tense as as a top as he put in well you have made others dance daddy and the little slut has got you and is making a fool of you heaven is just just said the baron i have not sent for you to preach to me pooh my boy a little moralizing breaks no bones it is the salt of life to the like of us as vice is to your bigots come have you been generous you have paid her debts ja said the baron lamentably that is well and you have taken her things out of pawn and that is better but you must see that it is not enough all this gives her no occupation and these creatures love to cut a dash 
i shall have a surprise for her rue saint georges she knows that said the baron but i shall not be made a fool of very well then let her go i am only afraid that she shall let me go cried the baron and we want our money's worth my boy replied asie listen to me we have fleeced the public of some millions my little friend twenty-five millions i am told you possess the baron could not suppress a smile well you must let one go i shall let one go but as soon as i shall let one go i shall have to give still another yes i understand replied asie you will not say b for fear of having to go on to z still esther is a good girl a very honest girl cried the banker and she is ready to submit but only as in payment of a debt in short she does not want to be your mistress she feels an aversion well and i understand it the child has always done just what she pleased when a girl has never known any but charming young men she cannot take to an old one you are not handsome you are as big as louis the eighteenth and rather dull company as all men are who try to cajole fortune instead of devoting themselves to women well if you don't think six hundred thousand francs too much said asie i pledge myself to make her whatever you can wish six hundred thousand francs cried the baron with a start esther is to cost me a million to begin with happiness is surely worth sixteen hundred thousand francs you old sinner you must know men in these days have certainly spent more than one or two millions on a mistress i even know women who have cost men their lives for whom heads have rolled into the basket you know the doctor who poisoned his friend he wanted the money to gratify a woman ja i know all that but if i am in love i am not ein idiot at least while i am here but if i shall see her i shall give her my pocket-book well listen monsieur le baron said asie assuming the attitude of a semiramis you have been squeezed dry enough already now as sure as my name is saint esteve in the way of business of course i will stand by you goot i shall repay you i believe you my boy for i have shown you that i know how to be revenged besides i tell you this daddy i know how to snuff out your madame esther as you would snuff a candle and i know my lady when the little hussy has once made you happy she will be even more necessary to you than she is at this moment you paid me well you have allowed yourself to be fooled but after all you have forked out i have fulfilled my part of the agreement haven't i well look here i will make a bargain with you let me hear you shall get me the place as cook to madame engage me for ten years and pay the last five in advance what is that just a little earnest money when once i am about madame i can bring her to these terms of course you must first order her a lovely dress from madame auguste who knows her style and taste and order the new carriage to be at the door at four o'clock after the bourse closes go to her rooms and take her for a little drive in the bois de boulogne well by that act the woman proclaims herself your mistress she has advertised herself to the eyes and knowledge of all paris a hundred thousand francs you must dine with her i know how to cook such a dinner you must take her to the play to the varieté to a stage-box and then all paris will say there is that old rascal nucingen with his mistress it is very flattering to know that such things are said well all this for i am not grasping is included for the first hundred thousand francs in a week by such conduct you will have made some way 
but i shall have paid ein hundred tausend franc in the course of the second week as he went on as though she had not heard this lamentable ejaculation madame tempted by these preliminaries will have made up her mind to leave her little apartment and move to the house you are giving her your esther will have seen the world again have found her old friends she will wish to shine and do the honors of her palace it is in the nature of things another hundred thousand francs by heaven you are at home there esther compromised she must be yours the rest is a mere trifle in which you must play the principal part old elephant how wide the monster opens his eyes well i will undertake that too four hundred thousand and that my fine fellow you need not pay till the day after what do you think of that for honesty i have more confidence in you than you have in me if i persuade madame to show herself as your mistress to compromise herself to take every gift you offer her perhaps this very day you will believe that i am capable of inducing her to throw open the pass of the great saint bernard and it is a hard job i can tell you it will take as much pulling to get your artillery through as it took the first consul to get over the alps but why her heart is full of love old shaver rasabus as you say who know latin replied Azzi she thinks herself the queen of sheba because she has washed herself in sacrifices made for her lover an idea that that sort of woman gets into her head well well old fellow we must be just it is fine that baggage would die of grief at being your mistress i really should not wonder but what i trust to and i tell you to give you courage is that there is good in the girl at bottom you have a genius for corruption said the baron who had listened to asie in admiring silence just as i have the knack of the banking then it is settled my pigeon said asie done for fifty thousand francs instead of ein hundred thousand and i shall give you five hundred thousand the day after my triumph very good i will set to work said asie and you may come monsieur she added respectfully you will find madame as soft already as a cat's back and perhaps inclined to make herself pleasant go go my good woman said the banker rubbing his hands and after seeing the horrible mulatto out of the house he said to himself how vice it is to have much money he sprang out of bed went down to his office and resumed the conduct of his immense business with a light heart end of section twenty five Section twenty six of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter six. Nothing could be more fatal to Esther than the steps taken by Nussingen. The hapless girl, in defending her fidelity, was defending her life this very natural instinct was what carlos called prudery now as he not without taking such precautions as usual in such cases went off to report to carlos the conference she had had with the baron and all the profit she had made by it the man's rage like himself was terrible he came forthwith to esther in a carriage with the blinds drawn driving into the courtyard still almost white with fury the double-dyed forger went straight into the poor girl's room she looked at him she was standing up and she dropped on to a chair as though her legs had snapped what is the matter monsieur said she quaking in every limb leave us up," said he to the maid esther looked at the woman as a child might look at its mother from whom some assassin had snatched it to murder it do you know where you will send lucien 
carlos went on when he was alone with esther where asked she in a low voice venturing to glance at her executioner where i come from my beauty esther as she looked at the man saw red to the hulks he added in an undertone esther shut her eyes and stretched herself out her arms dropped and she turned white the man rang and prudence appeared bring her round he said coldly i have not done he walked up and down the drawing-room while waiting prudence europe was obliged to come and beg monsieur to lift esther on to the bed he carried her with the ease that betrayed athletic strength they had to procure all the chemist's strongest stimulants to restore esther to a sense of her woes an hour later the poor girl was able to listen to this living nightmare seated at the foot of her bed his eyes fixed and glowing like two spots of molten lead my little sweetheart said he lucien now stands between a splendid life honored happy and respected and the hole full of water mud and gravel into which he was going to plunge when i met him the house of grandlieu requires of the dear boy an estate worth a million francs before securing for him the title of marquis and handing over to him that maypole named clotilde by whose help he will rise to power thanks to you and me lucien has just purchased his maternal manor the old chateau de rubempre which indeed did not cost much thirty thousand francs but his lawyer by clever negotiations has succeeded in adding to it estates worth a million on which three hundred thousand francs are paid the chateau the expenses and percentages to the men who were put forward as a blind to conceal the transaction from the country people have swallowed up the remainder we have to be sure a hundred thousand francs invested in a business here which in a few months hence will be worth two to three hundred thousand francs but there will still be four hundred thousand francs to be paid in three days lucien will be home from angouleme where he has been because he must not be suspected of having found a fortune in remaking your bed oh no cried she looking up with a noble impulse i ask you then is this a moment to scare off the baron he went on calmly and you very nearly killed him the day before yesterday he fainted like a woman on reading your second letter you have a fine style i congratulate you if the baron had died where would we be now when lucien walks out of saint thomas d'aquin son-in-law to the duc de grandlieu if you want to try a dip in the seine well my beauty i offer you my hand for a dive together it is one way of ending matters but consider a moment would it not be better to live and say to yourself again and again this fine fortune this happy family for he will have children children have you ever thought of the joy of running your fingers through the hair of his children esther closed her eyes with a little shiver well as you gaze on that structure of happiness you may say to yourself this is my doing there was a pause and the two looked at each other this is what i have tried to make out of such despair as saw no issue but the river said carlos am i selfish that is the way to love men show such devotion to none but kings but i have anointed lucien king if i were riveted for the rest of my days to my old chain i fancy i could stay there resigned so long as i could say he is gay he is at court my soul and mind would triumph while my carcass was given over to the jailers you are a mere female you love like a female but in a courtesan as in all degraded creatures love should be a means to motherhood in spite of nature which has stricken you with barrenness if ever under the skin of the abbe carlos herrera any one were to detect the convict i have been do you know what i would do to avoid compromising lucien esther awaited the reply with some anxiety well 
he said after a brief pause i would die as the negroes do without a word and you with all your airs will put folks on my traces what did i require of you to be la torpille again for six months for six weeks and to do it to clutch a million lucien will never forget you men do not forget the being of whom they are reminded day after day by the joy of awaking rich every morning lucien is a better fellow than you are he began by loving coralie she died good but he had not enough money to bury her he did not do as you did just now he did not faint though he is a poet he wrote six rollicking songs and earned three hundred francs with which he paid for coralie's funeral i have those songs i know them by heart well then do you too compose your songs be cheerful be wild be irresistible and insatiable you hear me do not let me have to speak again kiss papa good-bye when half an hour after europe went into her mistress's room she found her kneeling in front of a crucifix in the attitude which the most religious of painters has given to moses before the burning bush on horeb to depict his deep and complete adoration of jehovah after saying her prayers esther had renounced her better life the honor she had created for herself her glory her virtue and her love she rose oh madame you will never look like that again cried prudence servien struck by her mistress's sublime beauty she hastily turned the long mirror so that the poor girl should see herself her eyes still had a light as of the soul flying heavenward the jewess's complexion was brilliant sparkling with tears unshed in the fervor of prayer her eyelashes were like leaves after a summer shower for the last time they shone with the sunshine of pure love her lips seemed to preserve an expression as of her last appeal to the angels whose palm of martyrdom she had no doubt borrowed while placing in their hands her past unspotted life and she had the majesty which mary stuart must have shown at the moment when she bid adieu to her crown to earth and to love i wish lucien could have seen me thus she said with a smothered sigh now she added in a strident tone now for a fling Arop stood dumb at hearing the words as though she had heard an angel blaspheme well why need you stare at me to see if i have clothes in my mouth instead of teeth i am nothing henceforth but a vile foul creature a thief and i expect my lord so get me a hot bath and put my dress out it is twelve o'clock the baron will look in no doubt when the bourse closes i shall tell him i was waiting for him and as he is to prepare us dinner first chop mind you i mean to turn the man's brain come hurry hurry my girl we are going to have some fun that is to say we must go to work she sat down at the table and wrote the following note my friend if the cook you have sent me had not already been in my service i might have thought that your purpose was to let me know how often you had fainted yesterday on receiving my three notes what can i say i was very nervous that day i was thinking over the memories of my miserable existence but i know how sincere as he is still i cannot repent of having caused you so much pain since it has availed to prove to me how much you love me this is how we are made we luckless and despised creatures true affection touches us far more deeply than finding ourselves the objects of lavish liberality for my part i have always rather dreaded being a peg on which you would hang your vanities it annoyed me to be nothing else to you yes in spite of all your protestations i fancied you regarded me merely as a woman paid for well you will now find me a good girl 
but on condition of your always obeying me a little if this letter can in any way take the place of the doctor's prescription prove it by coming to see me after the bourse closes you will find me in full fig dressed in your gifts for i am for life your pleasure machine esther at the bourse the baron de nucingen was so gay so cheerful seemed so easy-going and allowed himself so many jests that du tillet and the kellers who were on change could not help asking him the reason of his high spirits i am beloved we shall soon gift that house warming he told du tillet and how much does it cost you asked francois keller rudely it was said that he had spent twenty-five thousand francs a year on madame colleville that woman is an angel she never has asked me for one sou they never do replied du tillet and it is to avoid asking that they have always aunts or mothers between the bourse and the rue taitbout seven times did the baron say to his servant you go so slow vip de horse he ran lightly upstairs and for the first time he saw his mistress in all the beauty of such women who have no other occupation than the care of their person and their dress just out of her bath the flower was quite fresh and perfumed so as to inspire desire in robert de bruxelles esther was in a charming toilette a dress of black corded silk trimmed with rose-colored gimp opened over a petticoat of gray satin the costume subsequently worn by amigo the handsome singer in e puritani a honiton lace kerchief fell or floated over her shoulders the sleeves of her gown were strapped round with cording to divide the puffs which for some little time fashion has substituted for the large sleeves which had grown too monstrous esther had fastened a mechlin lace cap on her magnificent hair with a pin a la folle as it is called ready to fall but not really falling giving her an appearance of being tumbled and in disorder though the white parting showed plainly on her little head between the waves of her hair is it not a shame to see madame so lovely in a shabby drawing-room like this said europe to the baron as she admitted him well then come to the rue saint georges said the baron coming to a full stop like a dog marking a partridge the weather is splendid we shall drive to the champs elysees and montame saint estephe and eugenie shall carry there all your clothes and your linen and we shall dine in the rue saint georges i will do whatever you please said esther if only you will be so kind as to call my cook asie and eugenie europe i have given those names to all the women who have served me ever since the first two i do not love change asie europe echoed the baron laughing how very droll you are you have inventions i should have eaten many dinners before i should have called a cook asie it is our business to be droll said esther come now may not a poor girl be fed by asia and dressed by europe when you live on the whole world it is a myth i say some women would devour the earth i only ask for half you see what a woman is montame saint estephe said the baron to himself as he admired esther's changed demeanour Rob, my girl i want my bonnet said esther i must have a black silk bonnet lined with pink and trimmed with lace madame thomas has not sent it home come monsieur le baron quick off you go begin your functions as a man of all work that is to say of all pleasure happiness is burdensome you have your carriage here go to madame thomas said europe to the baron make your servant ask for the bonnet for madame van bogseck and above all she added in his ear bring her the most beautiful bouquet to be had in paris it is winter so try to get tropical flowers the baron went downstairs and told his servants to go to montame thomas 
the coachman drove to a famous pastry cook's she is a milliner you damn idiot and not a cake shop cried the baron who rushed off to madame prevost's in the palais royal where he had a bouquet made up for the price of ten louis while his man went to the great modiste end of section twenty six Section twenty seven of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter seven. A superficial observer, walking about Paris, wonders who the fools can be that buy the fabulous flowers that grace the illustrious bouquetier's shop window and the choice products displayed by chevet of european fame the only purveyor who can vie with the rocher de cancale in a real and delicious revue des deux mondes well every day in paris a hundred or more passions a la nucingen come into being and find expression in offering such rarities as queens dare not purchase presented kneeling to baggages who to use aziz's word like to cut a dash but for these little details a decent citizen would be puzzled to conceive how a fortune melts in the hands of these women whose social function in fourier's scheme is perhaps to rectify the disasters caused by avarice and cupidity such squandering is no doubt to the social body what a prick of the lancet is to a plethoric subject in two months nucingen had shed broadcast on trade more than two hundred thousand francs by the time the old lover returned darkness was falling the bouquet was no longer of any use the hour for driving in the champs elysees in winter is between two and four however the carriage was of use to convey esther from the rue taitbout to the rue saint georges where she took possession of the little palace never before had esther been the object of such worship or such lavishness and it amazed her but like all royal ingrates she took care to express no surprise when you go into st peter's at rome to enable you to appreciate the extent and height of this queen of cathedrals you are shown the little finger of a statue which looks of a natural size and which measures i know not how much descriptions have been so severely criticized necessary as they are to a history of manners that i must here follow the example of the roman cicerone as they entered the dining-room the baron could not resist asking esther to feel the stuff of which the window curtains were made draped with magnificent fullness lined with white watered silk and bordered with a gimp fit to trim a portuguese princess's bodice the material was silk brought from canton on which chinese patients had painted oriental birds with a perfection only to be seen in medieval illuminations or in the missal of charles v the pride of the imperial library at vienna it have cost two thousand franc an ell for a milord who brought it from india it is very nice charming said esther how i shall enjoy drinking champagne here the froth will not get dirty here on a bare floor oh madame cried Europe, only look at the carpet this carpet have been made for the duc de torlonia a friend of mine who found it too dear so i took it for you who are my queen said nucingen by chance this carpet by one of our cleverest designers matched with the whimsicalities of the chinese curtains the walls painted by schinner and leon de lora represented voluptuous scenes in carved ebony frames purchased for their weight in gold from du Sommerard, and forming panels with a narrow line of gold that coyly caught the light from this you may judge of the rest you did well to bring me here said esther it will take me a week to get used to my home and not to look like a parvenu in it my home then you shall accept it cried the baron in glee 
why of course and a thousand times of course stupid animal said she smiling animal was enough stupid is a term of endearment said she looking at him the poor man took esther's hand and pressed it to his heart he was animal enough to feel but too stupid to find words feel how it beats for ein little tender vert and he conducted his goddess to her room oh madame i cannot stay here cried eugenie it makes me long to go to bed well said esther i mean to please the magician who has worked all these wonders listen my fat elephant after dinner we will go to the play together i am starving to see a play it was just five years since esther had been to a theatre all paris was rushing at that time to the porte saint martin to see one of those pieces to which the power of the actors lends a terrible expression of reality richard darlington like all ingenuous natures esther loved to feel the thrills of fear as much as to yield to tears of pathos let us go to see frederic lemaitre said she he is an actor i adore it is a horrible piece said nucingen foreseeing the moment when he must show himself in public he sent his servant to secure one of the two stage boxes on the grand tier and this is another strange feature of paris whenever success on feet of clay fills a house there is always a stage box to be had ten minutes before the curtain rises the managers keep it for themselves unless it happens to be taken for a passion a la nucingen this box like chevet's dainties is a tax levied on the whims of the parisian olympus it would be superfluous to describe the plate and china nucingen had provided three services of plate common medium and best and the best plates dishes and all was of chased silver gilt the banker to avoid overloading the table with gold and silver had completed the array of each service with porcelain of exquisite fragility in the style of dresden china which had cost more than the plate as to the linen saxony england flanders and france vied in the perfection of flowered damask at dinner it was the baron's turn to be amazed on tasting aziz cookery i understand said he why you call her Aziz? this is asiatic cooking i begin to think he loves me said esther to europe he has said something almost like a bon mot i said many words said he well he is more like turcaret than i had heard he was cried the girl laughing at this reply worthy of the many artless speeches for which the banker was famous the dishes were so highly spiced as to give the baron an indigestion on purpose that he might go home early so this was all he got in the way of pleasure out of his first evening with esther at the theatre he was obliged to drink an immense number of glasses of eau sucre leaving esther alone between the acts by a coincidence so probable that it can scarcely be called chance tullia mariette and madame du val noble were at the play that evening richard darlington enjoyed a wild success and a deserved success such as is seen only in paris the men who saw this play all came to the conclusion that a lawful wife might be thrown out of window and the wives loved to see themselves unjustly persecuted the women said to each other this is too much we are driven to it but it often happens now a woman as beautiful as esther and dressed as esther was could not show off with impunity in a stage-box at the porte saint martin and so during the second act there was quite a commotion in the box where the two dancers were sitting caused by the undoubted identity of the unknown fair one with la torpille hey day where has she dropped from 
said mariette to madame du val noble i thought she was drowned but is it she she looks to me thirty-seven times younger and handsomer than she was six years ago perhaps she has preserved herself in ice like madame d'espard and madame zayonchek said the comte de brambourg who had brought the three women to the play to a pit tier box isn't she the rat you meant to send me to hocus my uncle said he addressing tullia the very same said the singer du bruel go down to the stalls and see if it is she what brass she has got exclaimed madame du val noble using an expressive but vulgar phrase oh said the comte de brambourg she very well may she is with my friend the baron de nucingen i will go is that the immaculate joan of arc who has taken nucingen by storm and who has been talked of till we are all sick of her these three months past asked mariette good evening my dear baron said philippe bridau as he went into nucingen's box so here you are married to mademoiselle esther mademoiselle i am an old officer whom you once on a time were to have got out of a scrape at issoudun philippe bridau i know nothing of it said esther looking round the house through her opera glasses this lady said the baron is no longer known as esther so short she is called montame de champy a little estate that i have bought for her though you do things in such style said the comte these ladies are saying that madame de champy gives herself two great airs if you do not choose to remember me will you condescend to recognize mariette tullia madame du val noble the parvenu went on a man for whom the duc de montfrigneuse had won the dauphin's favor if these ladies are kind to me i am willing to make myself pleasant to them replied madame de champy dryly kind why they are excellent they have named you joan of arc replied philippe well then if these ladies will keep you company said nucingen i shall go away for i have eaten too much your carriage shall come for you and your people that teufel asie the first time and you leave me alone said esther come come you must have courage enough to die on deck i must have my man with me as i go out if i were insulted am i to cry out for nothing the old millionaire's selfishness had to give way to his duties as a lover the baron suffered but stayed esther had her own reasons for detaining her man if she admitted her acquaintance she would be less closely questioned in his presence than if she were alone philippe bridau hurried back to the box where the dancers were sitting and informed them of the state of affairs oh so it is she who has fallen heir to my house in the rue saint georges observed madame du val noble with some bitterness for she as she phrased it was on the loose most likely said the colonel du tillet told me that the baron had spent three times as much there as your poor Fayex let us go round to her box said tullia not if i know it said mariette she is much too handsome i will call on her at home i think myself good-looking enough to risk it remarked tullia so the much daring leading dancer went round between the acts and renewed acquaintance with esther who would talk only on general subjects and where have you come back from my dear child asked tullia who could not restrain her curiosity oh i was for five years in a castle in the alps with an englishman as jealous as a tiger a nabob i called him a nabo a dwarf for he was not so big as le bailli de ferrette and then i came across a banker from a savage to salvation as florine might say and now here i am in paris again i long so for amusement that i mean to have a rare time i shall keep open house i have five years of solitary confinement to make good and i am beginning to do it 
five years of an englishman is rather too much six weeks are the allowance according to the advertisements was it the baron who gave you that lace no it is a relic of the nabob what ill luck i have my dear he was as yellow as a friend's smile at a success i thought he would be dead in ten months pooh he was as strong as a mountain always distrust men who say they have a liver complaint i will never listen to a man who talks of his liver i have had too much of livers who cannot die my nabob robbed me he died without making a will and the family turned me out of doors like a leper so then i said to my fat friend here pay for two you may as well call me joan of arc i have ruined england and perhaps i shall die at the stake of love said tullia and burnt alive answered esther and the question made her thoughtful the baron laughed at all this vulgar nonsense but he did not always follow it readily so that his laughter sounded like the forgotten crackers that go off after fireworks we all live in a sphere of some kind and the inhabitants of every sphere are endowed with an equal share of curiosity next evening at the opera esther's reappearance was the great news behind the scenes between two and four in the afternoon all paris in the champs elysees had recognized la torpille and knew at last who was the object of the baron de nucingen's passion do you know blondet remarked to de marsay in the green room at the opera house that la torpille vanished the very day after the evening when we saw her here and recognized her in little rubempre's mistress in paris as in the provinces everything is known the police of the rue de jerusalem are not so efficient as the world itself for every one is a spy on every one else though unconsciously carlos had fully understood the danger of lucien's position during and after the episode of the rue tebou no position can be more dreadful than that in which madame de val noble now found herself and the phrase to be on the loose or as the french say left on foot expresses it perfectly the recklessness and extravagance of these women precludes all care for the future in that strange world far more witty and amusing than might be supposed only such women as are not gifted with that perfect beauty which time can hardly impair and which is quite unmistakable only such women in short as can be loved merely as a fancy ever think of old age and save a fortune the handsomer they are the more improvident they are are you afraid of growing ugly that you are saving money was a speech of florine's to mariette which may give a clue to one cause of this thriftlessness thus if a speculator kills himself or a spendthrift comes to the end of his resources these women fall with hideous promptitude from audacious wealth to the utmost misery they throw themselves into the clutches of the old clothes buyer and sell exquisite jewels for a mere song they run into debt expressly to keep up a spurious luxury in the hope of recovering what they have lost a cash-box to draw upon these ups and downs of their career account for the costliness of such connections generally brought about as Azzi had hooked another word of her vocabulary nucingen for esther and so those who know their paris are quite aware of the state of affairs when in the champs elysees that bustling and mongrel bazaar they meet some woman in a hired fly whom six months or a year before they had seen in a magnificent and dazzling carriage turned out in the most luxurious style if you fall on sainte pelagie you must contrive to rebound on the Bois de boulogne said florine laughing with blondet over the little vicomte de portenduere 
some clever women never run the risk of this contrast they bury themselves in horrible furnished lodgings where they expiate their extravagance by such privations as are endured by travellers lost in a sahara but they never take the smallest fancy for economy they venture forth to masked balls they take journeys into the provinces they turn out well dressed on the boulevards when the weather is fine and then they find in each other the devoted kindness which is known only among proscribed races it costs a woman in luck no effort to bestow some help for she says to herself i may be in the same plight by sunday however the most efficient protector still is the purchaser of dress when this greedy money-lender finds herself the creditor she stirs and works on the hearts of all the old men she knows in favor of the mortgaged creature in thin boots and a fine bonnet in this way madame du val noble unable to foresee the downfall of one of the richest and cleverest of stockbrokers was left quite unprepared she had spent Fayex's money on her whims and trusted to him for all necessaries and to provide for the future how could i have expected such a thing in a man who seemed such a good fellow in almost every class of society the good fellow is an open-handed man who will lend a few crowns now and again without expecting them back who always behaves in accordance with a certain code of delicate feeling above mere vulgar obligatory and commonplace morality certain men regarded as virtuous and honest have like nucingen ruined their benefactors and certain others who have been through a criminal court have an ingenious kind of honesty towards women perfect virtue the dream of moliere an alceste is exceedingly rare still it is to be found everywhere even in paris the good fellow is the product of a certain facility of nature which proves nothing a man is a good fellow as a cat is silky as a slipper is made to slip on to the foot and so in the meaning given to the word by a kept woman Fayex ought to have warned his mistress of his approaching bankruptcy and have given her enough to live upon Destourny, the dashing swindler was a good fellow he cheated at cards but he had set aside thirty thousand francs for his mistress and at carnival suppers women would retort on his accusers no matter you may say what you like georges was a good fellow he had charming manners he deserved a better fate these girls laugh laws to scorn and adore a certain kind of generosity they sell themselves as esther had done for a secret ideal which is their religion end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter eight after saving a few jewels from the wreck with great difficulty madame du val noble was crushed under the burden of the horrible report she ruined Fayex. she was almost thirty and though she was in the prime of her beauty still she might be called an old woman and all the more so because in such a crisis all a woman's rivals are against her mariette florine tullia would ask their friend to dinner and gave her some help but as they did not know the extent of her debts they did not dare to sound the depths of that gulf an interval of six years formed rather too long a gap in the ebb and flow of the paris tide between la torpille and madame du val noble for the woman on foot to speak to the woman in her carriage but la val noble knew that esther was too generous not to remember sometimes that she had as she said fallen heir to her possessions and not to seek her out by some meeting which might seem accidental though arranged to bring about such an accident 
Madame du Val Noble, dressed in the most ladylike way, walked out every day in the Champs Elysees on the arm of Theodore Gaillard, who afterwards married her, and who in these straits behaved very well to his former mistress, giving her boxes at the play and inviting her to every spree. She flattered herself that Esther, driving out one fine day, would meet her face to face. Esther's coachman was Paccard, for her household had been made up in five days by Asie, Europe, and Paccard, under Carlos's instructions, and in such a way that the house in the Rue Saint-Georges was an impregnable fortress. Peyrade, on his part, prompted by deep hatred, by the thirst for vengeance, and above all by his wish to see his darling Lydie married, made the Champs-Élysées the end of his walks as soon as he heard from Contenson that Monsieur de Nucingen's mistress might be seen there. Peyrade could dress so exactly like an Englishman, and spoke French so perfectly with the mincing accent that the English give the language, he knew England itself so well, and was so familiar with all the customs of the country, having been sent to England by the police authorities three times between 1779 and 1786, that he could play his part in London and at ambassadors' residences without awaking suspicion. Peyrade, who had some resemblance to Mousson, the famous juggler, could disguise himself so effectually that once Contenson did not recognize him. Followed by Contenson dressed as a mulatto, Peyrade examined Esther and her servants with an eye which, seeming heedless, took everything in. Hence it quite naturally happened that in the side alley where the carriage company walk in fine dry weather, he was on the spot one day when Esther met Madame du Val Noble. Peyrade, his mulatto in livery at his heels, was airing himself quite naturally, like a nabob who is thinking of no one but himself, in a line with the two women, so as to catch a few words of their conversation. "'Well, my dear child,' said Esther to Madame de Val Noble, "'come and see me. Nussingen owes it to himself not to leave his stockbroker's mistress without a sou.' all the more so because it is said that he ruined Fayex, remarked theodore gaillard and that we have every right to squeeze him he dines with me to-morrow said esther come and meet him then she added in an undertone i can do what i like with him and as yet he has not that and she put the nail of a gloved finger under the prettiest of her teeth with the click that is familiarly known to express with peculiar energy just nothing you have him safe my dear as yet he has only paid my debts how mean cried suzanne du val noble oh said esther i had debts enough to frighten a minister of finance now i mean to have thirty thousand a year before the first stroke of midnight oh he is excellent i have nothing to complain of he does it well in a week we give a housewarming you must come that morning he is to make me a present of the lease of the house in the rue saint georges in decency it is impossible to live in such a house on less than thirty thousand francs a year of my own so as to have them safe in case of accident i have known poverty and i want no more of it there are certain acquaintances one has had enough of at once and you who used to say my face is my fortune how you have changed exclaimed suzanne it is the air of switzerland you grow thrifty there look here go there yourself my dear catch a swiss and you may perhaps catch a husband for they have not yet learned what such women as we are can be and at any rate you may come back with a passion for investments in the funds a most respectable and elegant passion good-bye esther got into her carriage again a handsome carriage drawn by the finest pair of dappled grey horses at that time to be seen in paris 
the woman who is getting into the carriage is handsome said peyrade to contenson but i like the one who is walking best follow her and find out who she is that is what that englishman has just remarked in english said theodore gaillard repeating peyrade's remark to madame de val noble before making this speech in english peyrade had uttered a word or two in that language which had made theodore look up in a way that convinced him that the journalist understood english madame de val noble very slowly made her way home to very decent furnished rooms in the rue louis le grand glancing round now and then to see if the mulatto were following her this establishment was kept by a certain madame gerard whom suzanne had obliged in the days of her splendor and who showed her gratitude by giving her a suitable home this good soul an honest and virtuous citizen even pious looked on the courtesan as a woman of a superior order she had always seen her in the midst of luxury and thought of her as a fallen queen she trusted her daughters with her and which is a fact more natural than might be supposed the courtesan was as scrupulously careful in taking them to the play as their mother could have been and the two gerard girls loved her the worthy kind lodging-house keeper was like those sublime priests who see in these outlawed women only a creature to be saved and loved madame du val noble respected this worth and often as she chatted with the good woman she envied her while bewailing her own ill fortune you are still handsome you may make a good end yet madame gerard would say but indeed madame du val noble was only relatively impoverished this woman's wardrobe so extravagant and elegant was still sufficiently well furnished to allow of her appearing on occasion as on that evening at the porte saint martin to see richard darlington in much splendor and madame gerard would most good-naturedly pay for the cabs needed by the lady on foot to go out to dine or to the play and to come home again well dear madame gerard said she to this worthy mother my luck is about to change i believe well well madame so much the better but be prudent do not run into debt any more i have such difficulty in getting rid of the people who are hunting for you oh never worry yourself about those hounds they have all made no end of money out of me here are some tickets for the varieté for your girls a good box on the second tier if any one should ask for me this evening before i come in show them up all the same adele my old maid will be here i will send her round madame du val noble having neither mother nor aunt was obliged to have recourse to her maid equally on foot to play the part of a saint esteve with the unknown follower whose conquest was to enable her to rise again in the world she went to dine with theodore gaillard who as it happened had a spree on that day that is to say a dinner given by nathan in payment of a bet he had lost one of those orgies when a man says to his guests you can bring a woman it was not without strong reasons that peyrade had made up his mind to rush in person on to the field of this intrigue at the same time his curiosity like corentin's was so keenly excited that even in the absence of reasons he would have tried to play a part in the drama at this moment charles the tenth's policy had completed its last evolution after confiding the helm of state to ministers of his own choosing the king was preparing to conquer algiers and to utilize the glory that should accrue as a passport to what has been called his coup d'etat there were no more conspiracies at home charles x believed he had no domestic enemies but in politics as at sea a calm may be deceptive thus corentin had lapsed into total idleness in such a case a true sportsman to keep his hand in for lack of larks kills sparrows 
Domitian, we know, for lack of Christians, killed flies. Contenson, having witnessed Esther's arrest, had, with the keen instinct of a spy, fully understood the upshot of the business. The rascal, as we have seen, did not attempt to conceal his opinion of the Baron de Nucingen. Who is benefiting by making the banker pay so dear for his passion? was the first question the allies asked each other. Recognizing Asie as a leader in the piece, Contenson hoped to find out the author through her, but she slipped through his fingers again and again, hiding like an eel in the mud of Paris. And when he found her again as the cook in Esther's establishment, it seemed to him inexplicable that the half-caste woman should have had a finger in the pie thus for the first time these two artistic spies had come on a text that they could not decipher while suspecting a dark plot to the story after three bold attempts on the house in the rue Tebou, contenson still met with absolute dumbness so long as esther dwelt there the lodge porter seemed to live in mortal terror as he had perhaps promised poisoned meat-balls to all the family in the event of any indiscretion on the day after esther's removal contenson found this man rather more amenable he regretted the lady he said who had fed him with the broken dishes from her table contenson disguised as a broker tried to bargain for the rooms and listened to the porter's lamentations while he fooled him casting a doubt on all the man said by a questioning really yes monsieur the lady lived here for five years without ever going out and more by token her lover desperately jealous though she was beyond reproach took the greatest precautions when he came in or went out and a very handsome young man he was too lucien was at this time still staying with his sister madame sechard but as soon as he returned contenson sent the porter to the quai malaquais to ask monsieur de rubempre whether he were willing to part with the furniture left in the rooms lately occupied by madame van bogseck the porter then recognized lucien as the young widow's mysterious lover and this was all that contenson wanted the deep but suppressed astonishment may be imagined with which lucien and carlos received the porter whom they affected to regard as a madman they tried to upset his convictions within twenty-four hours carlos had organized a force which detected contenson red-handed in the act of espionage contenson disguised as a market porter had twice already brought home the provisions purchased in the morning by asie and had twice got into the little mansion in the rue saint georges corentin on his part was making a stir but he was stopped short by recognizing the certain identity of carlos herrera for he learned at once that this abbe the secret envoy of ferdinand the seventh had come to paris towards the end of eighteen twenty three still corentin thought it worth while to study the reasons which had led the spaniard to take an interest in lucien de rubempre it was soon clear to him beyond doubt that esther had for five years been lucien's mistress so the substitution of the english woman had been effected for the advantage of that young dandy now lucien had no means he was rejected as a suitor for mademoiselle de grandlieu and he had just bought up the lands of rubempre at the cost of a million francs corentin very skilfully made the head of the general police take the first steps and the prefet de police apropos de peyrade informed his chief that the appellants in that affair had been in fact the comte de serizy and lucien de rubempre we have it cried peyrade and corentin the two friends had laid plans in a moment this hussy said corentin has had intimacies she must have some women friends among them we shall certainly find one or another who is down on her luck one of us must play the part of a rich foreigner and take her up 
we will throw them together they always want something of each other in the game of lovers and we shall then be in the citadel peyrade naturally proposed to assume his disguise as an englishman the wild life he should lead during the time that he would take to disentangle the plot of which he had been the victim smiled on his fancy while corentin grown old in his functions and weakly too did not care for it disguised as a mulatto contenson at once evaded carlos's force just three days before peyrade's meeting with madame du val-noble in the champs elysees this last of the agents employed by messieurs de sartine and lenoir had arrived provided with a passport at the hotel mirabeau rue de la paix having come from the colonies via le havre in a travelling chaise as mud-splashed as though it had really come from le havre instead of no further than by the road from saint denis to paris carlos herrera on his part had his passport vis at the spanish embassy and arranged everything at the quai malaquais to start for madrid and this is why within a few days esther was to become the owner of the house in the rue saint georges and of shares yielding thirty thousand francs a year europe and asie were quite cunning enough to persuade her to sell these shares and privately transmit the money to lucien thus lucien proclaiming himself rich through his sister's liberality would pay the remainder of the price of the rubempre estates of this transaction no one could complain esther alone could betray herself but she would die rather than blink an eyelash clotilde had appeared with a little pink kerchief round her crane's neck so she had won her game at the hotel de grandlieu the shares in the omnibus company were already worth thrice their initial value carlos by disappearing for a few days would put malice off the scent human prudence had foreseen everything no error was possible the false spaniard was to start on the morrow of the day when peyrade met madame du val-noble but that very night at two in the morning asie came in a cab to the quai malaquais and found the stoker of the machine smoking in his room and reconsidering all the points of the situation here stated in a few words like an author going over a page in his book to discover any faults to be corrected such a man would not allow himself a second time such an oversight as that of the porter in the rue taitbout paccard whispered asie in her master's ear recognized contenson yesterday at half-past two in the champs elysees disguised as a mulatto servant to an englishman who for the last three days has been seen walking in the champs elysees watching esther paccard knew the hound by his eyes as i did when he dressed up as a market porter paccard drove the girl home taking a round so as not to lose sight of the wretch contenson is at the hotel mirabeau but he exchanged so many signs of intelligence with the englishman that paccard says the other cannot possibly be an englishman we have a gadfly behind us said carlos i will not leave till the day after to-morrow that contenson is certainly the man who sent the porter after us from the rue taitbout we must ascertain whether this sham englishman is our foe end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter nine at noon mr samuel johnson's black servant was solemnly waiting on his master who always breakfasted too heartily with a purpose peyrade wished to pass for a tippling englishman he never went out till he was half seas over he wore black cloth gaiters up to his knees and padded to make his legs look stouter his trousers were lined with the thickest fustian his waistcoat was buttoned up to his cheeks 
a red scratch wig hid half his forehead and he had added nearly three inches to his height in short the oldest frequenter of the cafe david could not have recognized him from his square-cut coat of black cloth with full skirts he might have been taken for an english millionaire contenson made a show of the cold insolence of a nabob's confidential servant he was taciturn abrupt scornful and uncommunicative and indulged in fierce exclamations and uncouth gestures peyrade was finishing his second bottle when one of the hotel waiters unceremoniously showed in a man in whom peyrade and contenson both at once discerned a gendarme in mufti monsieur peyrade said the gendarme to the nabob speaking in his ear my instructions are to take you to the prefecture peyrade without saying a word rose and took down his hat you will find a hackney coach at the door said the man as they went downstairs the prefet thought of arresting you but he decided on sending for you to ask some explanation of your conduct through the peace officer whom you will find in the coach shall i ride with you asked the gendarme of the peace officer when peyrade had got in no replied the other tell the coachman quietly to drive to the prefecture peyrade and carlos were now face to face in the coach carlos had a stiletto under his hand the coach driver was a man he could trust quite capable of allowing carlos to get out without seeing him or being surprised on arriving at his journey's end to find a dead body in his cab no inquiries are ever made about a spy the law almost always leaves such murders unpunished it is so difficult to know the rights of the case peyrade looked with his keenest eye at the magistrate sent to examine him by the prefet of police carlos struck him as satisfactory a bald head deeply wrinkled at the back and powdered hair a pair of very light gold spectacles with double green glasses over weak eyes with red rims evidently needing care these eyes seemed the trace of some squalid malady a cotton shirt with a flat pleated frill a shabby black satin waistcoat the trousers of a man of law black spun silk stockings and shoes tied with ribbon a long black overcoat cheap gloves black and worn for ten days and a gold watch chain in every point the lower grade of magistrate known by a perversion of terms as a peace officer my dear monsieur peyrade i regret to find such a man as you the object of surveillance and that you should act so as to justify it your disguise is not to the prefet's taste if you fancy that you can thus escape our vigilance you are mistaken you travelled from england by way of beaumont sur oise no doubt beaumont sur oise repeated peyrade or by saint denis said the sham lawyer peyrade lost his presence of mind the question must be answered now any reply might be dangerous in the affirmative it was farcical in the negative if this man knew the truth it would be peyrade's ruin he is a sharp fellow thought he he tried to look at the man and smile and he gave him a smile for an answer the smile passed muster without protest for what purpose have you disguised yourself taken rooms at the mirabeau and dressed contenson as a black servant asked the peace officer monsieur le prefet may do what he chooses with me but i owe no account of my actions to any one but my chief said peyrade with dignity if you mean me to infer that you are acting by the orders of the general police said the other coldly we will change our route and drive to the rue de grenelle instead of the rue de jerusalem i have clear instructions with regard to you but be careful you are not in any deep disgrace and you may spoil your own game in a moment as for me i owe you no grudge come tell me the truth well then this is the truth said peyrade with a glance at his cerberus's red eyes 
the sham lawyer's face remained expressionless impassable he was doing his business all truths were the same to him he looked as though he suspected the prefet of some caprice prefets have their little tantrums i have fallen desperately in love with a woman the mistress of that stockbroker who is gone abroad for his own pleasure and the displeasure of his creditors Fayex. madame du val noble yes replied peyrade to keep her for a month which will not cost me more than a thousand crowns i have got myself up as a nabob and taken contenson as my servant this is so absolutely true monsieur that if you like to leave me in the coach where i will wait for you on my honor as an old commissioner-general of police you can go to the hotel and question contenson not only will contenson confirm what i have the honor of stating but you may see madame du val noble's waiting-maid who is to come this morning to signify her mistress's acceptance of my offers or the conditions she makes an old monkey knows what grimaces mean i have offered her a thousand francs a month and a carriage that comes to fifteen hundred five hundred francs worth of presents and as much again in some outings dinners and play-going you see i am not deceiving you by a centime when i say a thousand crowns a man of my age may well spend a thousand crowns on his last fancy bless me papa peyrade and you still care enough for women to but you are deceiving me i am sixty myself and i can do without him however if the case is as you state it i quite understand that you should have found it necessary to get yourself up as a foreigner to indulge your fancy you can understand that peyrade or old Concuel of the rue des moineaux i neither of them would have suited madame du val noble carlos put in delighted to have picked up Concuel's address before the revolution he went on i had for my mistress a woman who had previously been kept by the gentleman in waiting as they then called the executioner one evening at the play she pricked herself with a pin and cried out a customary ejaculation in those days ah bourreau on which her neighbor asked her if this were a reminiscence well my dear peyrade she cast off her man for that speech i suppose you have no wish to expose yourself to such a slap in the face madame du val noble is a woman for gentlemen i saw her once at the opera and thought her very handsome tell the driver to go back to the rue de la paix my dear peyrade i will go upstairs with you to your rooms and see for myself a verbal report will no doubt be enough for monsieur le prefet carlos took a snuff-box from his side pocket a black snuff-box lined with silver gilt and offered it to peyrade with an impulse of delightful good fellowship peyrade said to himself and these are their agents good heavens what would monsieur lenoir say if he could come back to life or monsieur de sartine that is part of the truth no doubt but it is not all said the sham lawyer sniffing up his pinch of snuff you have had a finger in the baron de nucingen's love affairs and you wish no doubt to entangle him in some slipknot you missed fire with the pistol and you are aiming at him with a field piece madame de val noble is a friend of madame de champy's devil take it i must take care not to founder said peyrade to himself he is a better man than i thought him he is playing me he talks of letting me go and he goes on making me blab well asked carlos with a magisterial air monsieur it is true that i have been so foolish as to seek a woman in monsieur de nucingen's behoof because he was half mad with love that is the cause of my being out of favor for it would seem that quite unconsciously i touched some important interests the officer of the law remained immovable but after fifty-two years experience peyrade went on i know the police well enough to have held my hand after the blowing up i had from monsieur le prefet who no doubt was right 
then you would give up this fancy if monsieur le prefet required it of you that i think would be the best proof you could give of the sincerity of what you say he is going it he is going it thought peyrade ah by all that's holy the police to-day is a match for that of monsieur lenoir give it up said he aloud i will wait till i have monsieur le prefet's orders but here we are at the hotel if you wish to come up where do you find the money said carlos point-blank with a sagacious glance monsieur i have a friend get along said carlos go and tell that story to an examining magistrate this audacious stroke on carlos's part was the outcome of one of those calculations so simple that none but a man of his temper would have thought it out at a very early hour he had sent lucien to madame de serizy's lucien had begged the count's private secretary as from the count to go and obtain from the prefet of police full particulars concerning the agent employed by the baron de nucingen the secretary came back provided with a note concerning peyrade a copy of the summary noted on the back of his record in the police force since seventeen seventy eight having come to paris from avignon two years previously without money or character possessed of certain state secrets lives in the rue des moineaux under the name of Concouel, the name of a little estate where his family resides in the department of vaucluse very respectable people was lately inquired for by a grand-nephew named theodore de la perade see the report of an agent number thirty seven of the documents he must be the man to whom contenson is playing the mulatto servant cried carlos when lucien returned with other information besides this note within three hours this man with the energy of a commander-in-chief had found by paccard's help an innocent accomplice capable of playing the part of a gendarme in disguise and had got himself up as a peace officer three times in the coach he had thought of killing peyrade but he had made it a rule never to commit a murder with his own hand he promised himself that he would get rid of peyrade all in good time by pointing him out as a millionaire to some released convicts about the town peyrade and his mentor as they went in heard contenson's voice arguing with madame du val-noble's maid peyrade signed to carlos to remain in the outer room with a look meant to convey thus you can assure yourself of my sincerity madame agrees to everything said adele madame is at this moment calling on a friend madame de champy who has some rooms in the rue taitbout on her hands for a year full of furniture which she will let her have no doubt madame can receive mr johnson more suitably there for the furniture is still very decent and monsieur might buy it for madame by coming to an agreement with madame de champy very good my girl if this is not a job of fleecing it is a bit of the wool said the mulatto to the astonished woman however we will go shares that is your darky all over cried mademoiselle adele if your nabob is a nabob he can very well afford to give madame the furniture the lease ends in april eighteen thirty your nabob may renew it if he likes i am quite willing said peyrade speaking french with a strong english accent as he came in and tapped the woman on the shoulder he cast a knowing look back at carlos who replied by an assenting nod understanding that the nabob was to keep up his part but the scene suddenly changed its aspect at the entrance of a person over whom neither carlos nor peyrade had the least power corentin suddenly came in he had found the door open and looked in as he went by to see how his old friend played his part as a nabob the prefet is still bullying me said peyrade in a whisper to corentin he has found me out as a nabob we will spill the prefet corentin muttered in reply then after a cool bow he stood darkly scrutinizing the magistrate stay here till i return said carlos i will go to the prefecture 
if you do not see me again you may go your own way having said this in an undertone to peyrade so as not to humiliate him in the presence of the waiting-maid carlos went away not caring to remain under the eye of the newcomer in whom he detected one of those fair-haired blue-eyed men coldly terrifying that is the peace officer sent after me by the prefet said peyrade that said corentin you have walked into a trap that man has three packs of cards in his shoes you can see that by the place of his foot in the shoe besides a peace officer need wear no disguise corentin hurried downstairs to verify his suspicions carlos was getting into the fly hello monsieur l'abbé cried corentin carlos looked around saw corentin and got in quickly still corentin had time to say that was all i wanted to know que malaque he shouted to the driver with a diabolical mockery in his tone and expression i am done said jacques collin to himself they have got me i must get ahead of them by sheer pace and above all find out what they want of us corentin had seen the abbe carlos herrera five or six times and the man's eyes were unforgettable corentin had suspected him at once from the cut of his shoulders then by his puffy face and the trick of three inches of added height gained by a heel inside the shoe ah old fellow they have drawn you said corentin finding no one in the room but peyrade and contenson who cried peyrade with metallic hardness i will spend my last days in putting him on a gridiron and turning him on it it is the abbe carlos herrera the corentin of spain as i suppose this explains everything the spaniard is a demon of the first water who has tried to make a fortune for that little young man by coining money out of a pretty baggage's bolster it is your lookout if you think you can measure your skill with a man who seems to me the very devil to deal with oh exclaimed contenson he fingered the three hundred thousand francs the day when esther was arrested he was in the cab i remember those eyes that brow and those marks of the smallpox oh what a fortune my lydie might have had cried peyrade you may still play the nabob said corentin to keep an eye on esther you must keep up her intimacy with val noble she was really lucien's mistress they have got more than five hundred thousand francs out of nucingen already said contenson and they want as much again corentin went on the rubempre estate is to cost a million daddy added he slapping peyrade on the shoulder you may get more than a hundred thousand francs to settle on lydie don't tell me that corentin if your scheme should fail i cannot tell what i might not do you will have it by to-morrow perhaps the abbe my dear fellow is most astute we shall have to kiss his spurs he is a very superior devil but i have him sure enough he is not a fool and he will knock under try to be a gaby as well as a nabob and fear nothing End of section 29section thirty of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter ten in the evening of this day when the opposing forces had met face to face on level ground lucien spent the evening at the hotel grandlieu the party was a large one in the face of all the assembly the duchess kept lucien at her side for some time and was most kind to him you are going away for a little while said she yes madame la duchesse my sister in her anxiety to promote my marriage has made great sacrifices and i have been enabled to repurchase the lands of the rubempres to reconstitute the whole estate 
but i have found in my paris lawyer a very clever man who has managed to save me from the extortionate terms that the holders would have asked if they had known the name of the purchaser is there a chateau asked clotilde with too broad a smile there is something which might be called a chateau but the wiser plan would be to use the building materials in the construction of a modern residence clotilde's eyes blazed with happiness above her smile of satisfaction you must play a rubber with my father this evening said she in a fortnight i hope you will be asked to dinner well my dear sir said the duc de grandlieu i am told that you have bought the estate of rubempre i congratulate you it is an answer to those who say you are in debt we bigwigs like france or england are allowed to have a public debt but men of no fortune beginners you see may not assume that privilege indeed monsieur le duc i still owe five hundred thousand francs on my land well well you must marry a wife who can bring you the money but you will have some difficulty in finding a match with such a fortune in our faubourg where daughters do not get large dowries their name is enough said lucien we are only three whisk players maufrigneuse d'espard and i will you make a fourth said the duke pointing to the card table clotilde came to the table to watch her father's game she expects me to believe that she means it for me said the duke patting his daughter's hands and looking round at lucien who remained quite grave lucien monsieur d'espard's partner lost twenty louis my dear mother said clotilde to the duchess he was so judicious as to lose at eleven o'clock after a few affectionate words with mademoiselle de grandlieu lucien went home and to bed thinking of the complete triumph he was to enjoy a month hence for he had not a doubt of being accepted as clotilde's lover and married before lent in eighteen thirty on the morrow when lucien was smoking his cigarettes after breakfast sitting with carlos who had become much depressed monsieur de saint esteve was announced what a touch of irony who begged to see either the abbe carlos herrera or monsieur lucien de rubempre was he told downstairs that i had left paris cried the abbe yes sir replied the groom well then you must see the man said he to lucien but do not say a single compromising word do not let a sign of surprise escape you it is the enemy you will overhear me said lucien carlos hid in the adjoining room and through the crack of the door he saw corentin whom he recognized only by his voice such powers of transformation did the great man possess this time corentin looked like an old paymaster-general i have not had the honor of being known to you monsieur corentin began but excuse my interrupting you monsieur but but the matter in point is your marriage to mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu which will never take place corentin added eagerly lucien sat down and made no reply you are in the power of a man who is able and willing and ready to prove to the duc de grandlieu that the lands of rubempre are to be paid for with the money that a fool has given to your mistress mademoiselle esther corentin went on it will be quite easy to find the minutes of the legal opinions in virtue of which mademoiselle esther was summoned there are ways too of making d'estourny speak the very clever manoeuvres employed against the baron de nucingen will be brought to light as yet all can be arranged pay down a hundred thousand francs and you will have peace all this is no concern of mine i am only the agent of those who levy this blackmail nothing more corentin might have talked for an hour lucien smoked his cigarette with an air of perfect indifference monsieur replied he 
i do not want to know who you are for men who undertake such jobs as these have no name at any rate in my vocabulary i have allowed you to talk at your leisure i am at home you seem to me not bereft of common sense listen to my dilemma there was a pause during which lucien met corentin's cat-like eye fixed on him with a perfectly icy stare either you are building on facts that are absolutely false and i need pay no heed to them said lucien or you are in the right and in that case by giving you a hundred thousand francs i put you in a position to ask me for as many hundred thousand francs as your employer can find saint esteves to ask for however to put an end once and for all to your kind intervention i would have you know that i lucien de rubempre fear no one i have no part in the jobbery of which you speak if the grandlieus make difficulties there are other young ladies of very good family ready to be married after all it is no loss to me if i remain single especially if as you imagine i deal in blank bills to such advantage if monsieur l'abbe carlos herrera monsieur lucien put in the abbe herrera is at this moment on the way to spain he has nothing to do with my marriage my interests are no concern of his that remarkable statesman was good enough to assist me at one time with his advice but he has reports to present to his majesty the king of spain if you have anything to say to him i recommend you to set out for madrid monsieur said corentin plainly you will never be mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu's husband so much the worse for her replied lucien impatiently pushing corentin towards the door you have fully considered the matter asked corentin coldly monsieur i do not recognize that you have any right either to meddle in my affairs or to make me waste a cigarette said lucien throwing away his cigarette that had gone out good day monsieur said corentin we shall not meet again but there will certainly be a moment in your life when you would give half your fortune to have called me back from these stairs in answer to this threat carlos made as though he were cutting off a head now to business cried he looking at lucien who was as white as ashes after this dreadful interview end of section thirty section thirty one of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter eleven if among the small number of my readers who take an interest in the moral and philosophical side of this book there should be only one capable of believing that the baron de nucingen was happy that one would prove how difficult it is to explain the heart of a courtesan by any kind of physiological formula esther was resolved to make the poor millionaire pay dearly for what he called his day of triumph and at the beginning of february eighteen thirty the housewarming party had not yet been given in the little palace well said esther in confidence to her friends who repeated it to the baron i shall open house at the carnival and i mean to make my man as happy as a cock in plaster the phrase became proverbial among women of her kidney the baron gave vent to much lamentation like married men he made himself very ridiculous he began to complain to his intimate friends and his dissatisfaction was generally known esther meanwhile took quite a serious view of her position as the pompadour of this prince of speculators she had given two or three small evening parties solely to get lucien into the house lousteau rastignac du tillet bichu nathan the comte de brambourg all the cream of the dissipated crew frequented her drawing-room 
and as leading ladies in the piece she was playing esther accepted tullia florentine fanny beaupre and florine two dancers and two actresses besides madame du val noble nothing can be more dreary than a courtesan's home without the spice of rivalry the display of dress and some variety of type in six weeks esther had become the wittiest the most amusing the loveliest and the most elegant of those female pariahs who form the class of kept women placed on the pedestal that became her she enjoyed all the delights of vanity which fascinate women in general but still as one who is raised above her caste by a secret thought she cherished in her heart an image of herself which she gloried in while it made her blush the hour when she must abdicate was ever present to her consciousness thus she lived a double life really scorning herself her sarcastic remarks were tinged by the temper which was roused in her by the intense contempt felt by the angel of love hidden in the courtesan for the disgraceful and odious part played by the body in the presence as it were of the soul at once actor and spectator victim and judge she was a living realization of the beautiful arabian tales in which a noble creature lies hidden under a degrading form and of which the type is the story of nebuchadnezzar in the book of books the bible having granted herself a lease of life till the day after her infidelity the victim might surely play a while with the executioner moreover the enlightenment that had come to esther as to the secretly disgraceful means by which the baron had made his colossal fortune relieved her of every scruple she could play the part of ate the goddess of vengeance as carlos said and so she was by turns enchanting and odious to the banker who lived only for her when the baron had been worked up to such a pitch of suffering that he wanted only to be quit of esther she brought him round by a scene of tender affection herrera making a great show of starting for spain had gone as far as tours he had sent the chaise on as far as bordeaux with a servant inside engaged to play the part of master and to wait for him at bordeaux then returning by diligence dressed as a commercial traveller he had secretly taken up his abode under esther's roof and thence aided by asie and Arop, carefully directed all his machinations keeping an eye on every one and especially on peyrade about a fortnight before the day chosen for her great entertainment which was to be given in the evening after the first opera ball the courtesan whose witticisms were beginning to make her feared happened to be at the italian opera at the back of a box which the baron forced to give a box had secured in the lowest tier in order to conceal his mistress and not to flaunt her in public within a few feet of madame de nucingen esther had taken her seat so as to rake that of madame de serizy whom lucien almost invariably accompanied the poor girl made her whole happiness centre in watching lucien on tuesdays thursdays and saturdays by madame de serizy's side at about half-past nine in the evening esther could see lucien enter the countess's box with a care-laden brow pale and with almost drawn features these symptoms of mental anguish were legible only to esther the knowledge of a man's countenance is to the woman who loves him like that of the sea to a sailor good god what can be the matter what has happened does he want to speak with that angel of hell who is to him a guardian angel and who lives in an attic between those of europe and asie tormented by such reflections esther scarcely listened to the music still less it may be believed did she listen to the baron who held one of his angel's hands in both his talking to her in his horrible polish jewish accent 
a jargon which must be as unpleasant to read as it is to hear spoken esther said he releasing her hand and pushing it away with a slight touch of temper you do not listen to me i tell you what baron you blunder in love as you gibber in french der teufel i am not in my boudoir here i am at the opera if you were not a barrel made by Ure or fichet metamorphosed into a man by some trick of nature you would not make so much noise in a box with a woman who is fond of music i don't listen to you i should think not there you sit rustling my dress like a cockchafer in a paper bag and making me laugh with contempt you say to me you are so pretty i should like to eat you old simpleton supposing i were to say to you you are less intolerable this evening than you were yesterday we will go home well from the way you puff and sigh for i feel you if i don't listen to you i perceive that you have eaten an enormous dinner and your digestion is at work let me instruct you for i cost you enough to give some advice for your money now and then let me tell you my dear fellow that a man whose digestion is so troublesome as yours is is not justified in telling his mistress that she is pretty at unseemly hours an old soldier died of that very folly in the arms of religion as blondet has it it is now ten o'clock you finished dinner at du Tillet's at nine o'clock with your pigeon the comte de brambourg you have millions and truffles to digest come to-morrow night at ten that you are cruel cried the baron recognizing the profound truth of this medical argument cruel echoed esther still looking at lucien have you not consulted bianchon desplein old audry since you have had a glimpse of future happiness do you know what you seem like to me no what a fat old fellow wrapped in flannel who walks every hour from his armchair to the window to see if the thermometer has risen to the degree marked silkworms the temperature prescribed by his physician you are really an ungrateful slut cried the baron in despair at hearing a tune which however amorous old men not unfrequently hear at the opera ungrateful retorted esther what have you given me till now a great deal of annoyance come papa can i be proud of you 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 are proud of me i wear your livery and badge with an air you paid my debts so you did but you have grabbed so many millions come you need not sulk you admitted that to me that you need not think twice of that and this is your chief title to fame a baggage and a thief a well-assorted couple you have built a splendid cage for a parrot that amuses you go and ask a brazilian cockatoo what gratitude it owes to the man who placed it in a gilded cage don't look at me like that you are just like a buddhist bonds well you show your red and white cockatoo to all paris you say does anybody else in paris own such a parrot and how well it talks how cleverly it picks its words if du Tillet comes in it says at once how do little swindler why you are as happy as a dutchman who has grown an unique tulip as an old nabob pensioned off in asia by england when a commercial traveller sells him the first swiss snuff-box that opens in three places you want to win my heart well now i will tell you how to do it speak speak there is nothing i shall not do for you i love to be fooled by you be young be handsome be like lucien de rubempre over there by your wife and you shall have gratis what you can never buy with all your millions i shall go away for really you are too bad this evening said the banker with a lengthened face very well good night then said esther tell georges to make your pillows very high and place your feet low for you look apoplectic this evening 
you cannot say my dear that i take no interest in your health the baron was standing up and held the door-knob in his hand here nucingen said esther with an imperious gesture the baron bent over her with dog-like devotion do you want to see me very sweet and giving you sugar and water and petting you in my house this very evening old monster you shall break my heart break your heart you mean bore you she went on well bring me lucien that i may invite him to our belshazzar's feast and you may be sure he will not fail to come if you succeed in that little transaction i will tell you that i love you my fat frederic in such plain terms that you cannot but believe me you are an enchantress said the baron kissing esther's glove i should be willing to listen to abuse for ein hour if always der was a kiss at the end of it but if i am not obeyed i and she threatened the baron with her finger as we threaten children the baron raised his head like a bird caught in a springe and imploring the trapper's pity dear heaven what ails lucien said she to herself when she was alone making no attempt to check her falling tears i never saw him so sad end of section thirty one Section thirty two of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter twelve. This is what had happened to Lucien that very evening. At nine o'clock he had gone out, as he did every evening, in his brougham to go to the Hotel de Grandlieu using his saddle-horse and cab in the morning only like all young men he had hired a brougham for winter evenings and had chosen a first-class carriage and splendid horses from one of the best job-masters for the last month all had gone well with him he had dined with the grandlieus three times the duke was delightful to him his shares in the omnibus company sold for three hundred thousand francs had paid off a third more of the price of the land clotilde de grandlieu who dressed beautifully now reddened inch thick when he went into the room and loudly proclaimed her attachment to him some personages of high estate discussed their marriage as a probable event the duc de chaulieu formerly ambassador to spain and now for a short while minister for foreign affairs had promised the duchesse de grandlieu that he would ask for the title of marquis for lucien so that evening after dining with madame de serizy lucien had driven to the faubourg saint germain to pay his daily visit he arrives the coachman calls for the gate to be opened he drives into the courtyard and stops at the steps lucien on getting out remarks four other carriages in waiting on seeing m de rubempre one of the footmen placed to open and shut the hall door comes forward and out on to the steps in front of the door like a soldier on guard his grace is not at home says he madame la duchesse is receiving company observes lucien to the servant madame la duchesse is gone out replies the man solemnly mademoiselle clotilde i do not think that mademoiselle clotilde will see you monsieur in the absence of madame la duchesse but there are people here replies lucien in dismay i do not know sir says the man trying to seem stupid and to be respectful there is nothing more fatal than etiquette to those who regard it as the most formidable arm of social law lucien easily interpreted the meaning of this scene so disastrous to him the duke and duchess would not admit him he felt the spinal marrow freezing in the core of his vertebral column and a sickly cold sweat bedewed his brow the conversation had taken place in the presence of his own body-servant who held the door of the brougham doubting whether to shut it lucien signed to him that he was going away again 
but as he stepped into the carriage he heard the noise of people coming downstairs and the servant called out first madame la duchesse de chaulieu's people then madame la vicomtesse de grandlieu's carriage lucien merely said to the italian opera but in spite of his haste the luckless dandy could not escape the duc de chaulieu and his son the duc de rhetore to whom he was obliged to bow for they did not speak a word to him a great catastrophe at court the fall of a formidable favorite has ere now been pronounced on the threshold of a royal study in one word from an usher with a face like a plaster cast how am i to let my adviser know of this disaster this instant thought lucien as he drove to the opera house what is going on he racked his brain with conjectures this was what had taken place that morning at eleven o'clock the duc de grandlieu as he went into the little room where the family all breakfasted together said to clotilde after kissing her until further orders my child think no more of the sieur de rubempre then he had taken the duchesse by the hand and led her into a window recess to say a few words in an undertone which made poor clotilde turn pale for she watched her mother as she listened to the duke and saw her expression of extreme surprise jean said the duke to one of his servants take this note to monsieur le duc de chaulieu and beg him to answer by you yes or no i am asking him to dine here to-day he added to his wife breakfast had been a most melancholy meal the duchess was meditative the duke seemed to be vexed with himself and clotilde could with difficulty restrain her tears my child your father is right you must obey him the mother had said to the daughter with much emotion i do not say as he does think no more of lucien no for i understand your suffering clotilde kissed her mother's hand but i do say my darling wait take no step suffer in silence since you love him and put your trust in your parents care great ladies my child are great just because they can do their duty on every occasion and do it nobly but what is it about asked clotilde as white as a lily matters too serious to be discussed with you my dearest the duchess replied for if they are untrue your mind would be unnecessarily sullied and if they are true you must never know them at six o'clock the duc de chaulieu had come to join the duc de grandlieu who awaited him in his study tell me henri for the dukes were on the most familiar terms and addressed each other by their christian names this is one of the shades invented to mark a degree of intimacy to repel the audacity of french familiarity and humiliate conceit tell me henri i am in such a desperate difficulty that i can only ask advice of an old friend who understands business and you have practice and experience my daughter clotilde as you know is in love with that little rubempre whom i have been almost compelled to accept as her promised husband i have always been averse to the marriage however madame de grandlieu could not bear to thwart clotilde's passion when the young fellow had repurchased the family estate and paid three-quarters of the price i could make no further objections but last evening i received an anonymous letter you know how much that is worth in which i am informed that the young fellow's fortune is derived from some disreputable source and that he is telling lies when he says that his sister is giving him the necessary funds for his purchase for my daughter's happiness and for the sake of our family i am adjured to make inquiries and the means of doing so are suggested to me here read it i am entirely of your opinion as to the value of anonymous letters my dear ferdinand said the duc de chaulieu after reading the letter still though we may condemn them we must make use of them we must treat such letters as we would treat a spy 
keep the young man out of the house and let us make inquiries i know how to do it your lawyer is derville a man in whom we have perfect confidence he knows the secrets of many families and can certainly be trusted with this he is an honest man a man of weight and a man of honor he is cunning and wily but his wiliness is only in the way of business and you need only employ him to obtain evidence you can depend upon we have in the foreign office an agent of the superior police who is unique in his power of discovering state secrets we often send him on such missions inform derville that he will have a lieutenant in the case our spy is a gentleman who will appear wearing the ribbon of the legion of honor and looking like a diplomat this rascal will do the hunting derville will only look on your lawyer will then tell you if the mountain brings forth a mouse or if you must throw over this little rubempre within a week you will know what you are doing the young man is not yet so far a marquis as to take offence at my being not at home for a week said the duc de grandlieu above all if you end by giving him your daughter replied the minister if the anonymous letter tells the truth what of that you can send clotilde to travel with my daughter-in-law madeleine who wants to go to italy you relieve me immensely i don't know whether i ought to thank you wait till the end by the way exclaimed the duc de grandlieu what is your man's name i must mention it to derville send him to me to-morrow by five o'clock i will have derville here and put them in communication his real name said monsieur de chaulieu is i think corentin a name you must never have heard for my gentleman will come ticketed with his official name he calls himself monsieur de saint something saint yves saint valere something of the kind you may trust him louis the eighteenth had perfect confidence in him after this confabulation the steward had orders to shut the door on monsieur de rubempre which was done lucien paced the waiting-room at the opera house like a man who was drunk he fancied himself the talk of all paris he had in the duc de rhetore one of those unrelenting enemies on whom a man must smile as he can never be revenged since their attacks are in conformity with the rules of society the duc de rhetore knew the scene that had just taken place on the outside steps of the grandlieu's house lucien feeling the necessity of at once reporting the catastrophe to his high privy councillor nevertheless was afraid of compromising himself by going to esther's house where he might find company he actually forgot that esther was here so confused were his thoughts and in the midst of so much perplexity he was obliged to make small talk with rastignac who knowing nothing of the news congratulated him on his approaching marriage at this moment nucingen appeared smiling and said to lucien will you do me the pleasure to come to see montame de champy vat will invite you herself to van housewarming party with pleasure baron replied lucien to whom the baron appeared as a rescuing angel leave us said esther to monsieur de nucingen when she saw him come in with lucien go and see madame du val noble whom i discover in a box on the third tier with her nabob a great many nabobs grow in the indies she added with a knowing glance at lucien and that one said lucien smiling is uncommonly like yours and then said esther answering lucien with another look of intelligence while still speaking to the baron bring her here with her nabob he is very anxious to make your acquaintance they say he is very rich the poor woman has already poured out i know not how many elegies she complains that her nabob is no good and if you relieve him of his ballast perhaps he will sail closer to the wind you think we are all thieves said the baron as he went away what ails you my lucien 
asked esther in her friend's ear just touching it with her lips as soon as the box door was shut i am lost i have just been turned from the door of the hotel de grandlieu under pretence that no one was admitted the duke and duchess were at home and five pairs of horses were champing in the courtyard what will the marriage not take place exclaimed esther much agitated for she saw a glimpse of paradise i do not yet know what is being plotted against me my lucien said she in a deliciously coaxing voice why be worried about it you can make a better match by and by i will get you the price of two estates give us supper to-night that i may be able to speak in secret to carlos and above all invite the sham englishman and val noble that nabob is my ruin he is our enemy we will get hold of him and we but lucien broke off with a gesture of despair well what is it asked the poor girl oh madame de serizy sees me cried lucien and to crown our woes the duc de rhetore who witnessed my dismissal is with her in fact at that very minute the duc de rhetore was amusing himself with madame de serizy's discomfiture do you allow lucien to be seen in mademoiselle esther's box said the young duke pointing to the box and to lucien you who take an interest in him should really tell him such things are not allowed he may sup at her house he may even but in fact i am no longer surprised at the grandlieu's coolness towards the young man i have just seen their door shut in his face on the front steps women of that sort are very dangerous said madame de serizy turning her opera glass on esther's box yes said the duke as much by what they can do as by what they wish they will ruin him cried madame de serizy for i am told they cost as much whether they are paid or no not to him said the young duke affecting surprise they are far from costing him anything they give him money at need and all run after him the countess's lips showed a little nervous twitching which could not be included in any category of smiles well then said esther come to supper at midnight bring blondet and rastignac let us have two amusing persons at any rate and we won't be more than nine you must find some excuse for sending the baron to fetch eugenie under pretence of warning asie and tell her what has befallen me so that carlos may know before he has the nabob under his claws that shall be done said esther and thus peyrade was probably about to find himself unwittingly under the same roof with his adversary the tiger was coming into the lion's den and a lion surrounded by his guards when lucien went back to madame de serizy's box instead of turning to him smiling and arranging her skirts for him to sit by her she affected to pay him not the slightest attention but looked about the house through her glass lucien could see however by the shaking of her hand that the countess was suffering from one of those terrible emotions by which illicit joys are paid for he went to the front of the box all the same and sat down by her at the opposite corner leaving a little vacant space between himself and the countess he leaned on the ledge of the box with his elbow resting his chin on his gloved hand then he half turned away waiting for a word by the middle of the act the countess had still neither spoken to him nor looked at him i do not know said she at last why you are here your place is in mademoiselle esther's box i will go there said lucien leaving the box without looking at the countess my dear said madame du val noble going into esther's box with peyrade whom the baron de nucingen did not recognize 
I am delighted to introduce Mr. Samuel Johnson. He is a great admirer of Monsieur de Nucingen's talents. Indeed, monsieur, said Esther, smiling at Peyrade. Oh, yes, beaucoup, said Peyrade. Why, baron, here is a way of speaking French which is as much like yours as the low Breton dialect is like that of Burgundy. It will be most amusing to hear you discuss money matters. Do you know, Monsieur Nabob, what I shall require of you if you are to make acquaintance with my baron? said Esther with a smile. Oh, thank you so much. You will introduce me to Sir Baronet, said Peyrade with an extravagant English accent. Yes, said she, you must give me the pleasure of your company at supper. There is no pitch stronger than champagne for sticking men together. It seals every kind of business, above all such as you put your foot in. Come this evening, you will find some jolly fellows. As for you, my little Frederic, she added in the baron's ear, you have your carriage here. Just drive to the Rue Saint-Georges and bring Europe to me here. I have a few words to say to her about the supper. I have caught Lucien. He will bring two men who will be fun. We will draw the Englishman, she whispered to Madame du Val Noble. Peyrade and the baron left the women together. Oh, my dear, if you ever succeed in drawing that great brute, you will be clever indeed, said Suzanne. If it proves impossible, you must lend him to me for a week, replied Esther, laughing. You would but keep him half a day, replied Madame du Val Noble. The bread I eat is too hard, it breaks my teeth. Never again to my dying day will I try to make an Englishman happy. They are all cold and selfish, pigs on their hind legs. What, no consideration? said Esther with a smile. On the contrary, my dear, the monster has never shown the least familiarity. Under no circumstances, whatever? asked Esther. The wretch always addresses me as madame, and preserves the most perfect coolness imaginable, at moments when every man is more or less amenable. To him, love-making, on my word, it is nothing more nor less than shaving himself. He wipes the razor, puts it back in its case, and looks in the glass as if he were saying, I have not cut myself. Then he treats me with such respect as is enough to send a woman mad. That odious milord Potboiler amuses himself by making poor Theodore hide in my dressing-room and stand there half the day. In short, he tries to annoy me in every way. And as stingy, as miserly as Gobseck and Gigonnet rolled into one, he takes me out to dinner, but he does not pay the cab that brings me home if I happen not to have ordered my carriage to fetch me. Well, said Esther, but what does he pay you for your services? Oh, my dear, positively nothing. Five hundred francs a month, and not a penny more, and the hire of a carriage. But what is it? A machine such as they hire out for a third-rate wedding, to carry an épicier to the mairie, to church, and to the cadran bleu. Oh, he nettles me with his respect. If I try hysterics and feel ill, he is never vexed. He only says, I wish my lady to have her own way, for there is nothing more detestable, no gentleman, than to say to a nice woman, you are a cotton bale, a bundle of merchandise. Ha <laughs> ha! Are you a member of the temperance society and anti-slavery? And my horror sits pale and cold and hard, while he gives me to understand that he has as much respect for me as he might have for a negro and that it has nothing to do with his feelings but with his opinions as an abolitionist a man cannot be a worse wretch said esther but i will smash up that outlandish chinee smash him up replied madame du val noble not if he does not love me you yourself would you like to ask him for two sous he would listen to you solemnly and tell you with british precision that would make a slap in the face seem genial that he pays dear enough for the trifle that love can be to his poor life 
and as before madame du val noble mimicked peyrade's bad french to think that in our line of life we are thrown in the way of such men exclaimed esther oh my dear you have been uncommonly lucky take good care of your nucingen but your nabob must have got some idea in his head that is what adele says look here my dear that man you may depend has laid a bet that he will make a woman hate him and pack him off in a certain time or else he wants to do business with nucingen and took me up knowing that you and i were friends that is what adele thinks answered madame du val noble that is why i introduced him to you this evening oh if only i could be sure what he is at what tricks i could play with you and nucingen and you don't get angry asked esther you don't speak your mind now and then try it you are sharp and smooth well in spite of your sweetness he would kill you with his icy smiles i am anti-slavery he would say and you are free if you said the funniest things he would only look at you and say very good and you would see that he regards you merely as a part of the show and if you turned furious the same thing it would still be a show you might cut him open under the left breast without hurting him in the least his internals are of tinned iron i am sure i told him so he replied i am quite satisfied with that physical constitution and always polite my dear he wears gloves on his soul i shall endure this martyrdom for a few days longer to satisfy my curiosity but for that i should have made philippe slap my lord's cheek and he has not his match as a swordsman there is nothing else left for it i was just going to say so cried esther but you must ascertain first that philippe is a boxer for these old english fellows my dear have a depth of malignity this one has no match on earth no if you could but see him asking my commands to know at what hour he may come to take me by surprise of course and pouring out respectful speeches like a so-called gentleman you would say why he adores her and there is not a woman in the world who would not say the same and they envy us my dear exclaimed esther ah oh, well sighed madame du val noble in the course of our lives we learn more or less how little men value us but my dear i have never been so cruelly so deeply so utterly scorned by brutality as i am by this great skinful of port wine when he is tipsy he goes away not to be unpleasant as he tells adele and not to be under two powers at once wine and woman he takes advantage of my carriage he uses it more than i do oh if only we could see him under the table to-night but he can drink ten bottles and only be fuddled when his eyes are full he still sees clearly like people whose windows are dirty outside said esther but who can see from inside what is going on in the street i know that property in man du has it in the highest degree try to get du and if he and nucingen between them could only catch him in some of their plots i should at least be revenged they would bring him to beggary oh my dear to have fallen into the hands of a hypocritical protestant after that poor fayex who was so amusing so good-natured so full of chaff how we used to laugh they say all stockbrokers are stupid well he for one never lacked wit but once when he left you without a sou that is what made you acquainted with the unpleasant side of pleasure europe brought in by monsieur de nucingen put her viperin head in at the door and after listening to a few words whispered in her ear by her mistress she vanished end of section thirty two
Section thirty three of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter thirteen. At half past eleven that evening, five carriages were stationed in the Rue Saint Georges before the famous courtesan's door. There was Lucien's, who had brought Rastignac, Bichieu, and Blondet du tillet's the baron de nucingen's the nabob's and florine's she was invited by du tillet the closed and doubly shuttered windows were screened by the splendid chinese silk curtains supper was to be served at one wax lights were blazing the dining-room and little drawing-room displayed all their magnificence the party looked forward to such an orgy as only three such women and such men as these could survive they began by playing cards as they had to wait about two hours do you play my lord asked du tillet to peyrade i have played with o'connell pitt fox canning lord brougham lord say at once no end of lords said bichiu lord fitzwilliam lord ellenborough lord hartford lord bichiu was looking at peyrade's shoes and stooped down what are you looking for asked blondet for the spring one must touch to stop this machine said florine do you play for twenty francs a point i will play for as much as you like to lose he does it well said esther to lucien they all take him for an englishman du tillet nucingen peyrade and rastignac sat down to a whist table florine madame du val-noble esther blondet and bichiu sat round the fire chatting lucien spent the time in looking through a book of fine engravings supper is ready paccard presently announced in magnificent livery peyrade was placed at florine's left hand and on the other side of him bichiu whom esther had enjoined to make the englishman drink freely and challenge him to beat him bichiu had the power of drinking an indefinite quantity never in his life had peyrade seen such splendor or tasted of such cookery or seen such fine women i am getting my money's worth this evening for the thousand crowns la val noble has cost me till now thought he and besides i have just won a thousand francs this is an example for men to follow said suzanne who was sitting by lucien with a wave of her hand at the splendors of the dining-room esther had placed lucien next herself and was holding his foot between her own under the table do you hear said madame du val-noble addressing peyrade who affected blindness this is how you ought to furnish a house when a man brings millions home from india and wants to do business with the nucingens he should place himself on the same level i belong to a temperance society then you will drink like a fish said bichiu for the indies are uncommon hot uncle it was bichiu's jest during supper to treat peyrade as an uncle of his returned from india Montame du Fal noble told me you shall have some ideas said nucingen scrutinizing peyrade ah this is what i wanted to hear said du tillet to rastignac the two talking gibberish together you will see they will understand each other at last said bichiu guessing what du tillet had said to rastignac sir baronet i have imagined a speculation oh a very comfortable job beaucoup profitable and rich in profits now you will see said blondet to du tillet he will not talk one minute without dragging in the parliament and the english government it is in china in the opium trade yeah i know said nucingen at once as a man who is well acquainted with commercial geography but the english government have taken up the opium trade as a means that shall open up china and she shall not allow that v nucingen has cut him out with the government remarked du tillet to blondet 
ah you have been in the opium trade cried madame de val noble now i understand why you are so narcotic some has stuck in your soul there you see cried the baron to the self-styled opium merchant and pointing to madame de val noble you are like me never shall a millionaire be able to make a woman love him i have loved much and often milady replied peyrade as a result of temperance said bixiou who had just seen peyrade finish his third bottle of claret and now had a bottle of port wine uncorked oh cried peyrade it is very fine the portugal of england blondet du tillet and bixiou smiled at each other peyrade had the power of travestying everything even his wit there are very few englishmen who will not maintain that gold and silver are better in england than elsewhere the fowls and eggs exported from normandy to the london market enable the english to maintain that the poultry and eggs in london are superior very fine to those of paris which come from the same district esther and lucien were dumbfounded by this perfection of costume language and audacity they all ate and drank so well and so heartily while talking and laughing that it went on till four in the morning bixiou flattered himself that he had achieved one of the victories so pleasantly related by brillat savarin but at the moment when he was saying to himself as he offered his uncle some more wine i have vanquished england peyrade replied in good french to this malicious scoffer toujours mon garçon go it my boy which no one heard but bixiou hello good men all he is as english as i am my uncle is a gascon i could have no other bixiou and peyrade were alone so no one heard this announcement peyrade rolled off his chair on to the floor paccard forthwith picked him up and carried him to an attic where he fell sound asleep at six o'clock next evening the nabob was roused by the application of a wet cloth with which his face was being washed and awoke to find himself on a camp bed face to face with azie wearing a mask and a black domino well papa peyrade you and i have to settle accounts said she where am i asked he looking about him listen to me said asie and that will sober you though you do not love madame du val noble you love your daughter i suppose my daughter peyrade echoed with a roar yes mademoiselle lydie what then what then she is no longer in the rue des moineaux she has been carried off peyrade breathed a sigh like that of a soldier dying of a mortal wound on the battlefield while you were pretending to be an englishman some one else was pretending to be peyrade your little lydie thought she was with her father and she is now in a safe place oh you will never find her unless you undo the mischief you have done what mischief yesterday monsieur lucien de rubempre had the door shut in his face at the duc de grandlieu's this is due to your intrigues and to the man you let loose on us do not speak listen as he went on seeing peyrade open his mouth you will have your daughter again pure and spotless she added emphasizing her statement by the accent on every word only on the day after that on which monsieur lucien de rubempre walks out of saint thomas d'aquin as the husband of mademoiselle clotilde if within ten days lucien de rubempre is not admitted as he has been to the grandlieu's house you to begin with will die a violent death and nothing can save you from the fate that threatens you then when you feel yourself dying you will have time before breathing your last to reflect my daughter is a prostitute 
for the rest of her life though you have been such a fool as to give us this hold for our clutches you still have sense enough to meditate on this ultimatum from our government do not bark say nothing to any one go to contencens and change your dress and then go home cut will tell you that at a word from you your little didi went downstairs and has not been seen since if you make any fuss if you take any steps your daughter will begin where i tell you she will end she is promised to de marsay with old conquewell i need not mince matters i should think or wear gloves eh? go on downstairs and take care not to meddle in our concerns any more as he left peyrade in a pitiable state every word had been a blow with a club the spy had tears in his eyes and tears hanging from his cheeks at the end of a wet furrow they are waiting dinner for mr johnson said europe putting her head in a moment after peyrade made no reply he went down walked till he reached a cab stand and hurried off to undress at contencens not saying a word to him he resumed the costume of pere conquewell and got home by eight o'clock he mounted the stairs with a beating heart when the flemish woman heard her master she asked him well and where is mademoiselle with such simplicity that the old spy was obliged to lean against the wall the blow was more than he could bear he went into his daughter's rooms and ended by fainting with grief when he found them empty and heard Katz's story which was that of an abduction as skilfully planned as if he had arranged it himself well well thought he i must knock under i will be revenged later now i must go to corentin this is the first time we have met our foes corentin will leave that handsome boy free to marry an empress if he wishes yes i understand that my little girl should have fallen in love with him at first sight oh that spanish priest is a knowing one courage friend peyrade disgorge your prey the poor father never dreamed of the fearful blow that awaited him on reaching corentin's house bruno the confidential servant who knew peyrade said monsieur is gone away for a long time for ten days where i don't know good god i am losing my wits i ask him where as if we ever told them thought he a few hours before the moment when peyrade was to be roused in his garret in the rue saint georges corentin coming in from his country place at passy had made his way to the duc de grandlieu's in the costume of a retainer of a superior class he wore the ribbon of the legion of honor at his buttonhole he had made up a withered old face with powdered hair deep wrinkles and a colorless skin his eyes were hidden by tortoise-shell spectacles he looked like a retired office clerk on giving his name as monsieur de saint denis he was led to the duke's private room where he found derville reading a letter which he himself had dictated to one of his agents the number whose business it was to write documents the duke took corentin aside to tell him all that he already knew monsieur de saint denis listened coldly and respectfully amusing himself by studying this grand gentleman by penetrating the tufa beneath the velvet cover by scrutinizing this being now and always absorbed in whist and in regard for the house of grandlieu if you will take my advice monsieur said corentin to derville after being duly introduced to the lawyer we shall set out this very afternoon for angouleme by the bordeaux coach which goes quite as fast as the mail and we shall not need to stay there six hours to obtain the information monsieur le duc requires it will be enough if i have understood your grace to ascertain whether monsieur de rubempre's sister and brother-in-law 
are in a position to give him twelve hundred thousand francs and he turned to the duke you have understood me perfectly said the duke we can be back again in four days corentin went on addressing derville and neither of us will have neglected his business long enough for it to suffer that was the only difficulty i was about to mention to his grace said derville it is now four o'clock i am going home to say a word to my head clerk and pack my travelling bag and after dinner at eight o'clock i will be but shall we get places he said to monsieur de saint denis interrupting himself i will answer for that said corentin be in the yard of the chief office of the messagerie at eight o'clock if there are no places they shall make some for that is the way to serve monseigneur le duc de grandlieu gentlemen said the duke most graciously i postpone my thanks corentin and the lawyer taking this as a dismissal bowed and withdrew at the hour when peyrade was questioning corentin's servant monsieur de saint denis and derville seated in the bordeaux coach were studying each other in silence as they drove out of paris next morning between orleans and tours derville being bored began to converse and corentin condescended to amuse him but keeping his distance he left him to believe that he was in the diplomatic service and was hoping to become consul-general by the good offices of the duc de grandlieu two days after leaving paris corentin and derville got out at Monsle, to the great surprise of the lawyer who thought he was going to angouleme in this little town said corentin we can get the most positive information as regards madame Seychard do you know her then asked derville astonished to find corentin so well informed i made the conductor talk finding he was a native of angouleme he tells me that madame Seychard lives at marsac and marsac is but a league away from Monsle. i thought we should be at greater advantage here than at angouleme for verifying the facts and besides thought derville as monsieur le duc said i act merely as the witness to the inquiries made by this confidential agent the inn at Monsle, la belle étoile had for its landlord one of those fat and burly men whom we fear we may find no more on our return but who still ten years after are seen standing at their door with as much superfluous flesh as ever in the same linen cap the same apron with the same knife the same oiled hair the same triple chin all stereotyped by novel writers from the immortal cervantes to the immortal walter scott are they not all boastful of their cookery have they not all whatever you please to order and do not all end by giving you the same hectic chicken and vegetables cooked with rank butter they all boast of their fine wines and all make you drink the wine of the country but corentin from his earliest youth had known the art of getting out of an innkeeper things more essential to himself than doubtful dishes and apocryphal wines so he gave himself out as a man easy to please and willing to leave himself in the hands of the best cook in Monsle, as he told the fat man there is no difficulty about being the best i am the only one said the host serve us in the side room said corentin winking at derville and do not be afraid of setting the chimney on fire we want to thaw out the frost in our fingers it was not warm in the coach said derville is it far to marsac asked corentin of the innkeeper's wife who came down from the upper regions on hearing that the diligence had dropped two travellers to sleep there are you going to marsac monsieur replied the woman i don't know he said sharply is it far from hence to marsac he repeated after giving the woman time to notice his red ribbon in a chaise a matter of half an hour said the innkeeper's wife 
do you think that monsieur and madame sechard are likely to be there in winter to be sure they live there all the year round it is now five o'clock we shall still find them up at nine. Oh yes till ten they have company every evening the cure monsieur marron the doctor good folks then said derville oh the best of good souls replied the woman straightforward honest and not ambitious neither monsieur sechard though he is very well off they say he might have made millions if he had not allowed himself to be robbed of an invention in the paper-making of which the brothers cointet are getting the benefit ah to be sure the brothers cointet said corentin hold your tongue said the innkeeper what can it matter to these gentlemen whether m sechard has a right or no to a patent for his inventions in paper-making if you mean to spend the night here at the belle étoile he went on addressing the travellers here is the book and please to put your names down we have an officer in this town who has nothing to do and spends all his time in nagging at us the devil said corentin while derville entered their names and his profession as attorney to the lower court in the department of the seine i fancied the sechards were very rich some people say they are millionaires replied the innkeeper but as to hindering tongues from wagging you might as well try to stop the river from flowing old sechard left two hundred thousand francs worth of landed property it is said and that is not amiss for a man who began as a workman well and he may have had as much again in savings for he made ten or twelve thousand francs out of his land at last so supposing he were fool enough not to invest his money for ten years that would be all told but even if he lent it at high interest as he is suspected of doing there would be three hundred thousand francs perhaps and that is all five hundred thousand francs is a long way short of a million i should be quite content with the difference and no more of the belle étoile for me really said corentin then monsieur david sechard and his wife have not a fortune of two or three millions why exclaimed the innkeeper's wife that is what the cointets are supposed to have who robbed him of his invention and he does not get more than twenty thousand francs out of them where do you suppose such honest folks would find millions they were very much pinched while the father was alive but for kolb their manager and madame kolb who is as much attached to them as her husband they could scarcely have lived why how much had they with la verberie a thousand francs a year perhaps corentin drew derville aside and said in vino veritas truth lives under a cork for my part i regard an inn as the real registry office of the countryside the notary is not better informed than the innkeeper as to all that goes on in a small neighbourhood you see we are supposed to know all about the cointets and kolb and the rest your innkeeper is the living record of every incident he does the work of the police without suspecting it a government should maintain two hundred spies at most for in a country like france there are ten millions of simple-minded informers however we need not trust to this report though even in this little town something would be known about the twelve hundred thousand francs sunk in paying for the rubempre estate we will not stop here long i hope not derville put in and this is why added corentin i have hit on the most natural way of extracting the truth from the mouth of the sechard couple i rely upon you to support by your authority as a lawyer the little trick i shall employ to enable you to hear a clear and complete account of their affairs after dinner we shall set out to call on monsieur sechard said corentin to the innkeeper's wife have beds ready for us we want separate rooms there can be no difficulty under the stars oh monsieur said the woman we invented the sign the pun is to be found in every department said corentin it is no monopoly of yours dinner is served gentlemen 
said the innkeeper but where the devil can that young fellow have found the money is the anonymous writer accurate can it be the earnings of some handsome baggage said derville as they sat down to dinner ah that will be the subject of another inquiry said corentin lucien de rubempre as the duc de chaulieu tells me lives with a converted jewess who passes for a dutchwoman and is called esther van bogsek what a strange coincidence said the lawyer i am hunting for the heiress of a dutchman named gobsek it is the same name with a transposition of consonants well said corentin you shall have information as to her parentage on my return to paris end of section thirty three section thirty four of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter fourteen an hour later the two agents for the grandlieu family set out for la verberie where monsieur and madame sechard were living never had lucien felt any emotion so deep as that which overcame him at la verberie when comparing his own fate with that of his brother-in-law the two parisians were about to witness the same scene that had so much struck lucien a few days since everything spoke of peace and abundance at the hour when the two strangers were arriving a party of four persons were being entertained in the drawing-room of la verberie the cure of marsac a young priest of five-and-twenty who at madame sechard's request had become tutor to her little boy lucien the country doctor m marron the mayor of the commune and an old colonel who grew roses on a plot of land opposite to la verberie on the other side of the road every evening during the winter these persons came to play an artless game of boston for centime points to borrow the papers or return those they had finished when m and m sechard had bought la verberie a fine house built of stone and roofed with slate the pleasure grounds consisted of a garden of two acres in the course of time by devoting her savings to the purpose handsome madame sechard had extended her garden as far as a brook by cutting down the vines on some ground she purchased and replacing them with grass plots and clumps of shrubbery at the present time the house surrounded by a park of about twenty acres and enclosed by walls was considered the most imposing place in the neighborhood old sechard's former residence with the outhouses attached was now used as the dwelling-house for the manager of about twenty acres of vineyard left by him of five farmsteads bringing in about six thousand francs a year and ten acres of meadow-land lying on the further side of the stream exactly opposite the little park indeed madame sechard hoped to include them in it the next year la verberie was already spoken of in the neighborhood as a chateau and eve sechard was known as the lady of marsac lucien while flattering her vanity had only followed the example of the peasants and vine-dressers courtois the owner of the mill very picturesquely situated a few hundred yards from the meadows of la verberie was in treaty it was said with madame sechard for the sale of his property and this acquisition would give the finishing touch to the estate and the rank of a place in the department madame sechard who did a great deal of good with as much judgment as generosity was equally esteemed and loved her beauty now really splendid was at the height of its bloom she was about six-and-twenty but had preserved all the freshness of youth from living in the tranquillity and abundance of a country life still much in love with her husband she respected him as a clever man who was modest enough to renounce the display of fame in short to complete her portrait 
it is enough to say that in her whole existence she had never felt a throb of her heart that was not inspired by her husband or her children the tax paid to grief by this happy household was as may be supposed the deep anxiety caused by lucien's career in which eve sechard suspected mysteries which she dreaded all the more because during his last visit lucien roughly cut short all his sister's questions by saying that an ambitious man owed no account of his proceedings to any one but himself in six years lucien had seen his sister but three times and had not written her more than six letters his first visit to la verberie had been on the occasion of his mother's death and his last had been paid with a view to asking the favor of the lie which was so necessary to his advancement this gave rise to a very serious scene between monsieur and madame sechard and their brother and left their happy and respected life troubled by the most terrible suspicions the interior of the house as much altered as the surroundings was comfortable without luxury as will be understood by a glance round the room where the little party were now assembled a pretty aubusson carpet hangings of gray cotton twill bound with green silk brocade the woodwork painted to imitate spa wood carved mahogany furniture covered with gray woolen stuff and green gimp with flower stands gay with flowers in spite of the time of year presented a very pleasing and homelike aspect the window curtains of green brocade the chimney ornaments and the mirror frames were untainted by the bad taste that spoils everything in the provinces and the smallest details all elegant and appropriate gave the mind and eye a sense of repose and of poetry which a clever and loving woman can and ought to infuse into her home madame sechard still in mourning for her father sat by the fire working at some large piece of tapestry with the help of madame kolb the housekeeper to whom she entrusted all the minor cares of the household a chaise has stopped at the door said courtois hearing the sound of wheels outside and to judge by the clatter of metal it belongs to these parts postel and his wife have come to see us no doubt said the doctor no said courtois the chaise has come from Monsle. madame said kolb the burly alsatian we have made acquaintance with in a former volume illusion perdue here is a lawyer from paris who wants to speak with monsieur a lawyer cried sechard the very word gives me the colic thank you said the mayor of marsac named cachan who for twenty years had been an attorney at angouleme and who had once been required to prosecute sechard my poor david will never improve he will always be absent-minded said eve smiling a lawyer from paris said courtois have you any business in paris no said eve but you have a brother there observed courtois take care lest he should have anything to say about old sechard's estate said cachan he had his finger in some very queer concerns worthy man corentin and derville on entering the room after bowing to the company and giving their names begged to have a private interview with monsieur and madame sechard by all means said sechard but is it a matter of business solely a matter regarding your father's property said corentin then i beg you will allow monsieur the mayor a lawyer formerly at angouleme to be present also are you monsieur derville said cachan addressing corentin no monsieur this is monsieur derville replied corentin introducing the lawyer who bowed but said sechard we are so to speak a family party we have no secrets from our neighbors there is no need to retire to my study where there is no fire our life is in the sight of all men but your father's said corentin was involved in certain mysteries which perhaps you would rather not make public is it anything we need blush for 
said eve in alarm oh no a sin of his youth said corentin coldly setting one of his mouse-traps monsieur your father left an elder son oh the rascal cried courtois he was never very fond of you monsieur sechard and he kept that secret from you the deep old dog now i understand what he meant when he used to say to me you shall see what you shall see when i am under the turf do not be dismayed monsieur said corentin to sechard while he watched eve out of the corner of his eye a brother exclaimed the doctor then your inheritance is divided into two derville was affecting to examine the fine engravings proofs before letters which hung on the drawing-room walls do not be dismayed madame corentin went on seeing amazement written on madame sechard's handsome features it is only a natural son the rights of a natural son are not the same as those of a legitimate child this man is in the depths of poverty and he has a right to a certain sum calculated on the amount of the estate the millions left by your father at the word millions there was a perfectly unanimous cry from all the persons present and now derville ceased to study the prince old sechard millions said courtois who on earth told you that some peasant monsieur said cachan you are not attached to the treasury you may be told all the facts be quite easy said corentin i give you my word of honor that i am not employed by the treasury cachan who had just signed to everybody to say nothing gave expression to his satisfaction monsieur corentin went on if the whole estate were but a million a natural child's share would still be something considerable but we have not come to threaten a lawsuit on the contrary our purpose is to propose that you should hand over one hundred thousand francs and we will depart one hundred thousand francs cried cachan interrupting him but monsieur old sechard left twenty acres of vineyard five small farms ten acres of meadowland here and not a sou besides nothing on earth cried david sechard would induce me to tell a lie and less to a question of money than on any other monsieur he said turning to corentin and derville my father left us besides the land courtois and cachan signalled in vain to sechard he went on three hundred thousand francs which raises the whole estate to about five hundred thousand francs monsieur cachan asked eve sechard what proportion does the law allot to a natural child madame said corentin we are not turks we only require you to swear before these gentlemen that you did not inherit more than five hundred thousand francs from your father-in-law and we can come to an understanding first give me your word of honor that you really are a lawyer said cachan to derville here is my passport replied derville handing him a paper folded in four and monsieur is not as you might suppose an inspector from the treasury so be easy he added we had an important reason for wanting to know the truth as to the sechard estate and we now know it derville took madame sechard's hand and led her very courteously to the further end of the room madame said he in a low voice if it were not that the honor and future prospects of the house of grandlieu are implicated in this affair i would never have lent myself to the stratagem devised by this gentleman of the red ribbon but you must forgive him it was necessary to detect the falsehood by means of which your brother has stolen a march on the beliefs of that ancient family beware now of allowing it to be supposed that you have given your brother twelve hundred thousand francs to repurchase the rubempre estates twelve hundred thousand francs cried madame sechard turning pale where did he get them wretched boy ah that is the question replied derville 
i fear that the source of his wealth is far from pure the tears rose to eve's eyes as her neighbors could see we have perhaps done you a great service by saving you from abetting a falsehood of which the results may be positively dangerous the lawyer went on derville left madame sechard sitting pale and dejected with tears on her cheeks and bowed to the company to mansle said corentin to the little boy who drove the chaise there was but one vacant place in the diligence from bordeaux to paris derville begged corentin to allow him to take it urging a press of business but in his soul he was distrustful of his travelling companion whose diplomatic dexterity and coolness struck him as being the result of practice corentin remained three days longer at mansle unable to get away he was obliged to secure a place in the paris coach by writing to bordeaux and did not get back till nine days after leaving home peyrade meanwhile had called every morning either at passy or in paris to inquire whether corentin had returned on the eighth day he left at each house a note written in their peculiar cipher to explain to his friend what death hung over him and to tell him of lydie's abduction and the horrible end to which his enemies had devoted them peyrade bereft of corentin but seconded by contenson still kept up his disguise as a nabob even though his invisible foes had discovered him he very wisely reflected that he might glean some light on the matter by remaining on the field of the contest contenson had brought all his experience into play in his search for lydie and hoped to discover in what house she was hidden but as the days went by the impossibility absolutely demonstrated of tracing the slightest clue added hour by hour to peyrade's despair the old spy had a sort of guard about him of twelve or fifteen of the most experienced detectives they watched the neighborhood of the rue des moineaux and the rue taitbout where he lived as a nabob with madame du val noble during the last three days of the term granted by asie to reinstate lucien on his old footing in the hotel de grandlieu contenson never left the veteran of the old general police office and the poetic terror shed throughout the forests of america by the arts of inimical and warring tribes of which cooper made such good use in his novels was here associated with the petty details of paris life the foot passengers the shops the hackney cabs a figure standing at a window everything had to the human ciphers to whom old peyrade had entrusted his safety the thrilling interest which attaches in cooper's romances to a beaver village a rock a bison robe a floating canoe a weed straggling over the water if the spaniard has gone away you have nothing to fear said contenson to peyrade remarking on the perfect peace they lived in but if he is not gone observed peyrade he took one of my men at the back of the chaise but at blois my man having to get down could not catch the chaise up again end of section thirty four Section thirty five of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter fifteen. Five days after Derville's return, Lucien one morning had a call from Rastignac. I am in despair, my dear boy, said his visitor at finding myself compelled to deliver a message which is entrusted to me because we are known to be intimate your marriage is broken off beyond all hope of reconciliation never set foot again in the hotel de grandlieu to marry clotilde you must wait till her father dies and he is too selfish to die yet a while old whist players sit at table the card table very late 
Clotilde is setting out for Italy with Madeleine de Lenoncourt Chaulieu. The poor girl is so madly in love with you, my dear fellow, that they have to keep an eye on her. She was bent on coming to see you, and had plotted an escape. That may comfort you in misfortune. Lucien made no reply. He sat gazing at Rastignac. And is it a misfortune after all? his friend went on you will easily find a girl as well born and better looking than clotilde madame de serizy will find you a wife out of spite she cannot endure the grandlieus who never would have anything to say to her she has a niece little clemence du rouvre my dear boy said lucien at length since that supper i am not on terms with madame de serizy she saw me in esther's box and made a scene and i left her to herself a woman of forty does not long keep up a quarrel with so handsome a man as you are said rastignac i know something of these sunsets it lasts ten minutes in the sky and ten years in a woman's heart i have waited a week to hear from her go and call yes i must now are you coming at any rate to the val nobles her nabob is returning the supper given by nucingen i am asked and i shall go said lucien gravely the day after this confirmation of his disaster which carlos heard of at once from asie lucien went to the rue Tebou with rastignac and nucingen at midnight nearly all the personages of this drama were assembled in the dining-room that had formerly been esther's a drama of which the interest lay hidden under the very bed of these tumultuous lives and was known only to esther to lucien to peyrade to contenson the mulatto and to Pecard, who attended his mistress asie without its being known to contenson and peyrade had been asked by madame du val noble to come and help her cook as they sat down to table peyrade who had given madame du val noble five hundred francs that the thing might be well done found under his napkin a scrap of paper on which these words were written in pencil the ten days are up at the moment when you sit down to supper Peyrade handed the paper to Contenson, who was standing behind him, saying in English, Did you put my name here? Contenson read by the light of the wax candles this many tekle of Harson, and slipped the scrap into his pocket, but he knew how difficult it is to verify a handwriting in pencil, and above all a sentence written in Roman capitals that is to say with mathematical lines since capital letters are wholly made up of straight lines and curves in which it is impossible to detect any trick of the hand as in what is called running hand the supper was absolutely devoid of spirit peyrade was visibly absent-minded of the men about town who give life to a supper only rastignac and lucien were present lucien was gloomy and absorbed in thought rastignac who had lost two thousand francs before supper ate and drank with the hope of recovering them later the three women stricken by this chill looked at each other dullness deprived the dishes of all relish suppers like plays and books have their good and bad luck at the end of the meal ices were served of the kind called plombière as everybody knows this kind of dessert has delicate preserved fruits laid on top of the ice which is served in a little glass not heaped above the rim these ices had been ordered by madame du val noble of tortoni whose shop is at the corner of the rue Tebou and the boulevard the cook called contenson out of the room to pay the bill contenson who thought this demand on the part of the shop boy rather strange went downstairs and startled him by saying then you have not come from tortoni's and then went straight upstairs again paccard had meanwhile handed the ices to the company in his absence 
the mulatto had hardly reached the door when one of the police constables who had kept watch in the rue des moineaux called up the stairs number twenty seven what's up replied contenson flying down again tell papa that his daughter has come home but good god in what a state tell him to come at once she is dying at the moment when contenson re-entered the dining-room old peyrade who had drunk a great deal was swallowing the cherry off his ice they were drinking to the health of madame du val noble the nabob filled his glass with constantia and emptied it in spite of his distress at the news he had to give peyrade contenson was struck by the eager attention with which paccard was looking at the nabob his eyes sparkled like two fixed flames although it seemed important still this could not delay the mulatto who leaned over his master just as peyrade set his glass down lydie is at home said contenson in a very bad state peyrade rattled out the most french of all french oaths with such a strong southern accent that all the guests looked up in amazement peyrade discovering his blunder acknowledged his disguise by saying to contenson in good french find me a coach i'm off everyone rose why who are you said lucien ya yeah, who said the baron bichu told me you shammed englishmen better than he could and i would not believe him said rastignac some bankrupt caught in disguise said du tillet loudly i suspected as much a strange place is paris said madame du val noble after being bankrupt in his own part of town a merchant shows up as a nabob or a dandy in the champs elysees with impunity oh i am unlucky bankrupts are my bane every flower has its peculiar blight said esther quietly mine is like cleopatra's an asp who am i echoed peyrade from the door you will know ere long for if i die i will rise from my grave to clutch your feet every night he looked at esther and lucien as he spoke then he took advantage of the general dismay to vanish with the utmost rapidity meaning to run home without waiting for the coach in the street the spy was gripped by the arm as he crossed the threshold of the outer gate it was asie wrapped in a black hood such as ladies then wore on leaving a ball send for the sacraments papa peyrade said she in the voice that had already prophesied ill a coach was waiting asie jumped in and the carriage vanished as though the wind had swept it away there were five carriages waiting peyrade's men could find out nothing on reaching his house in the rue des vignes one of the quietest and prettiest nooks of the little town of passy corentin who was known there as a retired merchant passionately devoted to gardening found his friend peyrade's note in cipher instead of resting he got into the hackney coach that had brought him thither and was driven to the rue des moineaux where he found only cat from her he heard of lydie's disappearance and remained astounded at peyrade's and his own want of foresight but they do not know me yet said he to himself this crew is capable of anything i must find out if they are killing peyrade for if so i must not be seen any more the viler a man's life is the more he clings to it it becomes at every moment a protest and a revenge corentin went back to the cab and drove to his rooms to assume the disguise of a feeble old man in a scanty greenish overcoat and a tow wig then he returned on foot prompted by his friendship for peyrade he intended to give instructions to his most devoted and cleverest underlings as he went along the rue saint honore to reach the rue saint roch from the place vendome he came up behind a girl in slippers and dressed as a woman dresses for the night she had on a white bed-jacket and a nightcap 
and from time to time gave vent to a sob and an involuntary groan corentin outpaced her and turning round recognized lydie i am a friend of your father's of monsieur Conquel's, said he in his natural voice ah then here is some one i can trust said she do not seem to have recognized me corentin went on for we are pursued by relentless foes and are obliged to disguise ourselves but tell me what has befallen you oh monsieur said the poor child the facts but not the story can be told i am ruined lost and i do not know how where have you come from i don't know monsieur i fled with such precipitancy i have come through so many streets round so many turnings fancying i was being followed and when i met any one that seemed decent i asked my way to get back to the boulevards so as to find the rue de la paix and at last after walking what o'clock is it monsieur half past eleven said corentin i escaped at nightfall said lydie i have been walking for five hours well come along you can rest now you will find your good cut oh monsieur there is no rest for me i only want to rest in the grave and i will go and wait for death in a convent if i am worthy to be admitted poor little girl but you struggled oh yes oh if you could only imagine the abject creatures they placed me with they sent you to sleep no doubt ah that is it cried poor lydie a little more strengthened i should be at home i feel that i am dropping and my brain is not quite clear just now i fancied i was in a garden corentin took lydie in his arms and she lost consciousness he carried her upstairs cat he called cat came out with exclamations of joy don't be in too great a hurry to be glad said corentin gravely the girl is very ill when lydie was laid on her bed and recognized her own room by the light of two candles that cat lighted she became delirious she sang scraps of pretty airs broken by vociferations of horrible sentences she had heard her pretty face was mottled with purple patches she mixed up the reminiscences of her pure childhood with those of these ten days of infamy cat sat weeping corentin paced the room stopping now and again to gaze at lydie she is paying her father's debt said he is there a providence above oh i was wise not to have a family on my word of honor a child is indeed a hostage given to misfortune as some philosopher has said oh cried the poor child sitting up in bed and throwing back her fine long hair instead of lying here cat i ought to be stretched in the sand at the bottom of the seine cat instead of crying and looking at your child which will never cure her you ought to go for a doctor the medical officer in the first instance and then monsieur desplein and monsieur bianchon we must save this innocent creature and corentin wrote down the addresses of these two famous physicians at this moment up the stairs came some one to whom they were familiar and the door was opened peyrade in a violent sweat his face purple his eyes almost blood-stained and gasping like a dolphin rushed from the outer door to lydie's room exclaiming where is my child he saw a melancholy sign from corentin and his eyes followed his friend's hand lydie's condition can only be compared to that of a flower tenderly cherished by a gardener now fallen from its stem and crushed by the iron-clamped shoes of some peasant ascribe this simile to a father's heart and you will understand the blow that fell on peyrade the tears started to his eyes you are crying it is my father said the girl she could still recognize her father she got out of bed and fell on her knees at the old man's side as he sank into a chair forgive me papa 
said she in a tone that pierced peyrade's heart and at the same moment he was conscious of what felt like a tremendous blow on his head i am dying the villains were his last words corentin tried to help his friend and received his latest breath dead poisoned said he to himself ah here is the doctor he exclaimed hearing the sound of wheels contenson who came with his mulatto disguise removed stood like a bronze statue as he heard lydie say then you do not forgive me father but it was not my fault she did not understand that her father was dead oh how he stares at me cried the poor crazy girl we must close his eyes said contenson lifting peyrade on to the bed we are doing a stupid thing said corentin let us carry him into his own room his daughter is half demented and she will go quite mad when she sees that he is dead she will fancy that she has killed him lydie seeing them carry away her father looked quite stupefied there lies my only friend said corentin seeming much moved when peyrade was laid out on the bed in his own room in all his life he never had but one impulse of cupidity and that was for his daughter let him be an example to you contenson every line of life has its code of honor peyrade did wrong when he mixed himself up with private concerns we have no business to meddle with any but public cases but come what may i swear said he with a voice an emphasis a look that struck horror into contenson to avenge my poor peyrade i will discover the men who are guilty of his death and of his daughter's ruin and as sure as i am myself as i have yet a few days to live which i will risk to accomplish that vengeance every man of them shall die at four o'clock in good health by a clean shave on the place de greve and i will help you said contenson with feeling nothing in fact is more heart-stirring than the spectacle of passion in a cold self-contained and methodical man in whom for twenty years no one has ever detected the smallest impulse of sentiment it is like a molten bar of iron which melts everything it touches and contenson was moved to his depths poor old conquel said he looking at corentin he has treated me many a time and i tell you only your bad sort know how to do such things but often has he given me ten francs to go and gamble with after this funeral oration peyrade's two avengers went back to lydie's room hearing cat and the medical officer from the mairie on the stairs go and fetch the chief of police said corentin the public prosecutor will not find grounds for a prosecution in the case still we will report it to the prefecture it may perhaps be of some use monsieur he went on to the medical officer in this room you will see a dead man i do not believe that he died from natural causes you will be good enough to make a post-mortem in the presence of the chief of the police who will come at my request try to discover some traces of poison you will in a few minutes have the opinion of monsieur desplein and monsieur bianchon for whom i have sent to examine the daughter of my best friend she is in a worse plight than he though he is dead i have no need of those gentlemen's assistance in the exercise of my duty said the medical officer well well thought corentin let us have no clashing monsieur he said in a few words i give you my opinion those who have just murdered the father have also ruined the daughter by daylight lydie had yielded to fatigue when the great surgeon and the young physician arrived she was asleep the doctor whose duty it was to sign the death certificate had now opened peyrade's body and was seeking the cause of death while waiting for your patient to awake said corentin to the two famous doctors 
would you join one of your professional brethren in an examination which cannot fail to interest you and your opinion will be valuable in case of an inquiry your relation died of apoplexy said the official there are all the symptoms of violent congestion of the brain examine him gentlemen and see if there is no poison capable of producing similar symptoms the stomach is in fact full of food substances but short of chemical analysis i find no evidence of poison if the characters of cerebral congestion are well ascertained we have here considering the patient's age a sufficient cause of death observed desplein looking at the enormous mass of material did he sup here asked bianchon no said corentin he came here in great haste from the boulevard and found his daughter ruined that was the poison if he loved his daughter said bianchon what known poison could produce a similar effect asked corentin clinging to his idea there is but one said desplein after a careful examination it is a poison found in the malayan archipelago and derived from trees as yet but little known of the strychnos family it is used to poison that dangerous weapon the malay chris at least so it is reported the police commissioner presently arrived corentin told him his suspicions and begged him to draw up a report telling him where and with whom peyrade had supped and the causes of the state in which he found lydie corentin then went to lydie's rooms desplein and bianchon had been examining the poor child he met them at the door well gentlemen asked corentin place the girl under medical care unless she recovers her wits when her child is born if indeed she should have a child she will end her days melancholy mad there is no hope of a cure but in the maternal instinct if it can be aroused corentin paid each of the physicians forty francs in gold and then turned to the police commissioner who had pulled him by the sleeve the medical officer insists on it that death was natural said this functionary and i can hardly report the case especially as the dead man was old conquel he had his finger in too many pies and we should not be sure whom we might run foul of men like that die to order very often and my name is corentin said corentin in the man's ear the commissioner started with surprise so just make a note of all this corentin went on it will be very useful by and by send it up only as confidential information the crime cannot be proved and i know that any inquiry would be checked at the very outset but i will catch the criminals some day yet i will watch them and take them red-handed the police official bowed to corentin and left monsieur said cat mademoiselle does nothing but dance and sing what can i do has any change occurred then she has understood that her father is just dead put her into a hackney coach and simply take her to charenton i will write a note to the commissioner-general of police to secure her being suitably provided for the daughter in charenton the father in a pauper's grave said corentin contenson go and fetch the parish hearse and now don carlos herrera you and i will fight it out carlos said contenson he is in spain he is in paris said corentin positively there is a touch of spanish genius of the philip the second type in all this but i have pitfalls for everybody even for kings end of section 35section 36 of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary 
what love costs an old man chapter sixteen five days after the nabob's disappearance madame du val noble was sitting by esther's bedside weeping for she felt herself on one of the slopes down to poverty if i only had at least a hundred louis a year with that sum my dear a woman can retire to some little town and find a husband i can get you as much as that said esther how cried madame du val noble oh in a very simple way listen you must plan to kill yourself play your part well send for asie and offer her ten thousand francs for two black beads of very thin glass containing a poison which kills you in a second bring them to me and i will give you fifty thousand francs for them why do you not ask her for them yourself said her friend as he would not sell them to me they are not for yourself asked madame du val noble perhaps you who live in the midst of pleasure and luxury in a house of your own and on the eve of an entertainment which will be the talk of paris for ten years which is to cost nucingen twenty thousand francs there are to be strawberries in mid-february they say asparagus grapes melons and a thousand crowns worth of flowers in the rooms what are you talking about there are a thousand crowns worth of roses on the stairs alone and your gown is said to have cost ten thousand francs yes it is of brussels point and delphine his wife is furious but i had a fancy to be disguised as a bride where are the ten thousand francs asked madame du val noble it is all the ready money i have said esther smiling open my table drawer it is under the curl papers people who talk of dying never kill themselves said madame du val noble if it were to commit a crime for shame said esther finishing her friend's thought as she hesitated be quite easy i have no intention of killing anybody i had a friend a very happy woman she is dead i must follow her that is all how foolish how can i help it i promised her i would i should let that bill go dishonoured said her friend smiling do as i tell you and go at once i hear a carriage coming it is nucingen a man who will go mad with joy yes he loves me why do we not love those who love us for indeed they do all they can to please us ah that is the question said madame du val noble it is the old story of the herring which is the most puzzling fish that swims why well no one could ever find out get along my dear i must ask for your fifty thousand francs good-bye then for three days past esther's ways with the baron de nucingen had completely changed the monkey had become a cat the cat had become a woman esther poured out treasures of affection on the old man she was quite charming her way of addressing him with a total absence of mischief or bitterness and all sorts of tender insinuation had carried conviction to the banker's slow wit she called him fritz and he believed that she loved him my poor fritz i have tried you sorely said she i have teased you shamefully your patience has been sublime you loved me i see and i will reward you i like you now i do not know how it is but i should prefer you to a young man it is the result of experience perhaps in the long run we discover at last that pleasure is the coin of the soul and it is not more flattering to be loved for the sake of pleasure than it is to be loved for the sake of money besides young men are too selfish they think more of themselves than of us while you now think only of me i am all your life to you and i will take nothing more from you i want to prove to you how disinterested i am fie i have given you nothing cried the baron enchanted i propose to give you to-morrow thirty thousand francs a year in a government bond that is my wedding gift esther kissed the baron so sweetly that he turned pale without any pills oh 
cried she do not suppose that i am sweet to you only for your thirty thousand francs it is because now i love you my good fat frederic ach mein gott why have you kept me waiting i might have been so happy all these three months in three or in five per cents my pet said esther passing her fingers through nucingen's hair and arranging it in a fashion of her own in trees i had a quantity so next morning the baron brought the certificate of shares he came to breakfast with his dear little girl and to take her orders for the following evening the famous saturday the great day here my little wife my only wife said the banker gleefully his face radiant with happiness here is enough money to pay for your keep for the rest of your days esther took the paper without the slightest excitement folded it up and put it in her dressing-table drawer so now you are quite happy you monster of iniquity said she giving nucingen a little slap on the cheek now that i have at last accepted a present from you i can no longer tell you home truths for i share the fruit of what you call your labors this is not a gift my poor old boy it is restitution come do not put on your bourse face you know that i love you my lovely esther mine angel of love said the banker do not speak to me like that i tell you i should not care when all the world took me for a thief if you should think me an honest man i love you every day more and more that is my intention said esther and i will never again say anything to distress you my pet elephant for you are grown as artless as a baby bless me you old rascal you have never known any innocence the allowance bestowed on you when you came into the world was bound to come to the top some day but it was buried so deep that it is only now reappearing at the age of sixty-six fished up by love's barbed hook this phenomenon is seen in old men and this is why i have learned to love you you are young so young no one but i would ever have known this frederic i alone for you were a banker at fifteen even at college you must have lent your schoolfellows one marble on condition of their returning two seeing him laugh she sprang on to his knee well you must do as you please bless me plunder the men go ahead and i will help men are not worth loving napoleon killed them off like flies whether they pay taxes to you or to the government what difference does it make to them you don't make love over the budget and on my honor go ahead i have thought it over and you are right shear the sheep you will find it in the gospel according to Béranger. now kiss your esther i say you will give that poor val noble all the furniture in the rue Taitbout? and to-morrow i wish you would give her fifty thousand francs it would look handsome my duck you see you killed Fayex. people are beginning to cry out upon you and this liberality will look babylonian all the women will talk about it oh there will be no one in paris so grand so noble as you and as the world is constituted Fayex will be forgotten so after all it will be money deposited at interest you are right my angel you know the world he replied you shall be mine adviser well you see said esther how i study my man's interest his position and honor go at once and bring those fifty thousand francs she wanted to get rid of monsieur de nucingen so as to get a stockbroker to sell the bond that very afternoon but why this minute asked he bless me my sweetheart you must give it to her in a little satin box wrapped round a fan you must say here madame is a fan which i hope may be to your taste you are supposed to be a turcaré and you will become a beaujon charming charming cried the baron i shall be so clever henceforth yes i shall repeat your words just as esther had sat down tired with the effort of playing her part europe came in madame said she 
here is a messenger sent from the quai malaquais by celestin monsieur lucien's servant bring him in no i will go into the ante-room he has a letter for you madame from celestin esther rushed into the ante-room looked at the messenger and saw that he looked like the genuine thing tell him to come down said esther in a feeble voice and dropping into a chair after reading the letter lucien means to kill himself she added in a whisper to europe no take the letter up to him carlos herrera still in his disguise as a bagman came downstairs at once and keenly scrutinized the messenger on seeing a stranger in the ante-room you said there was no one here said he in a whisper to europe and with an excess of prudence after looking at the messenger he went straight into the drawing-room trompe la mort did not know that for some time past the famous constable of the detective force who had arrested him at the maison vauquer had a rival who it was supposed would replace him this rival was the messenger they are right said the sham messenger to contenson who was waiting for him in the street the man you describe is in the house but he is not a spaniard and i will burn my hand off if there is not a bird for our net under that priest's gown he is no more a priest than he is a spaniard said contenson i am sure of that said the detective oh if only we were right said contenson lucien had been away for two days and advantage had been taken of his absence to lay this snare but he returned this evening and the courtesan's anxieties were allayed next morning at the hour when esther having taken a bath was getting into bed again madame du val noble arrived i have the two pills said her friend let me see said esther raising herself with her pretty elbow buried in a pillow trimmed with lace madame du val noble held out to her what looked like two black currants the baron had given esther a pair of greyhounds of famous pedigree which will always be known by the name of the great contemporary poet who made them fashionable and esther proud of owning them had called them by the names of their parents romeo and juliet no need here to describe the whiteness and grace of these beasts trained for the drawing-room with manners suggestive of english propriety esther called romeo romeo ran up on legs so supple and thin so strong and sinewy that they seemed like steel springs and looked up at his mistress esther to attract his attention pretended to throw one of the pills he is doomed by his nature to die thus said she as she threw the pill which romeo crushed between his teeth the dog made no sound he rolled over and was stark dead it was all over while esther spoke these words of epitaph good god shrieked madame du val noble you have a cab waiting carry away the departed romeo said esther his death would make a commotion here i have given him to you and you have lost him advertise for him make haste you will have your fifty thousand francs this evening she spoke so calmly so entirely with the cold indifference of a courtesan that madame du val noble exclaimed you are the queen of us all come early and look very well at five o'clock esther dressed herself as a bride she put on her lace dress over white satin she had a white sash white satin shoes and a scarf of english point lace over her beautiful shoulders in her hair she placed white camellia flowers the simple ornament of an innocent girl on her bosom lay a pearl necklace worth thirty thousand francs a gift from nucingen though she was dressed by six she refused to see anybody even the banker europe knew that lucien was to be admitted to her room lucien came at about seven and europe managed to get him up to her mistress 
without anybody knowing of his arrival lucien as he looked at her said to himself why not go and live with her at rue bompre far from the world and never see paris again i have an earnest of five years of her life and the dear creature is one of those who never belie themselves where can i find such another perfect masterpiece my dear you whom i have made my god said esther kneeling down on a cushion in front of lucien give me your blessing lucien tried to raise her and kiss her saying what is this jest my dear love and he would have put his arm round her but she freed herself with a gesture as much of respect as of horror i am no longer worthy of you lucien said she letting the tears rise to her eyes i implore you give me your blessing and swear to me that you will found two beds at the hotel dieu for as to prayers in church god will never forgive me unless i pray myself i have loved you too well my dear tell me that i made you happy and that you will sometimes think of me tell me that lucien saw that esther was solemnly in earnest and he sat thinking you mean to kill yourself said he at last in a tone of voice that revealed deep reflection no said she but to-day my dear the woman dies the pure chaste and loving woman who once was yours and i am very much afraid that i shall die of grief poor child said lucien wait i have worked hard these two days i have succeeded in seeing clotilde always clotilde cried esther in a tone of concentrated rage yes said he we have written to each other on tuesday morning she is to set out for italy but i shall meet her on the road for an interview at fontainebleau bless me what is it that you men want for wives wooden laths cried poor esther if i had seven or eight millions would you not marry me come now child i was going to say that if all is over for me i will have no wife but you esther bent her head to hide her sudden pallor and the tears she wiped away you love me said she looking at lucien with the deepest melancholy well that is my sufficient blessing do not compromise yourself go away by the side door and come into the drawing-room through the anteroom kiss me on the forehead she threw her arms round lucien clasped him to her heart with frenzy and said again go only go or i must live when the doomed woman appeared in the drawing-room there was a cry of admiration esther's eyes expressed infinitude in which the soul sank as it looked into them her blue-black and beautiful hair set off the camellias in short this exquisite creature achieved all the effects she had intended she had no rival she looked like the supreme expression of that unbridled luxury which surrounded her in every form then she was brilliantly witty she ruled the orgy with the cold calm power that habeneck displays when conducting at the conservatoire at those concerts where the first musicians in europe rise to the sublime in interpreting mozart and beethoven but she observed with terror that nucingen ate little drank nothing and was quite the master of the house by midnight everybody was crazy the glasses were broken that they might never be used again two of the chinese curtains were torn bichiu was drunk for the second time in his life no one could keep his feet the women were asleep on the sofas and the guests were incapable of carrying out the practical joke they had planned of escorting esther and nussing into the bedroom standing in two lines with candles in their hands and singing Bonacera from the barber of seville nucingen simply gave esther his hand bichiu who saw them though tipsy was still able to say like rivarol on the occasion of the duc de richelieu's last marriage the police must be warned there is mischief brewing here the jester thought he was jesting 
he was a prophet. End of section 36、section、37 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter 17. Monsieur de Nucingen did not go home till Monday at about noon. But at one o'clock his broker informed him that Mademoiselle Esther van Bogseck had sold the bond bearing thirty thousand francs interest on Friday last and had just received the money. But, Monsieur le Baron, Derville's head clerk called on me just as I was settling this transfer, and after seeing Mademoiselle Esther's real names, he told me she had come into a fortune of seven millions. Pooh! Yes, she is the only heir to the old bill discounter Gobseck. Derville will verify the facts. If your mistress's mother was the handsome Dutch woman, la belle Hollandaise, as they called her, she comes in for. I know dat she is, cried the banker. She told me all her life. I shall write ein Wort to Derville. The baron sat down at his desk, wrote a line to Derville, and sent it by one of his servants. Then, after going to the bourse, he went back to Esther's house at about three o'clock. Madame forbade our waking her on any pretense whatever. She is in bed, asleep. Ach, der Teufel, said the baron. But, Europe, she shall not be angry to be told that she is very, very rich. She shall inherit seven millions. Old Gobseck is dead, and your missus is his sole heir, for her mother was Gobseck's own niece, and besides, he shall have left a will. I could never have thought that a millionaire like that man should have left Esther in misery. Aha! Then your reign is over, old Pantaloon, said Europe, looking at the baron with an effrontery worthy of one of Moliere's waiting maids. Shoo, you old Alsatian crow, she loves you as we love the plague. Heavens above us, millions. Why, she may marry her lover. Won't she be glad? And Prudence Servien left the baron simply thunder stricken. To be the first to announce to her mistress this great stroke of luck. The old man, intoxicated with superhuman enjoyment and believing himself happy, had just received a cold shower bath on his passion at the moment when it had risen to the intensest white heat. She was deceiving me, cried he with tears in his eyes. Yes, she was cheating me. Oh, Esther, my life! As a fool I have been, can such flowers ever bloom for the old men? I can buy all that I will, except only youth. Ach Gott, ach Gott, what shall I do? What shall become of me? She is right, that cruel Europe. Esther, if she is rich, shall not be for me. Shall I go hank myself? What is life made out the divine flame of joy that I have known? My God, my God! The old man snatched off the false hair he had combed in with his gray hairs these three months past. A piercing shriek from Europe made Nussing and Quail to his very bowels. The poor banker rose and walked upstairs on legs that were drunk with the bowl of disenchantment he had just swallowed to the dregs, for nothing is more intoxicating than the wine of disaster. At the door of her room he could see Esther, stiff on her bed, blue with poison, dead. He went up to the bed and dropped on his knees. You are right. She told me so. She is dead of me. Pecar, Azie, everyone hurried in. It was a spectacle, a shock, but not despair. Everyone had their doubts. The baron was a banker again. A suspicion crossed his mind, and he was so imprudent as to ask what had become of the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs, the price of the bond. Pecar, Azie, and Europe looked at each other so strangely 
that monsieur de nucingen left the house at once believing that robbery and murder had been committed europe detecting a packet of soft consistency betraying the contents to be banknotes under her mistress's pillow proceeded at once to lay her out as she said go and tell monsieur asie oh to die before she knew that she had seven millions gobseck was poor madame's uncle said she europe's stratagem was understood by paccard as soon as asie's back was turned europe opened the packet on which the hapless courtesan had written to be delivered to monsieur lucien de rubempre seven hundred and fifty thousand franc notes shone in the eyes of prudence servien who exclaimed won't we be happy and honest for the rest of our lives paccard made no objection his instincts as a thief were stronger than his attachment to trompe la mort Doru is dead he said at length my shoulder is still a proof before letters let us be off together divide the money so as not to have all our eggs in one basket and then get married but where can we hide said prudence in paris replied paccard prudence and paccard went off at once with the promptitude of two honest folks transformed into robbers my child said carlos to asie as soon as she had said three words find some letter of esther's while i write a formal will and then take the copy and the letter to girard but he must be quick the will must be under esther's pillow before the lawyers affix the seals here and he wrote out the following will never having loved any one on earth but monsieur lucien chardon de rubempre and being resolved to end my life rather than relapse into vice and the life of infamy from which he rescued me i give and bequeath to the said lucien chardon de rubempre all i may possess at the time of my decease on condition of his founding a mass in perpetuity in the parish church of saint roch for the repose of her who gave him her all to her last thought esther gobseck that is quite in her style thought trompe la mort by seven in the evening this document written and sealed was placed by asie under esther's bolster jacques said she flying upstairs again just as i came out of the room justice marched in the justice of the peace you mean no my son the justice of the peace was there but he had gendarmes with him the public prosecutor and the examining judge are there too and the doors are guarded this death has made a stir very quickly remarked jacques collin ay and paccard and europe have vanished i am afraid they may have scared away the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs said asie the low villains said collin they have done for us by their swindling game human justice and paris justice that is to say the most suspicious keenest cleverest and omniscient type of justice too clever indeed for it insists on interpreting the law at every turn was at last on the point of laying its hands on the agents of this horrible intrigue the baron of nucingen on recognizing the evidence of poison and failing to find his seven hundred and fifty thousand francs imagined that one of two persons whom he greatly disliked either paccard or europe was guilty of the crime in his first impulse of rage he flew to the prefecture of police this was a stroke of a bell that called up all corentin's men the officials of the prefecture the legal profession the chief of the police the justice of the peace the examining judge all were astir by nine in the evening three medical men were called in to perform an autopsy on poor esther and inquiries were set on foot trompe la mort warned by asie exclaimed no one knows that i am here i may take an airing he pulled himself up by the skylight of his garret and with marvellous agility was standing in an instant on the roof whence he surveyed the surroundings with the coolness of a tiler 
good said he discerning a garden five houses off in the rue de provence that will just do for me you are paid out trompe la mort said contenson suddenly emerging from behind a stack of chimneys you may explain to monsieur camusot what mass you were performing on the roof monsieur l'abbé and above all why you were escaping i have enemies in spain said carlos herrera we can go there by way of your attic said contenson the sham spaniard pretended to yield but having set his back and feet across the opening of the skylight he gripped contenson and flung him off with such violence that the spy fell in the gutter of the rue saint georges contenson was dead on his field of honor jacques collin quietly dropped into the room again and went to bed give me something that will make me very sick without killing me said he to asie for i must be at death's door to avoid answering inquisitive persons i have just got rid of a man in the most natural way who might have unmasked me at seven o'clock on the previous evening lucien had set out in his own chaise to post to fontainebleau with a passport he had procured in the morning he slept in the nearest inn on the nemours side at six in the morning he went alone and on foot through the forest as far as bouron this said he to himself as he sat down on one of the rocks that command the fine landscape of bouron is the fatal spot where napoleon dreamed of making a final tremendous effort on the eve of his abdication at daybreak he heard the approach of post-horses and saw a britzka drive past in which sat the servants of the duchesse de lenancourt Joliot and clotilde de grandlieu's maid here they are thought lucien now to play the farce well and i shall be saved the duc de grandlieu's son-in-law in spite of him it was an hour later when he heard the peculiar sound made by a superior travelling carriage as the berline came near in which two ladies were sitting they had given orders that the drag should be put on for the hill down to bouron and the manservant behind the carriage had it stopped at this instant lucien came forward clotilde said he tapping on the window no said the young duchess to her friend he shall not get into the carriage and we will not be alone with him my dear speak to him for the last time to that i consent but on the road where we will walk on and where baptiste can escort us the morning is fine we are well wrapped up and have no fear of the cold the carriage can follow the two women got out baptiste said the duchess the postboy can follow slowly we want to walk a little way you must keep near us madeleine de Morsauf took clotilde by the arm and allowed lucien to talk they thus walked as far as the village of gray it was now eight o'clock and there clotilde dismissed lucien well my friend said she closing this long interview with much dignity i shall never marry any one but you i would rather believe in you than in other men in my father and mother no woman ever gave greater proof of attachment surely now try to counteract the fatal prejudices which militate against you just then the tramp of galloping horses was heard and to the great amazement of the ladies a force of gendarmes surrounded the little party what do you want said lucien with the arrogance of a dandy are you monsieur lucien de rubempre asked the public prosecutor of fontainebleau yes monsieur you will spend to-night in la force said he i have a warrant for the detention of your person who are these ladies asked the sergeant to be sure excuse me ladies your passports for monsieur lucien as i am instructed had acquaintances among the fair sex who for him would do you take the duchesse de lenancourt chaulieu for a prostitute said madeleine with a magnificent flash at the public prosecutor you are handsome enough to excuse the error the magistrate very cleverly retorted 
baptiste produced the passports said the young duchess with a smile and with what crime is monsieur de rubempre charged asked clotilde whom the duchess wished to see safe in the carriage of being accessory to a robbery and murder replied the sergeant of gendarmes baptiste lifted mademoiselle de grandlieu into the chaise in a dead faint by midnight lucien was entering la force a prison situated between the rue payenne and the rue des ballets where he was placed in solitary confinement the abbe carlos herrera was also there having been arrested that evening End of section 37. Section 38 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 1. At six o'clock next morning, two vehicles with postilions, prison vans, called in the vigorous language of the populace, panier à salade, came out of La Force to drive to the Conciergerie by the Palais de Justice. Few loafers in Paris can have failed to meet this prison cell on wheels. Still, though most stories are written for Parisian readers, strangers will no doubt be satisfied to have a description of this formidable machine who knows a police of russia germany or austria the legal body of countries to whom the salad basket is an unknown machine may profit by it and in several foreign countries there can be no doubt that an imitation of this vehicle would be a boon to prisoners this ignominious conveyance yellow-bodied on high wheels and lined with sheet iron is divided into two compartments in front is a box seat with leather cushions and an apron this is the free seat of the van and accommodates a sheriff's officer and a gendarme a strong iron trellis reaching to the top separates this sort of cab front from the back division in which there are two wooden seats placed sideways as in an omnibus on which the prisoners sit they get in by a step behind and a door with no window the nickname of salad basket arose from the fact that the vehicle was originally made entirely of lattice and the prisoners were shaken in it just as a salad is shaken to dry it for further security in case of accident a mounted gendarme follows the machine especially when it conveys criminals condemned to death to the place of execution thus escape is impossible the vehicle lined with sheet iron is impervious to any tool the prisoners carefully searched when they are arrested or locked up can have nothing but watch springs perhaps to file through bars and useless on a smooth surface so the panier à salade improved by the genius of the paris police became the model for the prison omnibus known in london as black maria in which convicts are transported to the hulks instead of the horrible tumbrel which formerly disgraced civilization though manon lescaut had made it famous the accused are in the first instance dispatched in the prison van from the various prisons in paris to the palais de justice to be questioned by the examining judge this in prison slang is going up for examination then the accused are again conveyed from prison to the court to be sentenced when their case is only a misdemeanor or if in legal parlance the case is one for the upper court they are transferred from the house of detention to the conciergerie the new gate of the department of the seine finally the prison van carries the criminal condemned to death from bicetre to the barriere saint jacques where executions are carried out and have been ever since the revolution of july thanks to philanthropic interference the poor wretches no longer have to face the horrors of the drive from the conciergerie to the place de greve in a cart exactly like that used by wood merchants this cart is no longer used but to bring the body back from the scaffold without this explanation the words of a famous convict to his accomplice it is now the horse's business as he got into the van would be unintelligible 
it is impossible to be carried to execution more comfortably than in paris nowadays at this moment the two vans setting out at such an early hour were employed on the unwonted service of conveying two accused prisoners from the jail of la force to the conciergerie and each man had a salad basket to himself nine-tenths of my readers ay and nine-tenths of the remaining tenth are certainly ignorant of the vast difference of meaning in the words incriminated suspected accused and committed for trial jail house of detention and penitentiary and they may be surprised to learn here that it involves all our criminal procedure of which a clear and brief outline will presently be sketched as much for their information as for the elucidation of this history however when it is said that the first van contained jacques collin and the second lucien who in a few hours had fallen from the summit of social splendor to the depths of a prison cell curiosity will for the moment be satisfied the conduct of the two accomplices was characteristic lucien de rubempre shrank back to avoid the gaze of the passers-by who looked at the grated window of the gloomy and fateful vehicle on its road along the rue saint antoine and the rue du martois to reach the quay and the arch of saint jean the way at that time across the place de l'hôtel de ville this archway now forms the entrance gate to the residence of the prefet de la seine in the huge municipal palace the daring convict on the contrary stuck his face against the barred grating between the officer and the gendarme who sure of their van were chatting together the great days of july eighteen thirty and the tremendous storm that then burst have so completely wiped out the memory of all previous events and politics so entirely absorbed the french during the last six months of that year that no one remembers or a few scarcely remember the various private judicial and financial catastrophes strange as they were which forming the annual flood of parisian curiosity were not lacking during the first six months of the year it is therefore needful to mention how paris was for the moment excited by the news of the arrest of a spanish priest discovered in a courtesan's house and that of the elegant lucien de rubempre who had been engaged to mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu taken on the high road to italy close to the little village of gray both were charged as being concerned in a murder of which the profits were stated at seven millions of francs and for some days the scandal of this trial preponderated over the absorbing importance of the last elections held under charles the tenth in the first place the charge had been based on an application by the baron de nucingen then lucien's apprehension just as he was about to be appointed private secretary to the prime minister made a stir in the very highest circles of society in every drawing-room in paris more than one young man could recollect having envied lucien when he was honored by the notice of the beautiful duchesse de montfrigneuse and every woman knew that he was the favored attache of madame de serizy the wife of one of the government bigwigs and finally his handsome person gave him a singular notoriety in the various worlds that make up paris the world of fashion the financial world the world of courtesans the young men's world the literary world so for two days past all paris had been talking of these two arrests the examining judge in whose hands the case was put regarded it as a chance for promotion and to proceed with the utmost rapidity he had given orders that both the accused should be transferred from la force to the conciergerie as soon as lucien de rubempre could be brought from fontainebleau as the abbe carlos had spent but twelve hours in la force and lucien only half a night it is useless to describe that prison which has since been entirely remodelled and as to the details of their consignment it would be only a repetition of the same story at the conciergerie but before setting forth the terrible drama of a criminal inquiry 
it is indispensable as i have said that an account should be given of the ordinary proceedings in a case of this kind to begin with its various phases will be better understood at home and abroad and besides those who are ignorant of the action of the criminal law as conceived of by the lawgivers under napoleon will appreciate it better this is all the more important as at this moment this great and noble institution is in danger of destruction by the system known as penitentiary a crime is committed if it is flagrant the persons incriminated inculpé are taken to the nearest lock-up and placed in the cell known to the vulgar as the violon perhaps because they make a noise there shrieking or crying from thence the suspected persons inculpé are taken before the police commissioner or magistrate who holds a preliminary inquiry and can dismiss the case if there is any mistake finally they are conveyed to the depot of the prefecture where the police detains them pending the convenience of the public prosecutor and the examining judge they being served with due notice more or less quickly according to the gravity of the case come and examine the prisoners who are still provisionally detained having due regard to the presumptive evidence the examining judge then issues a warrant for their imprisonment and sends the suspected persons to be confined in a jail there are three such jails maison d'arrêt in paris sainte pelagie la force and les madelonnettes observe the word inculpé incriminated or suspected of crime the french code has created three essential degrees of criminality inculpé first degree of suspicion prévenu under examination accusé fully committed for trial so long as the warrant for committal remains unsigned the supposed criminal is regarded as merely under suspicion inculpé of the crime or felony when the warrant has been issued he becomes the accused prévenu and is regarded as such so long as the inquiry is proceeding when the inquiry is closed and as soon as the court has decided that the accused is to be committed for trial he becomes the prisoner at the bar accusé as soon as the superior court at the instance of the public prosecutor has pronounced that the charge is so far proved as to be carried to the assizes thus persons suspected of crime go through three different stages three siftings before coming up for trial before the judges of the upper court the high justice of the realm at the first stage innocent persons have abundant means of exculpating themselves the public the town watch the police at the second state they appear before a magistrate face to face with the witnesses and are judged by a tribunal in paris or by the collective court of the departments at the third stage they are brought before a bench of twelve councillors and in case of any error or informality the prisoner committed for trial at the assizes may appeal for protection to the supreme court the jury do not know what a slap in the face they give to popular authority to administrative and judicial functionaries when they acquit a prisoner and so in my opinion it is hardly possible that an innocent man should ever find himself at the bar of an assize court in paris i say nothing of other seats of justice the detenu is the convict french criminal law recognizes imprisonment of three degrees corresponding in legal distinction to these three degrees of suspicion inquiry and conviction mere imprisonment is a light penalty for misdemeanor but detention is imprisonment with hard labor a severe and sometimes degrading punishment hence those persons who nowadays are in favor of the penitentiary system would upset an admirable scheme of criminal law in which the penalties are judiciously graduated and they will end by punishing the lightest peccadilloes as severely as the greatest crimes the reader may compare in the scenes of political life for instance in une tenebreuse affaire 
the curious differences subsisting between the criminal law of brumaire in the year four and that of the code napoleon which has taken its place in most trials as in this one the suspected persons are at once examined and from inculpé become prévenu justice immediately issues a warrant for their arrest and imprisonment in point of fact in most of such cases the criminals have either fled or have been instantly apprehended indeed as we have seen the police which is but an instrument and the officers of justice had descended on esther's house with the swiftness of a thunderbolt even if there had not been the reasons for revenge suggested to the superior police by corentin there was a robbery to be investigated of seven hundred and fifty thousand francs from the baron de nucingen end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the end of evil ways chapter two just as the first prison van conveying jacques collin reached the archway of saint jean a narrow dark passage some block ahead compelled the postilion to stop under the vault the prisoner's eyes shone like carbuncles through the grating in spite of his aspect as of a dying man which the day before had led the governor of la force to believe that the doctor must be called in these flaming eyes free to rove at this moment for neither the officer nor the gendarme looked round at their customer spoke so plain a language that a clever examining judge m popinot for instance would have identified the man convicted for sacrilege in fact ever since the salad basket had turned out of the gate of la force jacques collin had studied everything on his way notwithstanding the pace they had made he took in the houses with an eager and comprehensive glance from the ground floor to the attics he saw and noted every passer-by god himself is not more clear-seeing as to the means and ends of his creatures than this man in observing the slightest differences in the medley of things and people armed with hope as the last of the horatii was armed with his sword he expected help to anybody but this machiavelli of the hulks this hope would have seemed so absolutely impossible to realize that he would have gone on mechanically as all guilty men do not one of them ever dreams of resistance when he finds himself in the position to which justice and the paris police bring suspected persons especially those who like collin and lucien are in solitary confinement it is impossible to conceive of the sudden isolation in which a suspected criminal is placed the gendarmes who apprehend him the commissioner who questions him those who take him to prison the warders who lead him to his cell which is actually called a cachot a dungeon or hiding-place those again who take him by the arms to put him into a prison van every being that comes near him from the moment of his arrest is either speechless or takes note of all he says to be repeated to the police or to the judge this total severance so simply affected between the prisoner and the world gives rise to a complete overthrow of his faculties and a terrible prostration of mind especially when the man has not been familiarized by his antecedents with the processes of justice the duel between the judge and the criminal is all the more appalling because justice has on its side the dumbness of blank walls and the incorruptible coldness of its agents but jacques collin or carlos herrera it will be necessary to speak of him by one or the other of these names according to the circumstances of the case had long been familiar with the methods of the police of the jail and of justice this colossus of cunning and corruption had employed all his powers of mind and all the resources of mimicry to affect the surprise and anility of an innocent man while giving the lawyers the spectacle of his sufferings 
as has been told asie that skilled locusta had given him a dose of poison so qualified as to produce the effects of a dreadful illness thus m camusot the police commissioner and the public prosecutor had been baffled in their proceedings and inquiries by the effects apparently of an apoplectic attack he has taken poison cried m camusot horrified by the sufferings of the self-styled priest when he had been carried down from the attic writhing in convulsions four constables had with great difficulty brought the abbe carlos downstairs to esther's room where the lawyers and the gendarmes were assembled that was the best thing he could do if he should be guilty replied the public prosecutor do you believe that he is ill the police commissioner asked the police is always incredulous the three lawyers had spoken as may be imagined in a whisper but jacques collin had guessed from their faces the subject under discussion and had taken advantage of it to make the first brief examination which is gone through on arrest absolutely impossible and useless he had stammered out sentences in which spanish and french were so mingled as to make nonsense at la force this farce had been all the more successful in the first instance because the head of the safety force an abbreviation of the title head of the brigade of the guardians of public safety bibi lupin who had long since taken jacques collin into custody at madame vauquer's boarding-house had been sent on special business into the country and his deputy was a man who hoped to succeed him but to whom the convict was unknown bibi lupin himself formerly a convict and a comrade of jacques collin's on the hulks was his personal enemy this hostility had its rise in quarrels in which jacques collin had always got the upper hand and in the supremacy over his fellow prisoners which trompe la mort had always assumed and then for ten years now jacques collin had been the ruling providence of released convicts in paris their head their adviser and their banker and consequently bibi lupin's antagonist thus though placed in solitary confinement he trusted to the intelligent and unreserved devotion of asie his right hand and perhaps too to paccard his left hand who as he flattered himself might return to his allegiance when once that thrifty subaltern had safely bestowed the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs that he had stolen this was the reason why his attention had been so superhumanly alert all along the road and strange to say his hopes were about to be amply fulfilled the two solid side walls of the archway were covered to a height of six feet with a permanent dado of mud formed of the splashes from the gutter for in those days the foot passenger had no protection from the constant traffic of vehicles and from what was called the kicking of the carts but curbstones placed upright at intervals and much ground away by the knaves of the wheels more than once a heavy truck had crushed a heedless foot passenger under that archway such indeed paris remained in many districts and till long after this circumstance may give some idea of the narrowness of the saint jean gate and the ease with which it could be blocked if a cab should be coming through from the place de greve while a costermonger woman was pushing her little truck of apples in from the rue de martois a third vehicle of any kind produced difficulties the foot passengers fled in alarm seeking a cornerstone to protect them from the old-fashioned axles which had attained such prominence that a law was passed at last to reduce their length when the prison van came in this passage was blocked by a market woman with a costermonger's vegetable cart one of a type which is all the more strange because specimens still exist in paris in spite of the increasing number of greengrocers shops she was so thoroughly a street hawker that a sergent de ville if that particular class of police had been then in existence would have allowed her to ply her trade without inspecting her permit 
in spite of a sinister countenance that reeked of crime her head wrapped in a cheap and ragged checked cotton kerchief was horrid with rebellious locks of hair like the bristles of a wild boar her red and wrinkled neck was disgusting and her little shawl failed entirely to conceal a chest tanned brown by the sun dust and mud her gown was patchwork her shoes gaped as though they were grinning at a face as full of holes as the gown and what an apron a plaster would have been less filthy this moving and fetid rag must have stunk in the nostrils of dainty folks ten yards away those hands had gleaned a hundred harvest fields either the woman had returned from a german witch's sabbath or she had come out of a mendicity asylum but what eyes what audacious intelligence what repressed vitality when the magnetic flash of her look and of jacques collin's met to exchange a thought get out of the way you old vermin trap cried the postilion in harsh tones mind you don't crush me you hangman's apprentice she retorted your cartful is not worth as much as mine and by trying to squeeze in between two cornerstones to make way the hawker managed to block the passage long enough to achieve her purpose oh asie said jacques collin to himself at once recognizing his accomplice then all is well the postboy was still exchanging amenities with asie and vehicles were collecting in the rue du martois look out there pecaré fermati suni la vedrem shrieked old asie with the red indian intonations peculiar to these female costermongers who disfigure their words in such a way that they are transformed into a sort of onomatopoeia incomprehensible to any but parisians in the confusion in the alley and among the outcries of all the waiting drivers no one paid any heed to this wild yell which might have been the woman's usual cry but this gibberish intelligible to jacques collin sent to his ear in a mongrel language of their own a mixture of bad italian and provencal this important news your poor boy is nabbed i am here to keep an eye on you we shall meet again in the midst of his joy at having thus triumphed over the police for he hoped to be able to keep up communications jacques collin had a blow which might have killed any other man lucien in custody said he to himself he almost fainted this news was to him more terrible than the rejection of his appeal could have been if he had been condemned to death now that both the prison vans are rolling along the quay the interest of this story requires that i should add a few words about the conciergerie while they are making their way thither the conciergerie a historical name a terrible name a still more terrible thing is inseparable from the revolutions of france and especially those of paris it has known most of our great criminals but if it is the most interesting of the buildings of paris it is also the least known least known to persons of the upper classes still in spite of the interest of this historical digression it should be as short as the journey of the prison vans what parisian what foreigner or what provincial can have failed to observe the gloomy and mysterious features of the quai des lunettes a structure of black walls flanked by three round towers with conical roofs two of them almost touching each other this quay beginning at the pont du change ends at the pont neuf a square tower the clock tower or tour de l'horloge whence the signal was given for the massacre of saint bartholomew a tower almost as tall as that of saint jacques de la boucherie shows where the palais de justice stands and forms the corner of the quay these four towers and these walls are shrouded in the black winding sheet which in paris falls on every facade to the north about halfway along the quay at a gloomy archway 
we see the beginning of the private houses which were built in consequence of the construction of the pont neuf in the reign of henry the fourth the place royale was a replica of the place dauphine the style of architecture is the same of brick with binding courses of hewn stone this archway and the rue de Harlay are the limit line of the palais de justice on the west formerly the prefecture de police once the residence of the presidents of parlement was a dependency of the palace the court of exchequer and court of subsidies completed the supreme court of justice the sovereign's court it will be seen that before the revolution the palace enjoyed that isolation which now again is aimed at this block this island of residences and official buildings in their midst the sainte chapelle that priceless jewel of saint louis chaplet is the sanctuary of paris its holy place its sacred ark for one thing this island was at first the whole of the city for the plot now forming the place dauphine was a meadow attached to the royal domain where stood a stamping mill for coining money hence the name of rue de la monnaie the street heading to the pont neuf hence too the name of one of the round towers the middle one called the tour d'argent which would seem to show that money was originally coined there the famous mill to be seen marked in old maps of paris may very likely be more recent than the time when money was coined in the palace itself and was erected no doubt for the practice of improved methods in the art of coining the first tower hardly detached from the tour d'argent is the tour de montgomery the third and smallest but the best preserved of the three for it still has its battlements is the tour bonbec the sainte chapelle and its four towers counting the clock tower as one clearly define the precincts or as a surveyor would say the perimeter of the palace as it was from the time of the merovingians till the accession of the first race of valois but to us as a result of certain alterations this palace is more especially representative of the period of saint louis charles v was the first to give the palace up to the parlement then a new institution and went to reside in the famous hotel saint paul under the protection of the bastille the palais de tournelle was subsequently erected backing on to the hotel saint paul thus under the later valois the kings came back from the bastille to the louvre which had been their first stronghold the original residence of the french kings the palace of saint louis which has preserved the designation of le palais to indicate the palace of palaces is entirely buried under the palais de justice it forms the cellars for it was built like the cathedral in the seine and with such care that the highest floods in the river scarcely cover the lowest steps the quai de l'horloge covers twenty feet below the surface its foundations of a thousand years old carriages run on the level of the capitals of the solid columns under these towers and formerly their appearance must have harmonized with the elegance of the palace and have had a picturesque effect over the water since to this day those towers vie in height with the loftiest buildings in paris as we look down on this vast capital from the lantern of the Pantheon, the palace with the sainte chapelle is still the most monumental of many monumental buildings the home of our kings over which you tread as you pace the immense hall known as the salle des pas perdus was a miracle of architecture and it is so still to the intelligent eye of the poet who happens to study it when inspecting the conciergerie alas for the conciergerie has invaded the home of kings one's heart bleeds to see the way in which cells cupboards corridors warders rooms and halls devoid of light or air have been hewn out of that beautiful structure in which byzantine gothic and romanesque the three phases of ancient art were harmonized in one building by the architecture of the twelfth century this palace is a monumental history of france in the earliest times just as blois is that of a later period as at blois you may admire in a single courtyard the chateau of the counts of blois that of louis the twelfth 
that of francis i that of gaston so at the conciergerie you will find within the same precincts the stamp of the early races and in the sainte chapelle the architecture of saint louis municipal council to you i speak if you bestow millions get a poet or two to assist your architects if you wish to save the cradle of paris the cradle of kings while endeavouring to endow paris and the supreme court with a palace worthy of france it is a matter for study for some years before beginning the work another new prison or two like that of la roquette and the palace of saint louis will be safe in these days many grievances afflict this vast mass of buildings buried under the palais de justice and the quay like some antediluvian creature in the soil of montmartre but the worst affliction is that it is the conciergerie this epigram is intelligible in the early days of the monarchy noble criminals for the villeins a word signifying the peasantry in french and english alike and the citizens came under the jurisdiction of the municipality or of their liege lord the lords of the greater or the lesser fiefs were brought before the king and guarded in the conciergerie and as these noble criminals were few the conciergerie was large enough for the king's prisoners it is difficult now to be quite certain of the exact site of the original conciergerie however the kitchens built by saint louis still exist forming what is now called the mouse trap and it is probable that the original conciergerie was situated in the place where till eighteen twenty five the conciergerie prisons of the parlement were still in use under the archway to the right of the wide outside steps leading to the supreme court from thence until eighteen twenty five condemned criminals were taken to execution from that gate came forth all the great criminals all the victims of political feeling the marechal d'ancre and the queen of france semblance and malzerbe damiens and danton desrues and castin fouquier tinville's private room like that of the public prosecutor now was so placed that he could see the procession of carts containing the persons whom the revolutionary tribunal had sentenced to death thus this man who had become a sword could give a last glance at each batch after eighteen twenty five when m de peyronnet was minister a great change was made in the palais the old entrance to the conciergerie where the ceremonies of registering the criminal and of the last toilet were performed was closed and removed to where it now is between the tour de l'horloge and the tour de montgomery in an inner court entered through an arched passage to the left is the mouse trap to the right the prison gates the salad baskets can drive into this irregularly shaped courtyard can stand there and turn with ease and in case of a riot find some protection behind the strong grating of the gate under the arch whereas they formerly had no room to move in the narrow space dividing the outside steps from the right wing of the palace in our day the conciergerie hardly large enough for the prisoners committed for trial room being needed for about three hundred men and women no longer receives either suspected or remanded criminals excepting in rare cases as for instance in these of jacques collin and lucien all who are imprisoned there are committed for trial before the bench as an exception criminals of the higher ranks are allowed to sojourn there since being already disgraced by a sentence in open court their punishment would be too severe if they served their term of imprisonment at melun or at poissy ouvroir preferred to be imprisoned at the conciergerie rather than at sainte pelagie at this moment of writing le on the notary and the prince de berg are serving their time there by an exercise of leniency which though arbitrary is humane as a rule suspected criminals whether they are to be subjected to a preliminary examination to go up in the slang of the courts or to appear before the magistrate of the lower court are transferred in prison vans direct to the mouse traps the mouse traps opposite the gate 
consist of a certain number of old cells constructed in the old kitchens of st louis building whither prisoners not yet fully committed are brought to await the hour when the court sits or the arrival of the examining judge the most traps end on the north at the quay on the east at the headquarters of the municipal guard on the west at the courtyard of the conciergerie and on the south they adjoin a large vaulted hall formerly no doubt the banqueting-room but at present disused above the mouse-traps is an inner guard-room with a window commanding the court of the conciergerie this is used by the gendarmerie of the department and the stairs lead up to it when the hour of trial strikes the sheriffs call the roll of the prisoners the gendarmes go down one for each prisoner and each gendarme takes a criminal by the arm and thus in couples they mount the stairs cross the guard-room and are led along the passages to a room contiguous to the hall where sits the famous sixth chamber of the law whose functions are those of an english county court the same road is trodden by the prisoners committed for trial on their way to and from the conciergerie and the assize court in the salle des pas perdus between the door into the first court of the inferior class and the steps leading to the sixth the visitor must observe the first time he goes there a doorway without a door or any architectural adornment a square hole of the meanest type through this the judges and barristers find their way into the passages into the guard-house down into the prison cells and to the entrance to the conciergerie the private chambers of all the examining judges are on different floors in this part of the building they are reached by squalid staircases a maze in which those to whom the place is unfamiliar inevitably lose themselves the windows of some look out on the quay others on the yard of the conciergerie in 1830 a few of these rooms commanded the rue de la barillerie thus when a prison van turns to the left in this yard it has brought prisoners to be examined to the mousetrap when it turns to the right it conveys prisoners committed for trial to the conciergerie now it was to the right that the vehicle turned which conveyed jacques collin to set him down at the prison gate nothing can be more sinister prisoners and visitors see two barred gates of wrought iron with a space between them of about six feet these are never both opened at once and through them everything is so cautiously scrutinized that persons who have a visiting ticket pass the permit through the bars before the key grinds in the lock the examining judges or even the supreme judges are not admitted without being identified imagine then the chances of communications or escape the governor of the conciergerie would smile with an expression on his lips that would freeze the mere suggestion in the most daring of romancers who defy probability in all the annals of the conciergerie no escape has been known but that of la valette but the certain fact of august connivance now amply proven if it does not detract from the wife's devotion certainly diminished the risk of failure the most ardent lover of the marvellous judging on the spot of the nature of the difficulties must admit that at all times the obstacles must have been as they still are insurmountable no words can do justice to the strength of the walls and vaulting they must be seen though the pavement of the yard is on a lower level than that of the quay in crossing this barbican you go down several steps to enter an immense vaulted hall with solid walls graced with magnificent columns this hall abuts on the tour de montgomery which is now part of the governor's residence and on the tour d'argent serving as a dormitory for the warders or porters or turnkeys as you may prefer to call them the number of the officials is less than might be supposed there are but twenty their sleeping quarters like their beds are in no respect different from those of the pistols or private cells the name pistol originated no doubt in the fact that the prisoners formerly paid a pistol about ten francs a week for this accommodation 
its bareness resembling that of the empty garrets in which great men in poverty begin their career in paris to the left in the vast entrance hall sits the governor of the conciergerie in a sort of office constructed of glass panes where he and his clerk keep the prison registers here the prisoners for examination or committed for trial have their names entered with a full description and are then searched the question of their lodging is also settled this depending on the prisoner's means opposite the entrance to this hall there is a glass door this opens into a parlor where the prisoner's relations and his counsel may speak with him across a double grating of wood the parlor window opens on to the prison yard the inner court where prisoners committed for trial take air and exercise at certain fixed hours this huge hall only lighted by the doubtful daylight that comes in through the gates for the single window to the front court is screened by the glass office built out in front of it has an atmosphere and a gloom that strike the eye in perfect harmony with the pictures that force themselves on the imagination its aspect is all the more sinister because parallel with the tour d'argent and de montgomery you discover those mysterious vaulted and overwhelming crypts which lead to the cells occupied by the queen and madame elizabeth and to those known as the secret cells this maze of masonry after being of old the scene of royal festivities is now the basement of the palais de justice between eighteen twenty five and eighteen thirty two the operation of the last toilet was performed in this enormous hall between a large stove which heats it and the inner gate it is impossible even now to tread without a shudder on the paved floor that has received the shock and the confidences of so many last glances end of section thirty nine Section 40 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 3. The apparently dying victim on this occasion could not get out of the horrible vehicle without the assistance of two gendarmes, who took him under the arms to support him and led him half unconscious into the office thus dragged along the dying man raised his eyes to heaven in such a way as to suggest a resemblance to the saviour taken down from the cross and certainly in no picture does jesus present a more cadaverous or tortured countenance than this of the sham spaniard he looked ready to breathe his last sigh as soon as he was seated in the office he repeated in a weak voice the speech he had made to everybody since he was arrested i appeal to his excellency the spanish ambassador you can say that to the examining judge replied the governor oh lord said jacques collin with a sigh but cannot i have a breviary shall i never be allowed to see a doctor i have not two hours to live as carlos herrera was to be placed in close confinement in the secret cells it was needless to ask him whether he claimed the benefits of the pistol as above described that is to say the right of having one of the rooms where the prisoner enjoys such comfort as the law permits these rooms are on the other side of the prison yard of which mention will presently be made the sheriff and the clerk calmly carried out the formalities of the consignment to prison monsieur said jacques collin to the governor in broken french i am as you see a dying man pray if you can tell that examining judge as soon as possible that i crave as a favor what a criminal must most dread namely to be brought before him as soon as he arrives for my sufferings are really unbearable and as soon as i see him the mistake will be cleared up as a universal rule every criminal talks of a mistake go to the hulks and question the convicts they are almost all victims of a miscarriage of justice 
so this speech raises a faint smile in all who come into contact with the suspected accused or condemned criminal i will mention your request to the examining judge replied the governor and i shall bless you monsieur replied the false abbe raising his eyes to heaven as soon as his name was entered on the calendar carlos herrera supported under each arm by a man of the municipal guard and followed by a turnkey instructed by the governor as to the number of the cell in which the prisoner was to be placed was led through the subterranean maze of the conciergerie into a perfectly wholesome room whatever certain philanthropists may say to the contrary but cut off from all possible communication with the outer world as soon as he was removed the warders the governor and his clerk looked at each other as though asking each other's opinion and suspicion was legible on every face but at the appearance of the second man in custody the spectators relapsed into their usual doubting frame of mind concealed under the air of indifference only in very extraordinary cases do the functionaries of the conciergerie feel any curiosity the prisoners are no more to them than a barber's customers are to him hence all the formalities which appall the imagination are carried out with less fuss than a money transaction at a banker's and often with greater civility lucien's expression was that of a dejected criminal he submitted to everything and obeyed like a machine all the way from fontainebleau the poet had been facing his ruin and telling himself that the hour of expiation had told pale and exhausted knowing nothing of what had happened at esther's house during his absence he only knew that he was the intimate ally of an escaped convict a situation which enabled him to guess at disaster worse than death when his mind could command a thought it was that of suicide he must at any cost escape the ignominy that loomed before him like the phantasm of a dreadful dream jacques collin as the more dangerous of the two culprits was placed in a cell of solid masonry deriving its light from one of the narrow yards of which there are several in the interior of the palace in the wing where the public prosecutor's chambers are this little yard is the airing ground for the female prisoners lucien was taken to the same part of the building to a cell adjoining the rooms let to misdemeanants for by orders from the examining judge the governor treated him with some consideration persons who have never had anything to do with the action of the law usually have the darkest notions as to the meaning of solitary or secret confinement ideas as to the treatment of criminals have not yet become disentangled from the old pictures of torture chambers of the unhealthiness of a prison the chill of stone walls sweating tears the coarseness of the jailers and of the food inevitable accessories of the drama but it is not unnecessary to explain here that these exaggerations exist only on the stage and only make lawyers and judges smile as well as those who visit prisons out of curiosity or who come to study them for a long time no doubt they were terrible in the days of the old parlement of louis the thirteenth and louis the fourteenth the accused were no doubt flung pell-mell into a low room underneath the old gateway the prisons were among the crimes of seventeen eighty nine and it is enough only to see the cells where the queen and madame elizabeth were incarcerated to conceive a horror of old judicial proceedings in our day though philanthropy has brought incalculable mischief on society it has produced some good for the individual it is to napoleon that we owe our criminal code and this even more than the civil code which still urgently needs reform on some points will remain one of the greatest monuments of his short reign this new view of criminal law put an end to a perfect abyss of misery 
indeed it may be said that apart from the terrible moral torture which men of the better classes must suffer when they find themselves in the power of the law the action of that power is simple and mild to a degree that would hardly be expected suspected or accused criminals are certainly not lodged as if they were at home but every necessary is supplied to them in the prisons of paris besides the burden of feelings that weighs on them deprives the details of daily life of their customary value it is never the body that suffers the mind is in such a phase of violence that every form of discomfort or of brutal treatment if such there were would be easily endured in such a frame of mind and it must be admitted that an innocent man is quickly released especially in paris so lucien on entering his cell saw an exact reproduction of the first room he had occupied in paris at the hotel cluny a bed to compare with those in the worst furnished apartments of the quartier latin straw chairs with the bottoms out a table and a few utensils compose the furniture of such a room in which two accused prisoners are not unfrequently placed together when they are quiet in their ways and their misdeeds are not crimes of violence but such as forgery or bankruptcy this resemblance between his starting point in the days of his innocency and his goal the lowest depths of degradation and sham was so direct an appeal to his last chord of poetic feeling that the unhappy fellow melted into tears for four hours he wept as rigid in appearance as a figure of stone but enduring the subversion of all his hopes the crushing of all his social vanity and the utter overthrow of his pride smarting in each separate i that exists in an ambitious man a lover a success a dandy a parisian a poet a libertine and a favorite everything in him was broken by this fall as of icarus carlos herrera on the other hand as soon as he was locked into his cell and found himself alone began pacing it to and fro like the polar bear in his cage he carefully examined the door and assured himself that with the exception of the peephole there was not a crack in it he sounded all the walls he looked up the funnel down which a dim light came and he said to himself i am safe enough he sat down in a corner where the eye of a prying warder at the grating of the peephole could not see him then he took off his wig and hastily ungummed a piece of paper that did duty as lining the side of the paper next his head was so greasy that it looked like the very texture of the wig if it had occurred to bibi lupin to snatch off the wig to establish the identity of the spaniard with jacques collin he would never have thought twice about the paper it looked so exactly like part of the wig-maker's work the other side was still fairly white and clean enough to have a few lines written on it the delicate and tiresome task of unsticking it had been begun in la force two hours would not have been long enough it had taken him half of the day before the prisoner began by tearing this precious scrap of paper so as to have a strip four or five lines wide which he divided into several bits he then replaced his store of paper in the same strange hiding-place after damping the gummed side so as to make it stick again he felt in a lock of his hair for one of those pencil leads as thin as a stout pin then recently invented by Seuss and which he had put in with some gum he broke off a scrap long enough to write with and small enough to hide in his ear having made these preparations with the rapidity and certainty of hand peculiar to old convicts who are as light-fingered as monkeys jacques collin sat down on the edge of his bed to meditate on his instructions to asie in perfect confidence that he should come across her so entirely did he rely on the woman's genius during the preliminary examination he reflected 
i pretended to be a spaniard and spoke broken french appealed to my ambassador and alleged diplomatic privilege not understanding anything i was asked the whole performance varied by fainting pauses sighs in short all the vagaries of a dying man i must stick to that my papers are all regular asie and i can eat up monsieur camusot he is no great shakes now i must think of lucien he must be made to pull himself together i must get at the boy at whatever cost and show him some plan of conduct otherwise he will give himself up give me up lose all he must be taught his lesson before he is examined and besides i must find some witnesses to swear to my being a priest such was the position moral and physical of these two prisoners whose fate at the moment depended on monsieur camusot examining judge to the inferior court of the seine and sovereign master during the time granted to him by the code of the smallest details of their existence since he alone could grant leave for them to be visited by the chaplains the doctor or any one else in the world no human authority neither the king nor the keeper of the seals nor the prime minister can encroach on the power of an examining judge nothing can stop him no one can control him he is a monarch subject only to his conscience and the law at the present time when philosophers philanthropists and politicians are constantly endeavoring to reduce every social power the rights conferred on the examining judges have become the object of attacks that are all the more serious because they are almost justified by those rights which it must be owned are enormous and yet as every man of sense will own that power ought to remain unimpaired in certain cases its exercise can be mitigated by a strong infusion of caution but society is already threatened by the ineptitude and weakness of the jury which is in fact the really supreme bench and which ought to be composed only of choice and elected men and it would be in danger of ruin if this pillar were broken which now upholds our criminal procedure arrest on suspicion is one of the terrible but necessary powers of which the risk to society is counterbalanced by its immense importance and besides distrust of the magistracy in general is a beginning of social disillusion destroy that institution and reconstruct it on another basis insist as was the case before the revolution that judges should show a large guarantee of fortune but at any cost believe in it do not make it an image of society to be insulted in these days a judge paid as a functionary and generally a poor man has in the place of his dignity of old a haughtiness of demeanour that seems odious to the men raised to be his equals for haughtiness is dignity without a solid basis that is the vicious element in the present system if france were divided into ten circuits the magistracy might be reinstated by conferring its dignities on men of fortune but with six and twenty circuits this is impossible the only real improvement to be insisted on in the exercise of the power entrusted to the examining judge is an alteration in the conditions of preliminary imprisonment the mere fact of suspicion ought to make no difference in the habits of life of the suspected parties houses of detention for them ought to be constructed in paris furnished and arranged in such a way as greatly to modify the feeling of the public with regard to suspected persons the law is good and is necessary its application is in fault and public feeling judges the laws from the way in which they are carried out and public opinion in france condemns persons under suspicion while by an inexplicable reaction it justifies those committed for trial this perhaps is a result of the essentially refractory nature of the french 
this illogical temper of the parisian people was one of the factors which contributed to the climax of this drama nay as may be seen it was one of the most important to enter into the secret of the terrible scenes which are acted out in the examining judge's chambers to understand the respective positions of the two belligerent powers the law and the examinee the object of whose contest is a certain secret kept by the prisoner from the inquisition of the magistrate well named in prison slang the curious man it must always be remembered that persons imprisoned under suspicion know nothing of what is being said by the seven or eight publics that compose the public nothing of how much the police know or the authorities or the little that newspapers can publish as to the circumstances of the crime thus to give a man in custody such information as jacques collin had just received from asie as to lucien's arrest is throwing a rope to a drowning man as will be seen in consequence of this ignorance a stratagem which without this warning must certainly have been equally fatal to the convict was doomed to failure end of section forty section forty one of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the end of evil ways chapter four monsieur camusot the son-in-law of one of the clerks of the cabinet too well known for any account of his position and connection to be necessary here was at this moment almost as much perplexed as carlos herrera in view of the examination he was to conduct he had formerly been president of a court of the paris circuit he had been raised from that position and called to be a judge in paris one of the most coveted posts in the magistracy by the influence of the celebrated duchesse de montfrigneuse whose husband attached to the dauphin's person and colonel of a cavalry regiment of the guards was as much in favor with the king as she was with madame in return for a very small service which he had done the duchess an important matter to her on occasion of a charge of forgery brought against the young comte d'esquignon by a banker of alencon see la cabinet des antiques scene de la vie de province he was promoted from being a provincial judge to be president of his court and from being president to being an examining judge in paris for eighteen months now he had sat on the most important bench in the kingdom and had once at the desire of the duchesse de montfrigneuse had an opportunity of forwarding the ends of a lady not less influential than the duchess namely the marquise d'espard but he had failed see the commission in lunacy lucien as was told at the beginning of the scene to be revenged on madame d'espard who aimed at depriving her husband of his liberty of action was able to put the true facts before the public prosecutor and the comte de serizy these two important authorities being thus won over to the marquis d'espard's party his wife had barely escaped the censure of the bench by her husband's generous intervention on hearing yesterday of lucien's arrest the marquise d'espard had sent her brother-in-law the chevalier d'espard to see madame camusot madame camusot had set off forthwith to call on the notorious marquise just before dinner on her return home she had called her husband aside in the bedroom if you can commit that little fop lucien de rubempre for trial and secure his condemnation said she in his ear you will be counsellor to the supreme court how madame d'espard longs to see that poor young man guillotined i shivered as i heard what a pretty woman's hatred can be do not meddle in questions of the law said camusot i meddle said she if a third person could have heard us he could not have guessed what we were talking about the marquise and i were as exquisitely hypocritical to each other as you are to me at this moment 
she began by thanking me for your good offices in her suit saying that she was grateful in spite of its having failed she spoke of the terrible functions devolved on you by the law it is fearful to have to send a man to the scaffold but as to that man it would be no more than justice and so forth then she lamented that such a handsome young fellow brought to paris by her cousin madame du chatelet should have turned out so badly that said she is what bad women like coralie and esther bring young men to when they are corrupt enough to share their disgraceful profits next came some fine speeches about charity and religion madame du chatelet had said that lucien deserved a thousand deaths for having half killed his mother and his sister then she spoke of a vacancy in the supreme court she knows the keeper of the seals your husband madame has a fine opportunity of distinguishing himself she said in conclusion and that is all we distinguish ourselves every day when we do our duty said camusot you will go far if you are always the lawyer even to your wife cried madame camusot well i used to think you a goose now i admire you the lawyer's lips wore one of those smiles which are as peculiar to them as dancers smiles are to dancers madame can i come in said the maid what is it said her mistress madame the head lady's maid came from the duchesse de maufrigneuse while you were out and she will be obliged if you would go at once to the hotel de cadignan keep dinner back said the lawyer's wife remembering that the driver of the hackney coach that had brought her home was waiting to be paid she put her bonnet on again got into the coach and in twenty minutes was at the hotel de cadignan madame camusot was led up the private stairs and sat alone for ten minutes in a boudoir adjoining the duchess's bedroom the duchess presently appeared splendidly dressed for she was starting for saint cloud in obedience to a royal invitation between you and me my dear a few words are enough yes madame la duchesse lucien de rubempre is in custody your husband is conducting the inquiry i will answer for the poor boy's innocence see that he is released within twenty-four hours this is not all some one will ask to-morrow to see lucien in private in his cell your husband may be present if he chooses so long as he is not discovered the king looks for high courage in his magistrates in the difficult position in which he will presently find himself i will bring your husband forward and recommend him as a man devoted to the king even at the risk of his head our friend camusot will be made first a councillor and then the president of court somewhere or other good-bye i am under orders you will excuse me i know you will not only oblige the public prosecutor who cannot give an opinion in this affair you will save the life of a dying woman madame de serizy so you will not lack support in short you see i put my trust in you i need not say you know she laid a finger to her lips and disappeared and i had not a chance of telling her that madame d'espard wants to see lucien on the scaffold thought the judge's wife as she returned to her hackney cab she got home in such a state of anxiety that her husband on seeing her asked what is the matter amelie we stand between two fires she told her husband of her interview with the duchess speaking in his ear for fear the maid should be listening at the door now which of them has the most power she said in conclusion the marquise was very near getting you into trouble in the silly business of the commission on her husband and we owe everything to the duchess one made vague promises while the other tells you you shall first be councillor and then president heaven forbid i should advise you i will never meddle in matters of business still i am bound to repeat exactly what is said at court and what goes on 
but amelie you do not know what the prefet of police sent me this morning and by whom by one of the most important agents of the superior police the bibi lupin of politics who told me that the government had a secret interest in this trial now let us dine and go to the varieté we will talk all this over to-night in my private room for i shall need your intelligence that of a judge may not perhaps be enough nine magistrates out of ten would deny the influence of the wife over her husband in such cases but though this may be a remarkable exception in society it may be insisted on as true even if improbable the magistrate is like the priest especially in paris where the best of the profession are to be found he rarely speaks of his business in the courts excepting of settled cases not only do magistrates wives affect to know nothing they have enough sense of propriety to understand that it would damage their husbands if when they are told some secret they allowed their knowledge to be suspected nevertheless on some great occasions when promotion depends on the decision made many a wife like amelie has helped the lawyer in his study of a case and after all these exceptions which of course are easily denied since they remain unknown depend entirely on the way in which the struggle between two natures has worked out in home life now madame camusot controlled her husband completely when all in the house were asleep the lawyer and his wife sat down to the desk where the magistrate had already laid out the documents in the case here are the notes forwarded to me at my request by the prefet of police said camusot the abbe carlos herrera this individual is undoubtedly the man named jacques collin known as trompe la mort who was last arrested in eighteen nineteen in the dwelling-house of a certain madame vauquer who kept a common boarding-house in the rue de sainte geneviève where he lived in concealment under the alias of vautrin a marginal note in the prefet's handwriting ran thus orders have been sent by telegraph to bibi lupin chief of the safety department to return forthwith to be confronted with the prisoner as he is personally acquainted with jacques collin whom he in fact arrested in eighteen nineteen with the connivance of a mademoiselle michonneau the boarders who then lived in the maison vauquer are still living and may be called to establish his identity the self-styled carlos herrera is monsieur lucien de rubempre's intimate friend and adviser and for three years past has furnished him with considerable sums evidently obtained by dishonest means this partnership if the identity of the spaniard with jacques collin can be proved must involve the condemnation of lucien de rubempre the sudden death of peyrade the police agent is attributable to poison administered at the instigation of jacques collin rubempre or their accomplices the reason for this murder is the fact that justice had for a long time been on the traces of these clever criminals and again on the margin the magistrate pointed to this note written by the prefet himself this is the fact to my personal knowledge and i also know that the sieur lucien de rubempre has disgracefully tricked the comte de serizy and the public prosecutor what do you say to this amelie it is frightful replied his wife go on the transformation of the convict jacques collin into a spanish priest is the result of some crime more clever than that by which coignard made himself comte de saint hélène lucien de rubempre lucien chardon son of an apothecary at angouleme his mother a demoiselle de rubempre bears the name of rubempre in virtue of a royal patent this was granted by the request of madame la duchesse de maufrigneuse and monsieur le comte de serizy this young man came to paris in eighteen twenty something without any means of subsistence following madame la comtesse sixte du chatelet then madame de bargeton a cousin of madame d'espard's 
he was ungrateful to madame de bargeton and cohabited with a girl named coralie an actress at the gymnase now dead who left m camusot a silk mercer in the rue des bourdonnais to live with rubempre ere long having sunk into poverty through the insufficiency of the money allowed him by this actress he seriously compromised his brother-in-law a highly respected printer of angouleme by giving forged bills for which david sechard was arrested during a short visit paid to angouleme by lucien in consequence of this affair rubempre fled but suddenly reappeared in paris with the abbe carlos herrera though having no visible means of subsistence the said lucien de rubempre spent on an average three hundred thousand francs during the three years of his second residence in paris and can only have obtained the money from the self-styled abbe carlos herrera but how did he come by it he has recently laid out above a million francs in repurchasing the rubempre estates to fulfil the conditions on which he was to be allowed to marry mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu this marriage has been broken off in consequence of inquiries made by the grandlieu family the said lucien having told them that he had obtained the money from his brother-in-law and his sister but the information obtained more especially by m derville attorney at law proves that not only were that worthy couple ignorant of his having made this purchase but that they believed the said lucien to be deeply in debt moreover the property inherited by the sechards consists of houses and the ready money by their affidavit amounted to about two hundred thousand francs lucien was secretly cohabiting with esther gobseck hence there can be no doubt that all the lavish gifts of the baron de nucingen the girl's protector were handed over to the said lucien lucien and his companion the convict have succeeded in keeping their footing in the face of the world longer than coignard did deriving their income from the prostitution of the said esther formerly on the register of the town though these notes are to a great extent a repetition of the story already told it was necessary to reproduce them to show the part played by the police in paris as has already been seen from the note on Peyrade, the police has summaries almost invariably correct concerning every family or individual whose life is under suspicion or whose actions are of a doubtful character it knows every circumstance of their delinquencies this universal register and account of consciences is as accurately kept as the register of the bank of france and its accounts of fortunes just as the bank notes the slightest delay in payment gauges every credit takes stock of every capitalist and watches their proceedings so does the police weigh and measure the honesty of each citizen with it as in a court of law innocence has nothing to fear it has no hold on anything but crime however high the rank of a family it cannot evade this social providence and its discretion is equal to the extent of its power this vast mass of written evidence compiled by the police reports notes and summaries an ocean of information sleeps undisturbed as deep and calm as the sea some accident occurs some crime or misdemeanor becomes aggressive then the law refers to the police and immediately if any documents bear on the suspected criminal the judge is informed these records an analysis of his antecedents are merely sidelights and unknown beyond the walls of the palais de justice no legal use can be made of them justice is informed by them and takes advantage of them but that is all these documents form as it were the inner lining of the tissue of crimes their first cause which is hardly ever made public no jury would accept it and the whole country would rise up in wrath if excerpts from those documents came out in the trial at the assizes in fact it is the truth which is doomed to remain in the well as it is everywhere and at all times 
there is not a magistrate who after twelve years experience in paris is not fully aware that the assize court and the police authorities keep the secret of half these squalid atrocities or who does not admit that half the crimes that are committed are never punished by the law if the public could know how reserved the employees of the police are who do not forget they would reverence these honest men as much as they do chevaru the police is supposed to be astute machiavellian it is in fact most benign but it hears every passion in its paroxysms it listens to every kind of treachery and keeps notes of all the police is terrible on one side only what it does for justice it does no less for political interests but in these it is as ruthless and as one-sided as the fires of the inquisition put this aside said the lawyer replacing the notes in their cover this is a secret between the police and the law the judge will estimate its value but monsieur and madame camusot must know nothing of it as if i needed telling that said his wife lucien is guilty he went on but of what a man who is the favorite of the duchesse de maufrigneuse of the comtesse de serizy and loved by clotilde de grandlieu is not guilty said amelie the other must be answerable for everything but lucien is his accomplice cried camusot take my advice said amelie restore this priest to the diplomatic career he so greatly adorns exculpate this little wretch and find some other criminal how you run on said the magistrate with a smile women go to the point plunging through the law as birds fly through the air and find nothing to stop them but said amelie whether he is a diplomat or a convict the abbe carlos will find some one to get him out of the scrape i am only a considering cap you are the brain said camusot well the sitting is closed give your melee a kiss it is one o'clock and madame camusot went to bed leaving her husband to arrange his papers and his ideas in preparation for the task of examining the two prisoners next morning end of section forty one section forty two of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the end of evil ways chapter five and thus while the prison vans were conveying jacques collin and lucien to the conciergerie the examining judge having breakfasted was making his way across paris on foot after the unpretentious fashion of parisian magistrates to go to his chambers where all the documents in the case were laid ready for him this was the way of it every examining judge has a head clerk a sort of sworn legal secretary a race that perpetuates itself without any premiums or encouragement producing a number of excellent souls in whom secrecy is natural and incorruptible from the origin of the parlement to the present day no case has ever been known at the palais de justice of any gossip or indiscretion on the part of a clerk bound to the courts of inquiry gentil sold the release given by louise de savoie to semblancet a war office clerk sold the plan of the russian campaign to chenicheff and these traitors were more or less rich the prospect of a post in the palais and professional conscientiousness are enough to make a judge's clerk a successful rival of the tomb for the tomb has betrayed many secrets since chemistry has made such progress this official is in fact the magistrate's pen it will be understood by many readers that a man may gladly be the shaft of a machine while they wonder why he is content to remain a bolt still a bolt is content perhaps the machinery terrifies him 
Camusot's clerk, a young man of two and twenty named Cocard, had come in the morning to fetch all the documents and the judge's notes and laid everything ready in his chambers while the lawyer himself was wandering along the quays looking at the curiosities in the shops and wondering within himself how on earth am i to set to work with such a clever rascal as this jacques collin supposing it is he the head of the safety will know him i must look as if i knew what i was about if only for the sake of the police i see so many insuperable difficulties that the best plan would be to enlighten the marquise and the duchess by showing them the notes of the police and i should avenge my father from whom lucien stole coralie if i can unveil these scoundrels my skill will be loudly proclaimed and lucien will soon be thrown over by his friends well well the examination will settle all that he turned into a curiosity shop tempted by a boule clock not to be false to my conscience and yet to oblige two great ladies that will be a triumph of skill thought he what do you collect coins too monsieur said camusot to the public prosecutor whom he found in the shop it is a taste dear to all dispensers of justice said the comte de granville laughing they look at the reverse side of every medal and after looking about the shop for some minutes as if continuing his search he accompanied camusot on his way down the quay without it ever occurring to camusot that anything but chance had brought them together you are examining monsieur de rubempre this morning said the public prosecutor poor fellow i liked him there are several charges against him said camusot yes i saw the police papers but some of the information came from an agent who is independent of the prefet the notorious corentin who had caused the death of more innocent men than you will ever send guilty men to the scaffold and but that rascal is out of your reach without trying to influence the conscience of such a magistrate as you are i may point out to you that if you could be perfectly sure that lucien was ignorant of the contents of that woman's will it would be self-evident that he had no interest in her death for she gave him enormous sums of money we can prove his absence at the time when this esther was poisoned said camusot he was at fontainebleau on the watch for mademoiselle de grandlieu and the duchesse de lunancourt and he still cherished such hopes of marrying mademoiselle de grandlieu said the public prosecutor i have it from the duchesse de grandlieu herself that it is inconceivable that such a clever young fellow should compromise his chances by a perfectly aimless crime yes said camusot especially if esther gave him all she got derville and nucingen both say that she died in ignorance of the inheritance she had long since come into added granville but then what do you suppose is the meaning of it all asked camusot for there is something at the bottom of it a crime committed by some servant said the public prosecutor unfortunately remarked camusot it would be quite like jacques collin for the spanish priest is certainly none other than that escaped convict to have taken possession of the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs derived from the sale of the certificate of shares given to esther by nucingen weigh everything with care my dear camusot be prudent the abbe carlos herrera has diplomatic connections still an envoy who had committed a crime would not be sheltered by his position is he or is he not the abbe carlos herrera that is the important question and m de granville bowed and turned away as requiring no answer so he too wants to save lucien thought camusot going on by the quai des lunettes while the public prosecutor entered the palais through the cour de Halley on reaching the courtyard of the conciergerie camusot went to the governor's room and led him into the middle of the pavement where no one could overhear them 
my dear sir do me the favor of going to la force and inquiring of your colleague there whether he happens at this moment to have there any convicts who were on the hulks at toulon between eighteen ten and eighteen fifteen or have you any imprisoned here we will transfer those of la force here for a few days and you will let me know whether this so-called spanish priest is known to them as jacques collin otherwise trompe la mort very good monsieur camusot but bibi lupin is come what already said the judge he was at melun he was told that trompe la mort had to be identified and he smiled with joy he awaits your orders send him to me the governor was then able to lay before monsieur camusot jacques collin's request and he described the man's deplorable condition i intended to examine him first replied the magistrate but not on account of his health i received a note this morning from the governor of la force well this rascal who described himself to you as having been dying for twenty-four hours past slept so soundly that they went into his cell there with the doctor for whom the governor had sent without his hearing them the doctor did not even feel his pulse he left him to sleep which proves that his conscience is as tough as his health i shall accept this feigned illness only so far as it may enable me to study my man added m camusot smiling we live to learn every day with these various grades of prisoners said the governor of the prison the prefecture of police adjoins the conciergerie and the magistrates like the governor knowing all the subterranean passages can get to and fro with the greatest rapidity this explains the miraculous ease with which information can be conveyed during the sitting of the courts to the officials and the presidents of the assize courts and by the time m camusot had reached the top of the stairs leading to his chambers bibi lupin was there too having come by the salle des pas perdus what zeal said camusot with a smile ah well you see if it is he replied the man you will see great fun in the prison yard if by chance there are any old stagers here why trompe la mort sneaked their chips and i know that they have vowed to be the death of him they were the convicts whose money entrusted to trompe la mort had all been made away with by him for lucien as has been told could you lay your hand on the witnesses of his former arrest give me two summonses of witnesses and i will find you some to-day coquart said the lawyer as he took off his gloves and placed his hat and stick in a corner fill up two summonses by monsieur's directions he looked at himself in the glass over the chimney shelf where stood in the place of a clock a basin and jug on one side was a bottle of water and a glass on the other a lamp he rang the bell his usher came in a few minutes after is anybody here for me yet he asked the man whose business it was to receive the witnesses to verify their summons and to set them in the order of their arrival yes sir take their names and bring me the list the examining judges to save time are often obliged to carry on several inquiries at once hence the long waiting inflicted on the witnesses who have seats in the usher's hall where the judges bells are constantly ringing and then camusot went on bring up the abbe carlos herrera aha i was told that he was a priest in spanish pooh it is a new edition of collet monsieur camusot said the head of the safety department there is nothing new replied camusot and he signed the two formidable documents which alarm everybody even the most innocent witnesses whom the law thus requires to appear under severe penalties in case of failure end of section forty two Section forty three of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways, Chapter 6. By this time, Jacques Collin had, about half an hour since, finished his deep meditations and was armed for the fray nothing is more perfectly characteristic of this type of the mob in rebellion against the law than the few words he had written on the greasy scraps of paper the sense of the first for it was written in the language the very slang of slang agreed upon by asie and himself a cipher of words was as follows go to the duchesse de maufrigneuse or madame de serizy one of them must see lucien before he is examined and give him the enclosed paper to read then find europe and paccard those two thieves must be at my orders and ready to play any part i may set them go to rastignac tell him from the man he met at the opera ball to come and swear that the abbe carlos herrera has no resemblance to jacques collin who was apprehended at vauquer's do the same with dr bianchon and get lucien's two women to work to the same end on the enclosed fragment were these words in good french lucien confess nothing about me i am the abbe carlos herrera not only will this be your exculpation but if you do not lose your head you will have seven millions and your honor cleared these two bits of paper gummed on the side of the writing so as to look like one piece were then rolled tightly with a dexterity peculiar to men who have dreamed of getting free from the hulks the whole thing assumed the shape and consistency of a ball of dirty rubbish about as big as the sealing wax heads which thrifty women stick on the head of a large needle when the eye is broken if i am examined first we are saved if it is the boy all is lost said he to himself while he waited his plight was so sore that the strong man's face was wet with white sweat indeed this wonderful man saw as clearly in his sphere of crime as moliere did in his sphere of dramatic poetry or cuvier in that of extinct organisms genius of whatever kind is intuition below this highest manifestation other remarkable achievements may be due to talent this is what divides men of the first rank from those of the second crime has its men of genius jacques collin driven to bay had hit on the same notion as madame camusot's ambition and madame de serizy's passion suddenly revived by the shock of the dreadful disaster which was overwhelming lucien this was the supreme effort of human intellect directed against the steel armor of justice on hearing the rasping of the heavy locks and bolts of his door jacques collin resumed his mask of a dying man he was helped in this by the intoxicating joy that he felt at the sound of the warder's shoes in the passage he had no idea how asie would get near him but he relied on meeting her on the way especially after her promise given in the saint jean gateway after that fortunate achievement she had gone on to the place de greve till eighteen thirty the name of la greve the strand had a meaning that is now lost every part of the river shore from the pont d'arcole to the pont louis philippe was then as nature had made it excepting the paved way which was at the top of the bank when the river was in flood a boat could pass close under the houses and at the end of the streets running down to the river on the quay the footpath was for the most part raised with a few steps and when the river was up to the houses vehicles had to pass along the horrible rue de la mortellerie which has now been completely removed to make room for enlarging the hotel de ville so the sham costermonger could easily and quickly run her truck down to the bottom of the quay and hide it there till the real owner who was in fact drinking the price of her wares sold bodily to asie in one of the abominable taverns in the rue de la mortellerie should return to claim it 
at that time the quai pelletier was being extended the entrance to the works was guarded by a crippled soldier and the barrow would be quite safe in his keeping as he then jumped into a hackney cab on the place de l'hôtel de ville and said to the driver to the temple and look sharp i'll tip you well a woman dressed like Azie could disappear without any questions being asked in the huge market-place where all the rags in paris are gathered together where a thousand costermongers wander round and two hundred old clothes sellers are chaffering the two prisoners had hardly been locked up when she was dressing herself in a low damp entresol over one of those foul shops where remnants are sold pieces stolen by tailors and dressmakers an establishment kept by an old maid known as la romette from her christian name Giromette. la romette was to the purchasers of wardrobes what these women are to the better class of so-called ladies in difficulties madame la ressource that is to say money-lenders at a hundred per cent now child said asie i have got to be figged out i must be a baroness of the faubourg saint-germain at the very least and sharps the word for my feet are in hot oil you know what gowns suit me hand up the rouge pot find me some first-class bits of lace and the swaggerest jewellery you can pick out send the girl to call a coach and have it brought to the back door yes madame the woman replied very humbly and with the eagerness of a maid waiting on her mistress if there had been any one to witness the scene he would have understood that the woman known as asie was at home here i have had some diamonds offered me said la romette as she dressed asie's head stolen i should think so well then however cheap they may be we must do without em we must fight shy of the beak for a long time to come it will now be understood how asie contrived to be in the salle des pas perdus of the palais de justice with a summons in her hand asking her way along the passages and stairs leading to the examining judge's chambers and inquiring for monsieur camusot about a quarter of an hour before that gentleman's arrival as he was not recognizable after washing off her make-up as an old woman like an actress she applied rouge and pearl powder and covered her head with a well-made fair wig dressed exactly as a lady of the faubourg saint germain might be if in search of a dog she had lost she looked about forty for she shrouded her features under a splendid black lace veil a pair of stays severely laced disguised her cook's figure with very good gloves and a rather large bustle she exhaled the perfume of powder a la marechale playing with a bag mounted in gold she divided her attention between the walls of the building where she found herself evidently for the first time and the string by which she led a dainty little spaniel such a dowager could not fail to attract the notice of the black-robed natives of the salle des pas perdus besides the briefless lawyers who sweep this hall with their gowns and speak of the leading advocates by their christian names as fine gentlemen address each other to produce the impression that they are of the aristocracy of the law patient youths are often to be seen hangers-on of the attorneys waiting waiting in hope of a case put down for the end of the day which they may be so lucky as to be called to plead if the advocates retained for the earlier cases should not come out in time a very curious study would be that of the differences between these various black gowns pacing the immense hall in threes or sometimes in fours their persistent talk filling the place with a loud echoing hum a hall well named indeed for this slow walk exhausts the lawyers as much as the waste of words but such a study has its place in the volumes destined to reveal the life of paris pleaders as he had counted on the presence of these youths she laughed in her sleeve at some of the pleasantries she overheard and finally succeeded in attracting the attention of massal a young lawyer whose time was more taken up by the police gazette than by clients 
and who came up with a laugh to place himself at the service of a woman so elegantly scented and so handsomely dressed asie put on a little thin voice to explain to this obliging gentleman that she appeared in answer to a summons from a judge named camusot oh in the rubempre case so the affair had its name already oh it is not my affair it is my maid's a girl named europe who was with me twenty-four hours and who fled when she saw my servant bring in a piece of stamped paper then like any old woman who spends her life gossiping in the chimney-corner prompted by massal she poured out the story of her woes with her first husband one of the three directors of the land revenue she consulted the young lawyer as to whether she would do well to enter on a lawsuit with her son-in-law the comte de Grosnap, who made her daughter very miserable and whether the law allowed her to dispose of her fortune in spite of all his efforts massal could not be sure whether the summons were addressed to the mistress or the maid at the first moment he had only glanced at this legal document of the most familiar aspect for to save time it is printed and the magistrate's clerks have only to fill in the blanks left for the names and addresses of the witnesses the hour for which they are called and so forth as he made him tell her all about the palais which she knew more intimately than the lawyer did finally she inquired at what hour m camusot would arrive well the examining judges generally are here by about ten o'clock it is now a quarter to ten said she looking at a pretty little watch a perfect gem of goldsmith's work which made massal say to himself where the devil will fortune make herself at home next at this moment asie had come to the dark hall looking out on the yard of the conciergerie where the ushers wait on seeing the gate through the window she exclaimed what are those high walls that is the conciergerie oh so that is the conciergerie where our poor queen oh i should so like to see her cell impossible madame la baronne replied the young lawyer on whose arm the dowager was now leaning a permit is indispensable and very difficult to procure i have been told she went on that louis the eighteenth himself composed the inscription that is to be seen in marie antoinette's cell yes madame la baronne how much i should like to know latin that i might study the words of that inscription said she do you think that monsieur camusot could give me a permit that is not in his power but he could take you there but his business objected she oh said massal prisoners under suspicion can wait to be sure said she artlessly they are under suspicion but i know monsieur de granville your public prosecutor this hint had a magical effect on the ushers and the young lawyer ah you know monsieur de granville said massal who was inclined to ask the client thus sent to him by chance her name and address i often see him at my friend monsieur de serizy's house madame de serizy is a connection of mine through the Rancorolles. well if madame wishes to go down to the conciergerie said an usher she yes said massal so the baroness and the lawyer were allowed to pass and they presently found themselves in the little guard-room at the top of the stairs leading to the mouse-trap a spot well known to asie forming as has been said a post of observation between those cells and the court of the sixth chamber through which everybody is obliged to pass will you ask if monsieur camusot is come yet said she seeing some gendarmes playing cards yes madame he has just come up from the mousetrap the mousetrap said she what is that oh how stupid of me not to have gone straight to the comte de granville but i have not time now pray take me to speak to monsieur camusot before he is otherwise engaged oh you have plenty of time for seeing monsieur camusot said massal 
if you send him in your card he will spare you the discomfort of waiting in the ante-room with the witnesses we can be civil here to ladies like you you have a card about you at this instant asie and her lawyer were exactly in front of the window of the guard-room whence the gendarmes could observe the gate of the conciergerie the gendarmes brought up to respect the defenders of the widow and the orphan were aware too of the prerogative of the gown and for a few minutes allowed the baroness to remain there escorted by a pleader as he listened to the terrible tales which a young lawyer is ready to tell about that prison gate she would not believe that those who were condemned to death were prepared for the scaffold behind those bars but the sergeant-at-arms assured her it was so how much i should like to see it done cried she and there she remained prattling to the lawyer and the sergeant till she saw jacques collin come out supported by two gendarmes and preceded by m camusot's clerk ah there is a chaplain no doubt going to prepare a poor wretch not at all madame la baronne said the gendarme he is a prisoner coming to be examined what is he accused of he is concerned in this poisoning case oh i should like to see him you cannot stay here said the sergeant for he is under close arrest and he must pass through here you see madame that door leads to the stairs oh thank you cried the baroness making for the door to rush down the stairs where she at once shrieked out oh where am i this cry reached the ear of jacques collin who was thus prepared to see her the sergeant flew after madame la baronne seized her by the middle and lifted her back like a feather into the midst of a group of five gendarmes who started up as one man for in that guard-room everything is regarded as suspicious the proceeding was arbitrary but the arbitrariness was necessary the young lawyer himself had cried out twice madame madame in his horror so much did he fear finding himself in the wrong the abbe carlos herrera half fainting sank on a chair in the guard-room poor man said the baroness can he be a criminal the words though spoken low to the young advocate could be heard by all for the silence of death reigned in that terrible guard-room certain privileged persons are sometimes allowed to see famous criminals on their way through this room or through the passages so that the clerk and the gendarmes who had charge of the abbe carlos made no remark also in consequence of the devoted zeal of the sergeant who had snatched up the baroness to hinder any communication between the prisoner and the visitors there was a considerable space between them let us go on said jacques collin making an effort to rise at the same moment the little ball rolled out of his sleeve and the spot where it fell was noted by the baroness who could look about her freely from under her veil the little pellet being damp and sticky did not roll for such trivial details apparently unimportant had all been duly considered by jacques collin to ensure success when the prisoner had been led up the higher part of the stairs as he very unaffectedly dropped her bag and picked it up again but in stooping she seized the pellet which had escaped notice its colour being exactly like that of the dust and mud on the floor oh dear cried she it goes to my heart he is dying or seems to be replied the sergeant monsieur said asie to the lawyer take me at once to monsieur camusot i have come about this case and he might be very glad to see me before examining that poor priest the lawyer and the baroness left the guard-room with its greasy fuliginous walls but as soon as they reached the top of the stairs asie exclaimed oh and my dog my poor little dog and she rushed off like a mad creature down the salle des pas perdus asking every one where her dog was she got to the corridor beyond la galerie marchande or merchant's hall as it is called 
and flew to the staircase saying there he is these stairs lead to the cour de Aillet, through which asie having played out the farce passed out and took a hackney cab on the quai des orfevres where there is a stand thus she vanished with the summons requiring europe to appear her real name being unknown to the police and the lawyers rue neuf saint marc cried she to the driver End of section 43. Section 44 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 7. As he could depend on the absolute secrecy of an old clothes purchaser known as Madame Nourrisson, who also called herself Madame de Saint Esteve, and who would lend Asie not merely her personality but her shop at need, for it was there that Nucingen had bargained for the surrender of Esther. Asie was quite at home there, for she had a bedroom in Madame Nourrisson's establishment she paid the driver and went up to her room nodding to madame nourrisson in a way to make her understand that she had not time to say two words to her as soon as she was safe from observation asie unwrapped the papers with the care of a savant unrolling a palimpsest after reading the instructions she thought it wise to copy the lines intended for lucien on a sheet of letter paper then she went down to madame nourrisson to whom she talked while a little shop-girl went to fetch a cab from the boulevard des italiens she thus extracted the addresses of the duchesse de maufrigneuse and of madame de serizy which were known to madame nourrisson by her dealings with their maids all this running about and elaborate business took up more than two hours madame la duchesse de maufrigneuse who lived at the top of the faubourg saint honore kept madame de saint esteve waiting an hour although the lady's maid after knocking at the boudoir door had handed in to her mistress a card with madame de saint esteve's name on which asie had written called about pressing business concerning lucien her first glance at the duchess's face showed her how ill-timed her visit must be she apologized for disturbing madame la duchesse when she was resting on the plea of the danger in which lucien stood who are you asked the duchess without any pretence at politeness as she looked at asie from head to foot for asie though she might be taken for a baroness by maitre massol in the salle des pas perdus when she stood on the carpet in the boudoir of the hotel de cadignan looked like a splash of mud on a white satin gown i am a dealer in cast-off clothes madame la duchesse for in such matters every lady applies to women whose business rests on a basis of perfect secrecy i have never betrayed anybody though god knows how many great ladies have entrusted their diamonds to me by the month while wearing false jewels made to imitate them exactly you have some other name said the duchess smiling at a reminiscence recalled to her by this reply yes madame la duchesse i am madame de saint esteve on great occasions but in the trade i am madame nourrisson well well said the duchess in an altered tone i am able to be of great service as he went on for we hear the husband's secrets as well as the wives i have done many little jobs for monsieur de marsay whom madame la duchesse that will do that will do cried the duchess what about lucien if you wish to save him madame you must have courage enough to lose no time in dressing but indeed madame la duchesse you could not look more charming than you do at this moment you are sweet enough to charm anybody take an old woman's word for it in short madame do not wait for your carriage but get into my hackney coach come to madame de serizy's if you hope to avert worse misfortunes than the death of that cherub go on i will follow you said the duchess after a moment's hesitation between us we may give leontine some courage 
notwithstanding the really demoniacal activity of this dorine of the hulks the clock was striking two when she and the duchesse de maufrigneuse went into the comtesse de serizy's house in the rue de la chaussee d'antin once there thanks to the duchess not an instant was lost the two women were at once shown up to the countess whom they found reclining on a couch in a miniature chalet surrounded by a garden fragrant with the rarest flowers that is well said asie looking about her no one can overhear us oh my dear i am half dead tell me diane what have you done cried the countess starting up like a fawn and seizing the duchess by the shoulders she melted into tears come come leontine there are occasions when women like us must not cry but act said the duchess forcing the countess to sit down on the sofa by her side as he studied the countess's face with the scrutiny peculiar to those old hands which pierces to the soul of a woman as certainly as a surgeon's instrument probes a wound jacques collin's ally at once discerned the stamp of one of the rarest feelings in a woman of the world real sorrow the sorrow that engraves ineradicable lines on the heart and on the features she was dressed without the least touch of vanity she was now forty-five and her printed muslin wrapper tumbled and untidy showed her bosom without any art or even stays her eyes were set in dark circles and her mottled cheeks showed the traces of bitter tears she wore no sash round her waist the embroidery on her petticoat and shift was all crumpled her hair knotted up under a lace cap had not been combed for four and twenty hours and showed as a thin short plait and ragged little curls leontine had forgotten to put on her false hair you are in love for the first time in your life said asie sententiously leontine then saw the woman and started with horror who is that my dear diane she asked of the duchesse de maufrigneuse whom should i bring with me but a woman who is devoted to lucien and willing to help us as he had hit the truth madame de serizy who was regarded as one of the most fickle of fashionable women had had an attachment of ten years standing for the marquis d'aglemont since the marquis's departure for the colonies she had gone wild about lucien and had won him from the duchesse de maufrigneuse knowing nothing like the paris world generally of lucien's passion for esther in the world of fashion a recognized attachment does more to ruin a woman's reputation than ten unconfessed liaisons how much more than two such attachments however as no one thought of madame de serizy as a responsible person the historian cannot undertake to speak for her virtue thus doubly dog's-eared she was fair of medium height and well preserved as a fair woman can be who is well preserved at all that is to say she did not look more than thirty being slender but not lean with a white skin and flaxen hair she had hands feet in the shape of aristocratic elegance and was as witty as all the ronquerolles spiteful therefore to women and good-natured to men her large fortune her husband's fine position and that of her brother the marquis de ronquerolles had protected her from the mortifications with which any other woman would have been overwhelmed she had this great merit that she was honest in her depravity and confessed her worship of the manners and customs of the regency now at forty-two this woman who had hitherto regarded men as no more than pleasing playthings to whom indeed she had strange to say granted much regarding love as merely a matter of sacrifice to gain the upper hand this woman on first seeing lucien had been seized with such a passion as the baron de nucingen's for esther she had loved as asie had just told her for the first time in her life this postponement of youth is more common with parisian women than might be supposed and causes the ruin of some virtuous souls just as they are reaching the haven of forty 
the duchesse de maufrigneuse was the only person in the secret of the vehement and absorbing passion of which the joys from the girlish suspicion of first love to the preposterous follies of fulfilment had made leontine half crazy and insatiable true love as we know is merciless the discovery of esther's existence had been followed by one of those outbursts of rage which in a woman rise even to the pitch of murder then came the phase of meanness to which a sincere affection humbles itself so gladly indeed for the last month the countess would have given ten years of her life to have lucien again for one week at last she had even resigned herself to accept esther as her rival just when the news of her lover's arrest had come like the last trump on this paroxysm of devotion the countess had nearly died of it her husband had himself nursed her in bed fearing the betrayal of delirium and for twenty-four hours she had been living with a knife in her heart she said to her husband in her fever save lucien and i will live henceforth for you alone indeed as madame la duchesse tells you it is of no use to make your eyes like boiled gooseberries cried the dreadful asie shaking the countess by the arm if you want to save him there is not a minute to lose he is innocent i swear it by my mother's bones yes yes of course he is cried the countess looking quite kindly at the dreadful old woman but as he went on if monsieur camusot questions him the wrong way he can make a guilty man of him with two sentences so if it is in your power to get the conciergerie opened to you and to say a few words to him go at once and give him this paper he will be released to-morrow i will answer for it now get him out of the scrape for you got him into it i yes you you fine ladies never have a sou even when you own millions when i allowed myself the luxury of keeping boys they always had their pockets full of gold their amusements amused me it is delightful to be mother and mistress in one now you you let the men you love die of hunger without asking any questions esther now made no speeches she gave at the cost of perdition soul and body the million your lucien was required to show and that is what has brought him to this pass poor girl did she do that i love her said leontine yes now said asie with freezing irony she was a real beauty but now my angel you are better looking than she is and lucien's marriage is so effectually broken off that nothing can mend it said the duchess in a whisper to leontine the effect of this revelation and forecast was so great on the countess that she was well again she passed her hand over her brow she was young once more now my lady hot foot and make haste said asie seeing the change and guessing what had caused it but said madame de maufrigneuse if the first thing is to prevent lucien's being examined by monsieur camusot we can do that by writing two words to the judge and sending your man with it to the palais leontine then come into my room said madame de serizy end of section forty four